Chapter 10, Part 1 of Life and Times of Joseph Warren by Richard Frothingham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Boston Port Act and the American Union. Warren's Letters. Effect of the Destruction of the Tea. The Boston Port Act, its reception in Boston. In the Colonies. The Demand for a Congress. The Progress of Union. December 1773 to June 1774. I ever scorn disguise. I think I have done my duty, Warren wrote after valuable service in the uprising of the great day of Lexington and Concord, and these words may indicate the frankness and fidelity with which he counseled and acted with the popular leaders through the period of sullen discontent which began on the passage of the Townshend Revenue Bill and ended on the destruction of the tea. The direct sequence of this event was severe penal legislation, which was the proximate cause of the Revolutionary War. Warren's spirits rose with the rising storm. His letters, both private and official, written without a thought of effect, delineate unconsciously much individual character which imprints itself on the reader's mind. These unstudied utterances, rich in thought and feeling, reveal his inner life and the secret of his personal influence. They show devotion to principle, love of liberty with fidelity to order, and large sympathetic power. They are far more. They are gushings of the warm lifeblood of the time, sibylline leaves on which are inscribed glowing characters to be read and to enkindle evermore. The official letters are so numerous as to preclude the printing of more than a selection. One of the private letters of this period was addressed to Arthur Lee, who was in London and is dated five days after the tea was destroyed. In this letter, Warren expresses the opinion that, unless there was a change in the policy of the administration, Americans would be as indifferent to the interest of the mother country as to that of any other European nation. Joseph Warren to Arthur Lee, Boston, December 21st, 1773. Sir, my respected friend, Mr. Adams, informs me of the honor he has done me by mentioning my name to you in his letters. I can by no means lose so fair an opportunity of opening a correspondence with one to whom America is under such great obligations. Be assured, sir, we are not insensible to your merits. The clear manner in which you have treated the dispute between Great Britain and this country has, we doubt not, enlightened many in the parent state as well as in this country. But nothing seems able to penetrate the Egyptian darkness which is so palpable in the court atmosphere. We have long waited for something wise and good in the public councils of the nation. At least we hoped that chance would lead to some measures which, if not so designed, might eventually have produced some agreeable effects. But hitherto the unpropitious star which rules unhappy Britain has disappointed our wishes. Every step taken by the administration has increased the distance between her and her colonies. And I fear that, unless a speedy alteration is made in the system of American policy, a few years will render us as indifferent to the interests of the mother country as to that of any other state in Europe. However, as it is my firm opinion that a connection upon constitutional principles may be kept up between the two countries, at least for centuries to come, Advantageous and honorable to both, I always respect the man who endeavors to heal the wound by pointing out proper remedies and to prevent the repetition of the stroke by fixing a stigma on the instrument by which it was inflicted. This country is inhabited by a people loyal to their king and faithful to themselves. None will more cheerfully venture their lives or fortunes for the honor and defense of the prince who reigns in their hearts, and none will with more resolution oppose the tyrant who dares to invade their rights. From this short but true character of this people, it is easy to see in what manner a wise king or a sagacious minister would treat them. But... Mr. Adams will give you a full account of the tea shipped by the East India Company for this place. It is now in the power of that company to make the use of Dutch tea as unpopular in this country as they can desire. They may easily, by a proper application to an all-powerful ministry, lay the colonies under such obligations as would be greatly to the company's advantage. 
but it is certain the whole navy of Britain will not prevent the introduction of Dutch tea, nor will her armies prevail with us to use the English tea, while the act imposing a duty on that article remains unrepealed. I congratulate you on the honor conferred on your brother by the City of London. In distinguishing merit, they honor themselves. This will be presented to you by Dr. Williamson, who has labored abundantly in the glorious cause in which we are engaged. I hope soon to be convinced that the freedom I have taken in writing to you is not disagreeable. I am, sir, with great esteem, your most obedient, humble servant, Joseph Warren. The records of the Boston Committee of Correspondence contain evidences of Warren's labor in the Patriot cause. Whenever there appears an enumeration of the members present, his name is among them. He was placed, December 25th, 1772, on a permanent working committee, one to draft replies to the letters that were received from the towns, the members being Samuel Adams, Joseph Warren, Nathaniel Appleton, Joseph Greenleaf, and Thomas Young. He was often put on special committees. He was, for instance, on a committee, February 25th, 1773, to prepare a petition to the legislature on the subject of the salaries of the judges and the chairman of the committee to present it. He was directed to prepare, September 7th, 1773, a circular letter to be sent out to the several towns in the province and also one to be sent to the colonies. He was chairman, November 9, 1773, of a committee of three to circulate the proceedings of the town, and on December 8, of another committee, to collect and state in the public newspapers certain things respecting the East India Company's tea. He was directed, December 17, at a meeting when Speaker Cushing and Samuel Quincy were called in to frame a declaration relative to the tea and to draw up a narrative of the recent proceedings. He was, December 30th, on a committee to invite a correspondence with New York and Philadelphia, and was the chairman, January 8, 1774, of a committee to draft a reply to letters received from Newport and Portsmouth, both of which drafts are copied into the records. I select the reply to Newport. Boston, January 24, 1774. Gentlemen, we can never enough adore that almighty dispenser of events who has, as it were by general inspiration, awakened a whole continent to a sense of their danger and afforded them the needed wisdom and fortitude to lay hold on the means of their redemption from the most debasing and insupportable slavery. The ample declaration of the resolution of our brethren at Newport, whose example we flatter ourselves, will persuade the colonies, assures us of the advice and assistance of that respectable people when the aid of either shall be required. A frequent and full communication of our sentiments upon every occasion you judge requisite will much gratify us. By such communication throughout the colonies, the honest party will become initiated in the necessary means of recovering and securing their greatly infringed rights. The present dispute inflames millions. Even in the infant colony of West Florida, we find the flame of patriotism kindled and making progress. It behooves us, brethren, to be steady and determined, to possess ourselves with a thorough understanding of every article of our invaluable rights, and to embrace the opportunity which cannot be far distant of having them established on a firm foundation. Unanimity and harmony in such momentous undertaking will, with God's blessing, ensure its success. The province of New Hampshire seems thoroughly in earnest to second their brethren in every laudable measure for the recovery and security of their liberty, and even the distressed Canadians hope for relief from our exertions. Happy shall we be if, in so noble, so righteous a struggle, we finally prevail. Glorious should we even miscarry. We are, gentlemen, your most humble servants. William Cooper, Clerk. This letter is one of the many utterances which show the common faith in a righteous cause, and the hope of its triumph was based on the Union there seemed to be growing in support of it from the infant colony of West Florida to the distressed Canadians. The thought, wrought into verse, appeared at the head of a spirited communication in the Boston Gazette. From Florida, where heat intensely reigns, 
to where we sought the gall on icy plains. One mortal flame through every breast may spread, by insult prompted and by freedom led. The two-edged sword may supersede the pen, and every son of Adam say, Amen. The writer, as he contemplated the timeline when the sword might supersede the pen, said in this appeal, There is no time to be lost. A Congress or a meeting of the states is indispensable. Let the Gordian not be tied, and whatsoever the people shall do shall prosper. The reliance was not in the feeble arm of a single colony, but in a people united into a common nationality. The view taken of the effect of the destruction of the tea by the two great exponents of their several parties, Hutchinson and Adams, was essentially the same. Hutchinson said that it had created a new union among the patriots. Samuel Adams wrote, The ministry could not have devised a more effectual measure to unite the colonies. Our committee have on this occasion opened a correspondence with the other New England colonies, besides New York and Philadelphia. Old jealousies are removed, and perfect harmony subsists between them. The act was looked upon as necessary to the union of the colonies, or, more exactly, to unite the Honest Party or the National Party. In fine, the destruction of the tea was one of those events, rare in the life of nations, which, occurring in a peculiar state of public opinion, served to wrest public affairs from the control of men, however wise or great, and cast them into the irresistible current of ideas. If, in America, it so awakened a whole continent to such a sense of danger that there seemed to be a general inspiration created by the almighty disposer of events, in England it roused and angered the intensest of nationalities. Even those classed the Friends of America pronounced the act to be rebellion. Singularly enough, the only statesman in power who characterized the deed accurately was Lord Dartmouth, who termed it a commotion. As the destruction of the tea was a blow aimed at the policy of the administration and not at the national sovereignty, the patriots expected to see their friends vindicated in England. It was long held, even by Samuel Adams, that, as the principle which developed would entail arbitrary power in America would undermine public liberty in England, the Liberal Party there would persist in their efforts until there was a change of measures. This view is often expressed in the journals. The broadside issued in New York relating to the destruction of the tea, for instance, closed with the following verse. The making Boston Harbor into tea, and those who made and helped to make it, the toast of all Americans will be, nor one true Briton will refuse to take it. On the reception of the same intelligence in Philadelphia, a new song appeared in the newspapers describing the event, one verse of which was, Squash into the deep descended, cursed weed of China's coast. Thus at once our fears were ended. British right shall never be lost. Candid Tories, even after the destruction of the tea, conceded that the people were as loyal subjects as any in the British dominions. Isaac Royal was one of this class. He had long been in political life, lived in princely style at Medford, a town about five miles from Boston, where, as a man of the world, he dispensed a generous hospitality. He had an uncommonly wide intercourse with men of all parties, and seems to have understood the aims of his countrymen. He wrote, January 18, 1774, to Lord Dartmouth as follows, I have been of His Majesty's Council and House of Representatives here thirty years without intermission, the last twenty of which has been at the Council Board. I firmly believe this people to be as truly loyal to His Majesty, as cordially affected to the illustrious House of Hanover, and as ardently desirous that there may never be wanting one of that august family to sway the British scepter until time shall be no more, as any of his subjects in his extended dominions. Please to observe, sir, however, that I don't pretend to justify any disturbances which have been, although they are not more nor greater, perhaps, than often occur in large and free governments. This may be said against the whole of the diatribes of the lower tier of Tory scribblers. Samuel Adams now said of the Patriots, 
they wish for nothing more than a permanent union with her, the mother country, upon the condition of equal liberty. This is all they have been contending for, and nothing short of this will or ought to satisfy them. And months later in October, Washington said that he did not know a man in the colonies who desired independence. The charge, however, continued to be kept up that the Patriots intended to deny British sovereignty, that the destruction of the tea was proof of it, and that an army was necessary to retain the colonies in subjection. The period of five months following this act, December to May, was one of deep and even painful interest. In all mouths were the questions, what measures will the ministry take? Will they destroy the trade of Boston? Will they arrest the popular leaders? Will they annul the Charter of Massachusetts? Will they resort to military rule? As solutions of these questions were awaited, time passed heavily on. John Adams wrote, April 9th, Still, silent as midnight, the first vessels may bring us tidings which will erect the crests of the Tories again and depress the spirits of the Whigs. And such was the calmness that he said, there is not spirit enough on either side to bring the question to a complete decision. The calmness was the boding quiet in which those who feel themselves the objects of inevitable calamity await the result in anxious silence, uncertain when or where the work of ruin is to begin or by what means it is to be avoided. The Tory threat of introducing an army or of arresting the popular leaders did not stop the work of the organization by the Whigs. The journals said that the committees never had so much business on their hands, and the Committee of Correspondence was uncommonly active. A town meeting was held in the spring to provide for the annual commemoration of the massacre. Samuel Adams was the moderator. Warren, as the chairman of the usual committee, took the lead in all the proceedings, and John Hancock delivered the oration before a great assembly of the citizens. The orator predicted fresh aggressions on American freedom, pointed to union as the path of security, and urged the people to be ready to take the field when danger called. He said, The Committee of Correspondence have done much to unite the inhabitants of the whole continent for the security of the common interests, but urged that the posture of affairs demanded a general Congress to lay a firm foundation for the common safety and the security of their rights and liberties. Surely, the orator said, our hearts flutter no more at the sound of war than did those of the immortal band of Persia, and in the most animating confidence that the noble struggle for liberty would terminate gloriously for America, he thanked God for an illustrious role of patriots, naming only Samuel Adams, whom nothing could divert from a steady pursuit of the interests of their country, who were at once its ornaments and safeguard and whose revered names in all succeeding times would grace the annals of their country. The orator exceeded the anticipations of his friends, and his oration was pronounced an elegant, pathetic, and spirited performance. Soon after the 5th of March, William Goddard, the printer of the Maryland Journal, arrived in town with letters from the patriots of Philadelphia and New York warmly commending the establishment of a post office on constitutional principles or independent of Parliament, and, March 15th, he had a conference with the Committee of Correspondence on the subject. The project was promptly endorsed by the members. Warren was appointed chairman of the subcommittee to mature the action and reported in an elaborate letter in favor of it. When we consider, this letter says, the importance of a post by which not only private letters of friendship and commerce but public intelligence is conveyed from colony to colony, it seems proper and necessary that such a one should be established as shall be under the direction of the colonies. Samuel Adams wrote, March 21st, the colonies must unite to carry through such a project, and when the end is effected, it will be a pretty grand acquisition. Mr. Goddard was delighted with the heartiness with which the Patriots entered into this measure, and wrote, March 23rd, of them to Mr. Lamb of New York, For my part, I have not terms to convey to you the sentiments I entertain of their magnanimity, wisdom, patriotism, and urbanity. The Southern colonists, particularly New York, 
have great credit here for the part they have taken in this business, and the people are willing to give them the glory of originating one of the greatest plans that, as they say, was ever engaged in since the settlement of our country. The journals contain much matter relative to the progress of what is termed in this grand design. In announcing the intelligence that the British Ministry had dismissed Franklin from the office of Postmaster General, the Gazette, April 25, 1774, said, Remarkable coincidence between the measures of the Americans and the measures of the British administration. While the ministry are dismissing the Postmaster General from his place, the Americans are dismissing the office forever. The designs of Providence and the policy of Britain, from the beginning, have cooperated to accelerate that amazing velocity with which the ball of empire rolls to this western world. The reports from the mother country, in March, showed that the event, the destruction of the tea, which had given an impetus to American Union, was stirring profoundly the English mind. Still, all was uncertainty as to the measures which might be adopted. The transactions at Liberty Tree, Samuel Adams wrote, March 31st, were treated with scorn and ridicule, but when they heard of the resolves of the body of the people at the Old South Meeting House, the place from whence the orders issued for the removal of the troops in 1770, they put on grave countenances. He remarked that no mention was made of America in the King's speech. I never, are the words of the patriot, suffer my mind to be ever much disturbed with prospects. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. It is our duty, at all hazards, to preserve the public liberty. Righteous heaven will graciously smile on every manly and rational attempt to secure that best of all gifts to man from the ravishing hand of lawless and brutal force. It continued to be said by the Tories that an army would speedily be sent to Boston. Three weeks later, when the news was more alarming, Adams wrote, April 21st, to John Dickinson, May God prepare this people for the event by inspiring them with wisdom and fortitude. They stand in need of all the countenance that their sister colonies can afford them, with whom to cultivate and strengthen a strict union was a great object in view. The solemn tone of this letter indicates the serious nature of the intelligence that was now appearing in the journals relative to England. The accounts printed there of the proceedings in Boston, culminating in the destruction of the tea, roused a proud nationality into so terrific an energy as to sweep before it, hurricane-like, men and parties, and a small band, of whom the sturdy John Cartwright, a Cato of those days, was an exponent, seemed to have been the sole inheritors of the political ideas of a Locke and a Milton, of an Eliot and a Hamden. The product of this anger was a system of penal measures, designed for a people who, it was charged, were not only animated by the spirit, but read with the deed of rebellion. The long interval of suspense in America terminated when, on the 2nd of May, the Boston journals printed the King's speech transmitting to Parliament the papers relating to the transaction of the town in relation to the tea, and announced that Lord North had moved the Boston Port Bill. In subsequent issues, they abounded with citations from the British press, which embodied the counts in which the town was arraigned at the bar of public opinion in England. The arrogant Philippic was as severe and about as just on the illustrious and venerable Franklin as it was on the glorious town, for he was characterized as the emblem of inequity and gray hairs. It was the sum of the great news that the ministry or the nation were resolved to enforce their doctrine of the right of the British Parliament to legislate, in all cases, whatsoever by the sword. Another arrival brought the Port Act, which received the royal signature on the 31st of March and was printed in the Boston journals on the 10th of May. It provided for a discontinuance of the landing or shipping of all merchandise at Boston or within its harbor. It was authoritatively announced that an army was on its way to Boston and that British ships of war, by blockading the town for a fortnight, could starve its people into submission. Heretofore, obnoxious acts of Parliament had borne on all the colonies, but this act was the beginning of a coercive policy on one colony, and it was based on the theory that jealousies between the colonies, antagonist interests, and different modes of social life 
formed an insurmountable barrier to any such union as would rise to the dignity of a national power, and that Massachusetts, being left to struggle alone, would be crushed. The Committee of Correspondence now voted to invite a conference of the eight neighboring towns to deliberate on the critical state of public affairs, and Warren was directed to prepare the invitation, which he immediately reported. He was also directed to draft a letter to be sent to Philadelphia. The invitation to the eight towns was in the following terms, which is copied from the original in Warren's handwriting. Boston, May 11, 1774. Gentlemen, we have this day received information that a bill has passed the two houses of the British Parliament for blocking up the harbor of Boston until the tea, lately destroyed at one of the wharves in this town, be paid for. We know that you must feel the indignity as sensibly as we do. Therefore, request that you would meet us in Faneuil Hall at three o'clock in the afternoon of Thursday next, that we may together consult what is proper to be done in this critical state of our public affairs. We are, gentlemen, with much esteem, your friends and fellow countrymen, signed by direction and in behalf of the Committee of Correspondence for Boston, William Cooper, Secretary. When William penned this circular, however it may have been with a few lending spirits, the service of the public mind outside of Massachusetts was calm. The other provinces, Dr. Ramsay remarks, were but remotely affected by the fate of Massachusetts. They were happy and had no cause on their own account to oppose the government of Great Britain. And it did not accord with the selfish maxim that hitherto had governed the states for a people under such circumstances to run the risk of incurring the resentment of the mother country by taking the part of a prescribed neighbor. So undemonstrative were the other provinces that John Adams thought that, as it had been for ten years past, things would go on for more years than he would live, oscillating like a pendulum between a redress of American grievances and absolute parliamentary authority. Our children, he said, may see revolutions and be concerned and active in affecting them, of which we can form no conception. It is well nigh impossible to exaggerate the interest with which the people of Boston and Massachusetts now watched political movements in the other colonies. In the afternoon of the 12th of May, the delegates from Dorchester, Roxbury, Brookline, Newton, Cambridge, Charleston, Lynn, and Lexington assembled at the Selectman's room at Faneuil Hall. The lowly men who now met were, most of them, accustomed to feed their own cattle, to fold their own sheep, to guide their own plow, all trained to public life in the little democracies of their towns, some of them captains in the militia and officers of the church, according to the discipline of Congregationalists, nearly all of them communicants under a public covenant with God. They grew in greatness as their sphere enlarged. Among them were patriots who sat in the council halls or stood on the battlefields of the subsequent nine-year struggle, who were in the convention that formed the federal constitution and who occupied high places in the new national government. Modern art could have photographed in this scene the inner life of this trial hour, its hopes and its fears, its calm faith, its fearful passion, and its high resolve. Samuel Adams was chosen to preside over this conference. He was 52 years of age. He had labored with so single an eye for his country that he was crowned with the laurel. In him, principle was kindled into power by a steady enthusiasm. Virtue was made strong by an ever-present religion and overall presided an imperial mental dignity. In word and work, he had been a truly great man, noble in impulse, immovable in purpose, wise in counsel, fertile in resources. So signally had the progress of events vindicated the accuracy of his judgment that patriots, who thought at times that he went too far, now conceded that he had been in the right and were paying to him the tribute to ability of coming round to a pioneer opinion. He was a prophet who had honor in his own country, for the press of his native town, reflecting public opinion, said that America, for his integrity, fortitude, and perseverance in her cause, had erected to him a statue in her heart. Fame had sounded his name abroad, and it was said of him in England by his friends that many considered him the first politician in the world. 
and by his enemies that he was the would-be Cromwell of America. Each revelation of his great pioneer work supplies fresh evidence of the justice of this contemporary eulogy, and thus time, like the refiner's fire, brings out new luster in the halo that encircles this venerable name. The utterances of the patriot were now like an oracle. There is no crime, are his words, alleged in the act as committed by the town of Boston, but we have been tried, condemned, and are to be punished by the shutting up of the harbor until we shall disgrace ourselves by servilely yielding up, in effect, the just and righteous claims of America. It is the expectation of our enemies, and some of our friends are afraid, that this town singly will not be able to support the cause under so severe a trial. Did not the very being of every seaport town, and, indeed, of every colony, considered as a free people, depend upon it, I would not even then entertain a thought so dishonorable of them as that they could leave us to struggle alone. The people generally abhor the thought of paying for the tea, the condition on which we are to be returned to the favor of Great Britain. The heroes who first trod on Plymouth shore fed on clams and mussels, and were contented. The country which they explored and defended with their richest blood, and which they transmitted as an inheritance to their posterity, affords us a superabundance of provision. Will it not be an eternal disgrace to this generation if it should now be surrendered? The people are in council. Their opposition grows into a system. They are united. They are resolute, and it requires but a small portion of the gift of discernment for anyone to foresee that Providence will erect a mighty empire in America. There is no report of the speeches that were made at this conference. The Boston delegates reminded their brethren from the country that the trade of Boston might be recovered by paying for the tea that was destroyed, but the delegates from the other towns held it unworthy even to notice the offer, and promised on their part to join their suffering brethren in every measure for relief. The business of the conference was embodied in a report, drafted by a subcommittee, on which were Warren, Colonel Gardner of Cambridge, and many others which pronounced the Port Act contrary to natural right and the usages of international law. The conference also adopted a circular letter to be sent to the committees of the other colonies proposing a general cessation of trade with Great Britain. This act, the circular says of the Port Act, fills the inhabitants with indignation, the more thinking part of those who have hitherto been in favor of the measures of the British government look upon it as not to have been expected even from a barbarous state. This attack, though made immediately upon us, is doubtless designed for every other colony who will not surrender their sacred rights and liberties into the hands of an infamous ministry. Now, therefore, is the time when all should be united in opposition to this violation of the liberties of all. The Committee of Correspondence on this day, May 12th, requested the selectmen to call a town meeting to consider the important and interesting news lately received from England, when a warrant was immediately issued for one to be held at Faneuil Hall. A great concourse gathered, hundreds who could not get in standing around the hall as the proceedings went on. Samuel Adams was the moderator, Dr. Cooper offered a prayer, and his brother, the town clerk, read the Port Act. The journals say that its nature and tendency, as well as its design, were explained. Dr. Young says, The infamous act was read and decanted on, with a freedom and energy becoming the orators of ancient Rome, and no one hesitated to declare it, in every principle, repugnant to law, religion, and common sense. Several judicious and manly proposals, the journals say, were made to meet the emergency, which were discussed with a candor, moderation, and firmness of mind, becoming a people resolved to preserve their liberty. They were referred to a committee to propose measures for the relief of the citizens, of which Warren was a member, to report at an adjournment. This was the origin of a new committee, called the Donation Committee, on which, as will be seen, Warren was a zealous worker. The meeting voted to recommend to the other colonies to come into a joint resolution to stop all trade, importation, and exportation with Great Britain and the West Indies till the Port Act was repealed, and this was urged as a measure that would prove the salvation of North America and her liberties. 
The vote was ordered to be transmitted by the moderator to all other colonies. After appointing a committee to confer with Marblehead, the meeting adjourned. It was said that it was large and respectable, that many who had been hitherto cool in the common cause distinguished themselves in their zeal for its support, that its unanimity was as perfect as human society can admit of. The Gazette, in reporting the proceedings, said, It appears that the drift of the administration and their good friends in England is to break the union of the American colonies, and that devoted Boston shall feel the unparalleled tokens of their displeasure. But let us not be dismayed. Let us persevere to the end and resolve to yield our lives and fortunes before we will submit to the iron yoke of tyranny. And let the sacred truth be hallowed in the mind of every American. By uniting we stand, by dividing we fall. While the steady, vigorous, sensible, and persevering Paul Revere as an express was bearing this Union message to the southern colonies, General Gage, with an appointment as governor to supersede Hutchinson, was at Castle William where he arrived on the day of the meeting. His instructions directed him to arrest, for transportation and trial, Samuel Adams, Hancock, Warren, and other popular leaders. His commission was extraordinary. It made him Captain General and Governor-in-Chief of His Majesty's Province of Massachusetts Bay, while he retained his authority as Commander-in-Chief of the British forces in North America, and it was announced that an army would soon follow him. His object was to procure submission of the town and the colony to the constituted authorities to execute rigorously the Port Act and arrest the ringleaders of the people in the proceedings in Boston of November and December. General Gage was not unpopular. His prior intercourse with the Bostonians had been agreeable, and his urbane manners and social turn won him personal friends. But he did not comprehend the men and things around him, and was fitted neither to overawe nor to conciliate. His earliest civil movements indicated weakness, and his military operations showed incapacity. But public affairs were now at the mercy of events. Personal character was of little account in comparison with the policy with which it had been resolved to carry out, and it may be safely said that no wisdom in a subordinate official could have stayed the march of revolution. Four days after the town meeting, General Gage landed, May 17th, at Long Wharf, and was received with usual marks of respect. The military, consisting of a troop of guards, a regiment of militia, a company of artillery, and the cadets under Lieutenant Colonel Coffin, paraded in King Street, and although it rained, there was a great concourse of people. The governor was received by the council and civil officers under a salute from the ships and batteries, and was escorted to the townhouse by the cadets, receiving as he passed the military array in King Street the salutes of the officers. His commission was read in the council chamber and the usual oaths administered when three volleys were fired by the military and three cheers given by the people, and then followed an elegant dinner in Faneuil Hall. It had been reported that if the new governor were permitted to land, he would be treated with indignity, and the popular leaders, by this parade, hoped to remove any unfavorable impressions which that report might have made as to the character and disposition of the inhabitants. Governor Gage proposed several toasts at the dinner in Faneuil Hall, which were well received, but on naming Hutchinson, there was a general hiss. As governor, he made some show of authority on the destruction of the tea, which he looked upon as unhappy and termed the boldest stroke which had yet been struck in America. On the next day, he went from Milton into town and summoned a meeting of the council, but could not get a quorum. When there being much excitement by the advice of friends, he took lodgings at the castle on the pretense of visiting his sons. Three days later, he returned to town and met the council at Cambridge, when, after much division of opinion, it was concluded to direct the attorney general to lay the matter before the grand jury. From this time, the governor endeavored to avoid political controversy with the popular leaders, preferring to await intelligence from England as to the disposition of the ministry. He met the general court as usual in January, but did not refer to the proceedings on the tea in his message. The salary of the judges was the local question of the session, which elicited a world of tedious ancient lore from the lawyers, 
but the general issue, which the king pushed to extremities, became paramount in interest and importance. On the reception of the Port Act, the governor was charged with advising this measure, but he averred that he was not called upon for an opinion, and that if he had been, that he could never have brought himself to have advised one so severe and distressing. On the morning after receiving the news of his removal, he again changed his residence to the castle, where he held consultations with General Gage, received complimentary addresses from his political and personal friends, and soon, June 1st, sailed for London. On the day after the commission of General Gage was proclaimed, May 18th, the Port Act meeting reassembled in Faneuil Hall with Samuel Adams as the moderator. The Committee on Ways and Means, to relieve those who might suffer from want of work, asked further time to prepare their report and recommended to their fellow citizens patience, fortitude, and a firm trust in God. After passing resolves relative to the importance of the trade of Boston, the meeting adjourned until the 30th. There was now much discussion in conversation and by the press on a proposition to indemnify the East India Company for the tea that had been destroyed, and the subject was debated in this meeting. A letter written on the evening of this day says, We have many among us who are for compromising matters and put forward a proposition to pay for the tea. George Irving has declared this day that, if it should be promoted, he is ready to put down 2,000 pounds sterling towards it and will take it on himself to wait on Governor Gage and know what his demands on us are, which circumstance John Amory mentioned at the town meeting this day, which was in general rejected, though he urged the matter much. The town of Boston, Samuel Adams wrote on the same day, now suffers the stroke of ministerial vengeance in the common cause of America, and I hope in God they will sustain the shock with dignity. They do not conceive that their safety consists in a servile compliance of this barbarous act. Others of less faith and insight, who saw the cloud blackening and lowering, but could not see the light behind it, wrote in a different strain. Imagine to yourself, a letter on the same day runs, the horror painted on the faces of a string of slaves condemned by the Inquisition to perpetual drudgery at the oar. Such is the dejection imprinted on every countenance we meet in this once happy but now totally ruined town. Party spirit also was now rising. The same observer wrote, Such is the cursed zeal that now prevails, animosities running higher than ever, each party charging the other as bringing ruin on their country, that unless some expediency is adopted to get the port open by paying for the tea, which seems to be the only one, I'm afraid we shall experience the worst of evils, a civil war which God avert. The military force, known to be near, emboldened the Tories who laid the evils to the Committee of Correspondence. The distress exasperated the Whigs to such a degree that the popular leaders found it hard to restrain them. Their feeling is expressed by a London letter in the journals. This accursed tea is the very match that is appointed to set fire to a train of gunpowder that has been long though secretly laid by our ministry and your governor, joint agents in that most infernal business of destroying the liberties of three millions of British subjects. Meantime, the Port Act was doing faithfully the work of uniting the colonies, for the expression of indignation and of sympathy was wide and spontaneous. The law was received in New York directly from England, and the people felt the wrong done to Boston as a wound to themselves. It was circulated with great zeal and rapidity. In some places it was printed on mourning paper, and in others it was burned in the presence of great collections of the people. The public opinion is embodied in the responses that were made on receiving the appeal of Boston on the 13th of May. On the 30th, when the Port Act meeting was continued by adjournment to the 17th of June, the Boston journals contain in full the information gathered by Paul Revere, who had just returned, and it was said, Nothing can exceed the indignation with which our brethren in Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Philadelphia have received this proof of ministerial madness. The development of fraternity seemed to the Whigs amazing. The Tories continued skeptical and blind. 
Hutchinson sailed for England in the belief that the people were so divided among themselves that a union of the colonies was utterly impracticable. Governor Gage was no wiser, for he informed Lord Dartmouth, March 31st, that if the other colonies intended to go any farther in behalf of Boston than giving good words, it was not known here. On the 1st of June, the Port Act went into effect, when the ships of war were moored around the town in a manner effectually to blockade the port. Our enemies, Samuel Adams wrote, are already holding up to the tradesmen their grim picture of misery to induce them to yield to tyranny. I hope they will not prevail upon them, but this is to be feared, unless their brethren in the other colonies will agree upon measures of speedy support and relief. There was another danger, that of premature conflict. I hope, he added, by refraining from every act of violence, we shall avoid the snare that is laid for us by the posting of regiments so near us. Violence and submission would at this time be equally fatal. This day was observed in Virginia as one of fasting and prayer, and in Philadelphia by expressions of mourning. The Port Act, Bancroft says, had been received on the 10th of May, and, in three weeks, the continent, as one great commonwealth, made the cause of Boston its own. The Committee of Correspondence, when they had reason to expect personally far more than words of detraction, and when a naval and military force were gathering in the town, went on calmly in their great work, and its journal presents Warren as one of the foremost members. He was placed, May 20th, on a committee to draft the merchant's agreement was, May 27th, on a committee to draw up an address to counteract the addresses that were presented to Hutchinson, was the chairman, June 2nd, of a committee to draft a solemn league and covenant, and of a committee, June 6th, Thomas Young and Joseph Greenleaf being the others, to draft letters to send to the committees of New York, Philadelphia, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. The paper termed the League and Covenant reported to the committee on the 5th of June contained a pledge to suspend all commercial intercourse with Great Britain and not to purchase or consume any merchandise imported from that country after the first day of August. It was proposed to publish the names of those who refused to sign this agreement. The League and Covenant, having been adopted by the committee, was sent to all the towns, accompanied with a spirited circular urging the people to enter into it as the last and only method of preserving the land from slavery without drenching it in blood. An article in the Evening Post, 6th, characterized by Warren's vehement spirit, urged the adoption of the League and Covenant and the necessity of a Congress. If the colonies, it says, blind to their own true interest, shall madly prefer the present hour to true happiness, and will not fully join us in what we have a right to ask, and they are bound by every consideration in nature to grant, let us then give up, for, though I am for dying rather than betray the rights of America, yet I am not for sacrificing the town for nothing. And, Mind it, O ye colonies, be it remembered by future generations that the event of this struggle ensures happiness and freedom or miserable slavery to this continent. Act then like men. Appoint a general congress from the several colonies. Unite as a firm band of brothers and ward off the evil intended or expect the derision of schoolboys and the execrations of posterity. A communication in the same paper also says, Before we make any important moves, we want to have the Grand Congress or States General, chosen by the whole continent, meet and form the Union and the plans for operation. The Patriots now entered upon a week which promised to be marked by an uncommon interest in matters pertaining to the town and to the province. The General Court, by the king's particular commands, was in session at Salem, and the governor had signified that it would be held there until his majesty should have signified his royal will and pleasure for holding it again at Boston. The army, for which the Tories had been impatient, began to arrive, when the people, it was said, would speak and act openly. The local question was now industriously agitated of compensation for the tea, and there was the great measure of inaugurating a Congress. The Tories were as zealous for the former as the Whigs were for the latter. 
A meeting of the tradesmen was held on the 15th of June, in which the question of paying for the tea was sharply discussed. Some of the patriots stood at the door of the hall in which the meeting was held and opposed such a step. Some smart things, Dr. Young writes, were said pro and con on the subject, but it clearly appeared the general sense to submit to all extremities before a shadow of concession was extorted from them. Still, the Tories were strong enough to ward off decisive action and to postpone the subject, and this fact gave Warren no little uneasiness. As distrustful of his ability as he was anxious for the cause, he wrote that afternoon the following letter to Samuel Adams, urging him to be present at the adjournment of the Port Act meeting on Friday the 17th, when a warm engagement was expected with the Tories. Joseph Warren to Samuel Adams Boston, June 15, 1774 Sir, this afternoon was a meeting of a considerable number of the tradesmen of this town, but after some altercations, they dissolved themselves without coming to any resolutions for which I am very sorry, as we have had some expectations from the meeting. We are industrious to save our country, but not more so than others are trying to destroy it. The party who are for paying for the tea, and by that making a way for every compliance, are too formidable. However, we have endeavored to convince friends of the impolicy of giving way in any single article, as the arguments for a total submission will certainly gain strength by our having sacrificed such a sum as they demand for the payment of the tea. I think your attendance can by no means be dispensed with next Friday. I believe we shall have a warm engagement. The committee had a letter laid before them this evening from Baltimore, which more comports with my sentiments of public affairs than any yet received from the southward. That letter, with several others to you, will be forwarded in the morning. Vigilance, activity, and patience are necessary at this time, but the mistress we court is liberty, and it is better to die than not to obtain her. If the timidity of some and the treachery of others in this town does not ruin us, I think we shall be saved. I fear New York will not assist us with a very good grace, but she may perhaps be ashamed to desert us. At least, if her merchants offer to sell us, her mechanics will forbid the auction. You will undoubtedly do all in your power to effect the relief of this town and to expedite a general congress, but we must not suffer the town of Boston to render themselves contemptible, either by their want of fortitude, honesty, or foresight, in the eyes of this and the other colonies. I beg you will not fail to bring with you all such papers and letters as may serve our righteous cause at our meeting Friday. I am, dear sir, with great respect, your Honorable Servant, J. Warren, Mr. S. Adams at Salem. P.S. I think religion and policy require that a day be set apart for publicly addressing the King of Kings. The word from Baltimore, which was this evening so inspiring to Warren, was a generous outpour of patriotic spirit. Could we, the Baltimore Whigs wrote to Boston, remain a moment indifferent to your sufferings, the result of your noble and virtuous struggles in defense of American liberties, we should unworthily share in those blessings which, under God, we owe in greatest measure to your perseverance and zeal in support of our common rights, that they have not ere now been wrested from us by the rapacious hand of power. Permit us, therefore, as brethren and fellow citizens embarked in one common interest, most effectually to sympathize with you, now suffering and persecuted in the cause of our country, and to assure you of our readiness to concur in every reasonable measure that can be devised for obtaining the most effectual and speedy relief to our distressed friends. After relating the progress of measures towards the Congress and the proposition to proceed by petition and remonstrance, the letter says, We cannot see the least ground for expecting relief by it. The contempt with which a similar petition was treated in 65 and many others since that period convince us that policy and reason of state, instead of justice and equity, are to prescribe the rule of our future conduct, and that something more sensible than supplications will best serve our purpose. The following reply is copied from the original in Warren's handwriting. 
Boston, June 16, 1774. Gentlemen, we last evening received your generous and affectionate letter, third instant, enclosing your noble and spirited resolves. Nothing gives us a more animating confidence of the happy event of our present struggle for the liberties of America or offers us greater support under the distress we now feel than the assurances we receive from our brethren of their readiness to join with us in every salutary measure for preserving the rights of the colonies and of their tender sympathy for us under our sufferings. We rejoice to find the respectable county of Baltimore so fully alarmed at the public danger and so prudent and resolute in their measure to secure the blessings of freedom to their country. Our General Assembly is now sitting at Salem, about 20 miles from this town. We expect that members for a General Congress will speedily be elected by them. We hope by the next post to send you a full account of their proceedings. Post just going off. We can only add that we are, gentlemen, with the most unfeigned respect and esteem. P.S. We think your caution of enclosing your letter to a friend is extremely just at this crisis of our affairs, and we shall follow your example. To Mr. Samuel Perviance, Jr., in Baltimore, to be communicated to the Committee of Correspondence there. It would be interesting to follow Warren through the next day, the 17th of June, and to give his talk in private and his public speech, but the personal notices of him are too scanty to frame such a piece of genuine biography. On this day, the Port Act town meeting was to meet by adjournment in Faneuil Hall, the first town meeting in the presence of British troops since the March meetings in 1770, and it may be inferred that his morning hours were not without apprehension on account of being obliged to meet an engagement with the Tories under peculiar circumstances, without that tower of strength to lean upon Samuel Adams. Nor could it have been without anxiety for the work which he knew was before his friend in the general court at Salem. But it is history that, as the evening shades came on, his heart was bounding with joy. The public mind was greatly excited. Faneuil Hall could not contain the numbers who gathered, and hundreds who gave their countenance to the meeting remained outside. It was necessary to choose a moderator pro tem on account of the absence of Samuel Adams, and Joseph Bodwin was first chosen, who, it was ascertained, was not at home, and then John Rowe, who happened to be engaged. The Honorable John Adams, Esquire, was then chosen, who accepted. He had long avoided politics, had been rather a counselor than an actor, and he had not always approved of the popular action. This was his first appearance in a Boston town meeting as a leader. Indeed, it was his entrance upon a quarter of a century's uninterrupted political life, during which it was his felicity to act as chief magistrate over the people whose liberties he was now laboring to maintain. The Patriot was often introspective, and sets down many frank revelations of the inner man. He felt more spirits and activity since the reception of the Port Act news than he had had for years. He also had more faith. He saw that the town of Boston must suffer martyrdom, but it was his consolation that it was in the cause of truth, of virtue, of liberty, and of humanity. It would have a glorious resurrection to greater wealth, splendor, and power than ever. It was a principal object of the meeting to receive and act upon an expected report from the Committee of Ways and Means to provide employment for the poor. End of chapter 10, part 1. Chapter 10, part 2 of Life and Times of Joseph Warren by Richard Frothingham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Boston records say that Dr. Warren acquainted the town that they, the committee, thought best to defer making a report till they had heard from the other governments, whereupon they were directed to sit again. It was stated that there had been much talk out of doors, as well as writing in the papers concerning payment for the tea, and the request was made that, in case any gentleman had anything to offer on the subject, he would speak freely in order that a matter of so much importance might be fairly discussed in the presence of the body of the people. Among others, Thomas Boylston, 
a wealthy merchant and a public benefactor, spoke on this question, but he had not gone far before the people became impatient and tried to stop him. The moderator interposed to check the confusion and expressed his mortification that a citizen of Mr. Boylston's age, sense, and experience of life was not listened to with the respect which he was entitled. Instead, the moderator said he witnessed what he could describe best in the words of Milton. I did but prompt the age to quit their clogs by the known rules of ancient liberty. When straight a barbarous noise environs me of owls and cuckoos, asses, apes, and dogs. Uttering the last line with uncommon emphasis and with gestures pointing to the part of the hall from which the noise came. Though the rebuke restored order, Mr. Boylston declined to go on. Young, a zealous patriot, the next day wrote, In vain were the Eskine called upon to expose proportions fit only to be whispered in the conclave of the addressers composed of a few men. The meeting adjourned until the afternoon. At three o'clock, the committee of correspondence laid before the town, probably through Warren, the answers that had been received to their appeal. It is not necessary to present an abstract of them. Some acceded to the proposition to stop the trade, Others preferred to await the decision of a Congress which was proposed by Providence in New York, and all urged the necessity of making united effort. The town passed an admirable resolution in joining the Committee of Correspondence to write to all the other colonies and acquaint them that the town was deliberating on the steps to be taken on the present exigency, and were awaiting with anxiety the result of a Continental Congress whose meeting they impatiently desired, in whose wisdom they could confide, and in whose determination they should cheerfully acquiesce. This meeting was again adjourned. It proved to be uncommonly satisfactory to the Patriots. The journals say that it was as full and respectable as ever was known, and was never exceeded in firmness and unanimity, that its speeches on the state of affairs would do honor to any assembly, that not one, though called upon, had anything to say in favor of paying for the tea, and that all were for withstanding the utmost efforts of tyranny, rather than make free surrender of the rights of America. While the Patriots, guided by Warren, were thus successful in the town meeting, their brethren in Salem, under the lead of Samuel Adams, were adopting an important measure in the general court, a glance at the proceedings of which seems to be required to show the progress of events. For months, indeed for years, the call had been frequent in the colonies for a union after the manner of the United Provinces, and for a Congress as the necessary step towards it. Such a body was formally proposed by a town meeting in Providence and the Committees of Correspondence of Philadelphia, New York, and Connecticut, and the Assembly of Virginia, and the New York Committee requested the Patriots of Massachusetts to appoint the time and place. It was resolved to do this today in the general court. Samuel Adams, having reason to fear executive interference, locked the door of the hall in which the House of Representatives were assembled, and proposed the resolves which provided for a Congress to be convened on the 1st of September at Philadelphia. While these resolves were under consideration, Secretary Flucker appeared at the door and, on being denied admission, sent in a messenger to inform the House that he had a message from the Governor. The messenger was informed that the House had ordered the door to be kept locked, the secretary, standing on the stairs leading to the hall, read a large number of people a proclamation by Governor Gage, dissolving the general court. The House, however, went on and completed its business. The resolves were adopted. James Bowdoin, Samuel Adams, John Adams, and Thomas Cushing were selected as the delegates of Massachusetts. Bowdoin subsequently declining. Robert Treat Payne was selected in his place, and a tax was laid to defray their expenses. The House also recommended contributions to be made for the relief of Boston and the neighboring town of Charlestown, which were the most affected by the Port Act. The Boston representatives could not know that British authority was at an end in Massachusetts, or that the moderator of that day's town meeting in a few years would be the chief magistrate of an independent nation, but as they returned from Salem that afternoon, they could feel that, in a spirit of fidelity to duty, they had taken the leading steps to promote a union which were expected by their countrymen. In the evening, 
Adams, Cushing, Quincy, Warren, Young, and other popular leaders assembled at Warren's residence, forming a very important and agreeable company, and as they communed with each other, one home, at least in the distressed town, was lighted as with the glory of the aftertime. Their hearts were gladdened by the high spirit evinced in the town meeting, by the zeal of the yeomanry in signing the League and Covenant, and by the general refusal to pay for the tea. For neither in the General Assembly of the province nor in the grand meeting of the capital was there a single symptom of inclination to comply with the demand, though enforced by a distressing blockade. Then the evidences were increasing of the outpour of generous sympathy which the naked injustice of the Port Act occasioned. Besides the voice from Baltimore, already cited, and the cheering intelligence in the journals, there was read a letter from New York, which was pronounced to be as encouraging as anything they had from any part of the continent. There was now a genuine communion of feeling, a noble surrender of the American mind to the grand emotion of fraternity, and well might the popular leaders feel a glow of inspiration. One of the exulting band wrote, Our rejoicing was full from an interchange of interesting advices from all quarters. A cluster of morning stars of a new constellation were rejoicing in the blossoming of American nationality. End of chapter 10, part 2. Chapter 11, Part 1 of Life and Times of Joseph Warren by Richard Frothingham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Regulating Act and the Suffolk Resolves. The Regulating Act, Hutchinson and the King, the Reception of the Act in the Colonies, the Resistance to it, the Suffolk Resolves, their effect on public opinion. 1774. June to September. Warren's words became more and more the mirror of the passions of his countrymen. The important service which he rendered in promoting the passage of the famous Suffolk Resolves brought his name prominently before the General Congress. These resolves were occasioned by the passage of two additional penal acts by Parliament, one regulating the government of Massachusetts and the other altering the mode of administering justice. They were signed on the 20th of May. They were designed to carry into effect the principle that Parliament had the right to legislate for the colonies in all cases whatsoever. As George III was about to enter upon the work of enforcing these despotic acts, Hutchinson arrived, July 1st, in London, when he was immediately sent for by Lord Dartmouth. And, without even being obliged to change his dress, the ex-governor was ushered into the royal closet, where he had a conference with the king of nearly two hours on American affairs, of which Hutchinson has left a circumstantial relation. The conversation commenced in the following way. King, how do you do, Mr. Hutchinson, after your voyage? Hutchinson, much reduced, sir, by seasickness and unfit upon that account, as well as my New England dress, to appear before your majesty. Lord Dartmouth observed, Mr. Hutchinson apologized to me for his dress, but I thought it very well as he has just come ashore, to which the king assented. King, how did you leave your government, and how did the people receive the news of the late measures of Parliament? Hutchinson, when I left Boston, we had no news of any act of Parliament except the one for shutting up the port, which was extremely alarming to the people. Lord Dartmouth said, Mr. Hutchinson came from Boston the day that act was to take place, the 1st of June. I hear the people of Virginia have refused to comply with the request to shut up their ports from the people of Boston, and Mr. Hutchinson seems to be of opinion that no colony will comply with that request. King, do you believe, Mr. Hutchinson, that the account from Virginia is true? Hutchinson, I have no other reason to doubt it, except that the authority for it seems to be only a newspaper, and it is very common for articles to be inserted in newspapers without any foundation. I have no doubt that, when the people of Rhode Island received the like request, they gave this answer, that, if Boston would stop all the vessels which they then had in port, which they were hurrying away before the act commenced, the people of Rhode Island would then consider the proposal. The king smiled. Lord Dartmouth, Mr. Hutchinson, 
may it please your majesty, has shown me a newspaper with an address from a great number of merchants, another from the Episcopal clergy, another from the lawyers, all expressing their sense of his conduct in the most favorable terms. Lord Dartmouth thereupon took the paper out of his pocket and showed it. King, I do not see how it could be otherwise. I am sure his conduct has been universally approved of here by people of all parties. Hutchinson, I am very happy in your majesty's favorable opinion of my administration. King, I am entirely satisfied with it. I am well acquainted with the difficulties you have encountered and with the abuse and injury offered you. The conversation for some time turned on the publication of Hutchinson's private letters, and then went on as follows. King, in such abuse, Mr. Hutchinson, as you have met with, I suppose there must have been personal malevolence as well as party rage. Hutchinson, it has been my good fortune, sir, to escape any charge against me in my private character. The attacks have been upon my public conduct and for such things as my duty to your majesty required me to do, and which you have been pleased to approve of. I don't know that any of my enemies have complained of a personal injury. King, I see they threaten to pitch and feather you. Hutchinson, tar and feather, may it please your majesty, but I don't remember that I was ever threatened with it. Oh, yes, when Malcolm was tarred and feathered, the committee for tarring and feathering blamed the people for doing it, that being a punishment reserved for a higher person, and we suppose you were intended. Hutchinson, I remember something of that sort, which was only to make diversion, there being no such committee or none known by that name. King, what guard had you, Mr. Hutchinson? Hutchinson, I depended, sir, on the protection of heaven. I had no other guard. I was not conscious of having done anything of which they could justly complain or make a pretense for offering violence to my person. I was not sure, but I hoped they only meant to intimidate. By discovering that I was afraid, I should encourage them to go on. By taking measures for my security, I should expose myself to calumny and be censured as designing to render them odious for what they never intended to do. I was, therefore, obliged to appear to disregard all the menaces in the newspapers and also private intimations from my friends, who frequently advised me to take care of myself. The king was particular in inquiries relative to several of the popular leaders. King, pray, what does Hancock do now? How will the late affair affect him? Hutchinson, I don't know to what particular affair your majesty refers. King, oh, a late affair in the city, his bills being refused. Turning to Lord Dartmouth, who is that in the city, my lord? Lord Dartmouth, not recollecting. Hutchinson, I have heard, sir, that Mr. Haley, a merchant in the city, is Mr. Hancock's principal correspondent. King, aye, that's the name. Hutchinson, I heard, may it please your majesty, before I came from New England, that some small sums were returned, but none of consequence. King, oh no, I mean within this month, large sums. Lord Dartmouth, I have heard such rumors, but don't know the certainty. Hutchinson, Mr. Hancock, sir, had a very large fortune left him by his uncle, and I believe his political engagements have taken off his attention from his private affairs. He was sensible, not long ago, of the damage it was to him, and told me he was determined to quit all public business, but soon altered his mind. King, then there's Mr. Cushing. I remember his name a long time. Is he not a great man of the party? Hutchinson, he has been many years speaker, but a speaker, sir, is not always the person of the greatest influence. A Mr. Adams is rather considered as the opposer of government and a sort of Wilkes in New England. King, what gave him his importance? Hutchinson, a great pretended zeal for liberty and a most inflexible natural temper, he was the first that publicly asserted that the independency of the colonies upon the kingdom or the supreme authority of it. The king made particular inquiries in relation to the productions of the country, 
On the same day, he wrote to Lord North of the Colonies, I have seen Mr. Hutchinson, late Governor of Massachusetts, and am now well convinced they will soon submit. He owns the Boston Port Bill, has been the only wise and effectual method. The modern revelations of the temper of the king are remarkable and important. It is history that his unintelligent iron will was bending his minister, Lord North, to the task of fixing the old world policy of centralization on a people who had for their root individual liberty, civil and religious, tempered by respect for law. These sweeping acts cut down, trunk and branch, the old and dearly cherished rights of Massachusetts, invading even those palladiums, the town meeting and trial by jury, and the rough drafts of them, Gordon says, on their being received at Boston, were instantly circulated through the continent and filled up whatever was before wanting of violence and indignation in most of the colonies. Even those who were moderate or seemed wavering now became resolute and resentful. Nothing was to be heard of but meetings and resolutions. Each colony felt that its own right of framing its internal government was in danger. If, Lord Mahon says, one charter might be cancelled, so might all. If the rights of any one colony might hang suspended on the votes of an exasperated majority in England, could any other deem itself secure? The king was soon to learn, in the words of Dr. Ramsay, that to force on the inhabitants a form of government to which they were totally averse was not within the fancied omnipotence of Parliament. Warren shared the feelings of his countrymen at this hour, and, on the reception of the bills, before they were passed into laws, early in June, by the Committee of Correspondence, they excited the indignation of the members. Samuel Adams had long seen that Great Britain, by oppressive measures, was hastening the day of independence. Our people, he wrote to Charles Thompson, as he dwelt on the desire to unite all, in one indissoluble bond, think they should pursue the line of the Constitution as far as they can, and if they are driven from it, they can then with propriety and justice appeal to God in the world. And as he counseled prudence, moderation, and fortitude, he grandly wrote, I would wish to have all the impartial and reasonable world on our side. I would wish to have the humanity of the English nation engaged in our cause, and that the friends of the Constitution might see and be convinced that nothing is more foreign from our hearts than a spirit of rebellion. Would to God they all, even our enemies, knew the warm attachment we have for Great Britain, notwithstanding we have been contending these ten years with them for our rights. To the deep feeling awakened by the Boston Port Act, the new acts added the stimulus of common interests, and on the 20th of June, the Boston Gazette said, the present aspect of affairs is highly favorable to the liberties of America. The whole continent seems inspired by one soul, and that soul a rigorous and determined one. A week later, there was another great town meeting in Faneuil Hall, the adjournment of the Port Act meeting of the 17th, when Samuel Adams was in the chair. So large were the numbers that the meeting adjourned to the Old South Meeting House, whereas William Cooper, the town clerk, was reading the letters that had passed between the committees of correspondence, one of the Tories moved that the Boston Committee be censured and annihilated. Samuel Adams left the chair, and Thomas Cushing took the place of moderator. Those in favor of the motion were patiently heard, and when it was dark and they had said they had more to offer, the meeting was adjourned to the next day. Samuel Adams spoke during this long debate. A vast majority rejected the motion, and the town passed the vote urging the committee to preserve with their usual activity and firmness and continue steadfast in the way of well-doing. A protest was made by 129 citizens against the doings of the Committee of Correspondence, the Solemn League and Covenant, and the proceedings of the town in endorsing the work of the committee. On the next day, June 29th, Governor Gage, in a proclamation, strictly enjoined and commanded all magistrates to arrest all who signed the League and Covenant or who asked others to sign it. The month of July was full of excitement. On the 1st, Admiral Graves arrived in the Preston. Other regiments also arrived, and it was supposed that there would be arrests of the popular leaders. 
It is recorded in the journals of the Committee of Correspondence that, on the 5th, a report being prevalent that some gentlemen were to be apprehended, it was unanimously voted, we will attend to the Committee of Correspondence as usual unless prevented by brutal force. On the 26th, a donation committee was finally organized to receive and distribute the contributions that were flowing in from the colonies to relieve the poor of Boston, and Warren was appointed a member. On this day, a committee of safety was chosen, which consisted of James Bodwin, Samuel Adams, John Adams, John Hancock, William Phillips, Joseph Warren, and Josiah Quincy. A committee, in the name of Boston, appealed to those dear companions in the cause of God and their country, their friends and brethren of the province, to whom they looked for that advice, example, and wisdom that would give strength to their understanding, vigor to their action, and, with the blessing of God, save them from destruction. General Gage, on the 6th of August, received officially the two acts relative to Massachusetts, one altering the charter and the other relating to the administration of justice, which the Patriots called the Regulating Act and the Murder Act, also commissions for 36 counselors who, instead of being chosen in the old way of election, were appointed by the king and were termed Madamas Counselors. The instructions of Lord Dartmouth on the 2nd of June were long, minute, and determined, averring that whatever violence might be attempted should be resisted with firmness. For the dignity, power, and the very existence of the empire were an issue, and declaring that should the ideas of independence take root, the union between the colonies and the kingdom would cease, and destruction must follow disunion. The act went into operation immediately, and various functionaries under it promptly prepared to exercise authority. The councillors, 25 of whom accepted to have sessions, the sheriffs to summon jurors, and the judges to hold courts. More than ever before were eyes now fixed on the patriots of Boston and Massachusetts, when the hitherto invincible British power commanded the submission of a free people. In the words of the protests of the minority of the lords against the acts, to a governor and council entrusted with powers which the British Constitution had not trusted his majesty and privy council, so that lives and property were subject to absolute power. The issue concerned territory wider than Massachusetts, for it was now to be determined whether the old world, or more precisely the Tory party of England, was to shape the institutions of the new world, or whether America should, as of right, frame her own law. The interest felt by the people of the other colonies in the result was intense, not so much because they were moved by oppression actually felt, as by a conviction on the part of the majorities who sided with the Whig or National Party, that a foundation was laid and a precedent about to be established for future oppressions. Their views were expressed through their organs, the Committees of Correspondence, in letters addressed to the Boston Committee. We view, a letter from Cape Fear, North Carolina, says, the attack made by the minister upon the colony of Massachusetts Bay to be intended to pave the way to a general subversion of the constitutional rights of North America. A letter from South Carolina accompanying a sloop load of rice says, your situation at this time is truly hazardous and trying, but all you will not fail for want of support because all British America are your friends. For God's sake, be firm and discreet at this time. Christopher Gadsden of Charleston wrote to Samuel Adams in a letter not printed, We will not think so basely of you as to imagine you will pay for an ounce of the tea. And before he could get a reply, he thus renewed the injunction, We depend on your firmness and that you will not pay for an ounce of the damned tea. The Committee of the Town of Brooklyn, Connecticut, accompanied its contributions with a letter, August 11th, in which they said to Boston, You are held up as a spectacle to the whole world. All Christendom is longing to see the event of the American contest. And do, most noble citizens, play your part manfully, of which we make no doubt. Your names are either to be held in eternal veneration or execration. If you stand out, your names cannot be too much applauded by all Europe and all future generations. 
An able Tory address, circulated first in the Pennsylvania Assembly and widely copied, said of the growing Whig organization in staring capitals, It is the beginning of republicanism, which, it was declared, was setting up anarchy above order. The word that came in from the country towns of Massachusetts was not less decisive. Among the letters were two from patriots who fought in the Bunker Hill battle. Colonel William Prescott, who commanded this action, said to Boston in the name of the men of Pepperell, Be not dismayed nor disheartened in this day of great trial. We heartily sympathize with you and are always ready to do all in our power for your support, comfort, and relief, knowing that Providence has placed you where you must stand the first shock. We consider we are all embarked in one bottom and must sink or swim together. Colonel Thomas Gardner of Cambridge, who fell by Warren's side, nobly wrote to the Boston Committee. Thomas Gardner to the Boston Committee of Correspondence, Cambridge, August 12, 1774. Friends and brethren, the time is come that every one that has a tongue and an arm is called upon by their country to stand forth in its behalf. And I consider the call of my country as the call of God, and desire to be all obedience to such a call. In obedience thereunto, would administer some consolation unto you, by informing you of the glorious union of the good people of this province, both in sentiment and action. I am informed from good authority that the Committee of Correspondence for the several towns in the country of Worcester have assembled, are in high spirits, and perfectly united." The committee for Cambridge and Charlestown are to have a conference tomorrow, and I trust the whole country of Middlesex will soon be assembled by delegates from the respective towns in said county. I have the greatest reason to believe that the people will choose to fall gloriously in the cause of their country than meanly to submit to slavery. I am your friend and brother, Thomas Gardner. In this crisis hour, when the people were expected to prevent the execution of the Regulating Act, Samuel Adams left Boston August 10th to attend the meeting of the General Congress, and Warren became the central figure in the political movements of Massachusetts. His impetuous fearlessness, Bancroft says of him, as he was now acting, was tempered by self-possession, gentleness, and good sense, and he had reluctantly become convinced that all connection with the British Parliament must be broken off. It was necessary that the revolutionary work at hand, though it should be thorough, as in the case of the destruction of the tea, should be systematic. On the day on which this letter is dated, at a meeting of the Committee of Correspondence and Selectmen of Boston, Warren was named at the head of the delegation to meet in a county convention that was to be held in Stoughton, of which he gives some account in the following letter. Joseph Warren to Samuel Adams, Boston, August 15, 1774. Dear Sir, Our public affairs have not changed their appearance since your departure. The people are in high spirits and have the greatest confidence in the wisdom and spirit of the Congress, whose decisions they seem determined to abide by. Mr. Gage sent, the day before yesterday, for the selectmen and informed them that he had received an act of Parliament prohibiting their calling town meetings without a license from him. They told him that they should obey the law of the land and that they had two adjournments of their meeting and knew of no occasion to call another. He replied that, he would endeavor to put the act in execution, and if any ill consequences followed, they only were blamable. As to their adjournment, he must consider of it, for by such means they might keep their meeting alive these ten years. Upon this they left him. On Friday, agreeable to a request from the other towns in this county, the selectmen and committee of correspondence met and chose five members to attend the county congress at Stoughton tomorrow. Joseph Warren, William Phillips, Esquire, Mr. Oliver Wendell, Dr. Benjamin Church, Mr. John Pitts. Mr. Phillips has refused. We shall elect a member to fill his place. General Lee leaves us today. Enclosed you have a hint which I think very important, but it ought to come from a member for some other colony. Nay, if it was done wholly by the other members of the Congress, I should like it better, 
as it will perhaps be injurious to you to come into such resolutions. With respect to some who are sworn in as members, the poor fellows hang their heads already. Some spirited resolutions of the Congress will drive them to despair. The gentlemen from the royal governments may possibly think that, although our council is appointed by Mandamus, we are nevertheless upon as good a foundation in that respect as themselves. But they will consider that it is not simply the appointment of the council by the king that we complain of, it is the breach thereby made in our charter. And if we suffer this, none of our charter rights are worth naming. The charters of all the colonies are no more than blank paper. The same power that can take away our right of electing councillors by our representatives can take away from other colonies the right of choosing even representatives, and the bill for regulating the government of Canada shows plainly that it would be very pleasing to the ministry to deprive the Americans totally of the right of representation, and indeed by the acts of the British Parliament, and by the instructions given to governors, that they are already deprived of all the advantages derived from representation. A fair state of this matter— done by the masterly hand of some of our worthy friends at the Congress, would open the eyes of many. I am sure the Congress will be able to convince the world that the present American representation is a shadow and not a substance, and I am certain that unless it is put upon a better footing, the people themselves will, in a few years, readily consent to throw off the useless burden." But I am perhaps too much like the declaimer who delivered a lecture upon the art of war to the illustrious General Hannibal. Mrs. Adams and your family are well. The doctor and she set out for the eastern country today. Mrs. Cushing and family are in good health. Mr. Adams' friends in town are well, as I heard his lady was last Saturday. Pleased to present my very respectful regards to your three brethren and believe me to be your fast friend and humble servant, Joseph Warren. P.S. While writing, Mr. Pitts comes in and informs me that Dr. Williamson has written to his friend in Philadelphia, assuring him that the ministry have lately written instructions to General Gage not to take one step against the Americans, if the opposition to ministerial measures should be general. The celebrated Colonel Putnam is now in my house, having arrived since I subscribed this letter with a generous donation of sheep. Warren's guest, Colonel Putnam, remained in town several days. The old hero Putnam, Dr. Young writes, arrived in town on Monday, bringing with him 130 sheep from the little parish of Brooklyn. He cannot get away. He is so much caressed both by the officers and citizens. He has had a long combat with Major Small in the political way, much to the disadvantage of the latter. He looks fresh and hearty and, on an emergency, would be as likely to do good business as ever. The Patriot received due notice in the newspapers, which said he was so well known through North America that no words were necessary to inform the public further than that his generosity led him to Boston to cherish his oppressed brethren and support them by every means in his power. The provisions of the Regulating Act forbade town meetings, except by the permission of the governor, but most of the towns of Suffolk met and chose delegates, and all 60, to attend a convention held on the 16th at Stoughton at Colonel Doty's Tavern. It was called a Country Congress. Some of the towns had not had the requisite notice. It was found that... The committees of many towns were not specially authorized to negotiate the affairs of a country congress, and to enable all towns and districts to choose delegates, and thus to show contempt for the act of parliament touching town meetings. The convention, after adopting the form of a call and choosing a committee to send it to the towns, adjourned to the 6th of September in the town of Dedham. One of the Boston delegates says, we were perfectly unanimous and firm in the common cause. Colonel Thayer particularly said, we must all appear undisguised upon one side or the other. Good Mr. Dunbar gave us the most extraordinary liberty prayer that ever I heard. He appeared to have the most divine, if not prophetical, enthusiasm in favor of our rights, and stood with us till eight o'clock at night. We rode all together in the Berlin, 
with four horses and two servants and returned at 11 o'clock at night in good health. On the day of this convention, the judges of the inferior court of Great Barrington were forced by the people to pledge their honor that they would do no business. Warren's time was now greatly occupied with public affairs. Among his students was Dr. William Eustace, subsequently Member of Congress, Governor of Massachusetts, and Secretary of War. He was now about 21. His amiable character, fine address and culture, won the strong attachment of Warren. The young student is found by the side of his instructor in trying scenes. He now sent the following note in a neat handwriting to Samuel Adams. Boston, August 18, 1774. I am inform you that Dr. Warren would do himself the pleasure to write you, but opportunity will not permit it. He sends you the enclosed and wishes you much prosperity. Sir, your very humble servant, W. Eustace. Mr. Adams, this was an exciting week, and the Committee of Correspondence was often in session. Letters and resolves, Young writes on the 19th, come in to us from all quarters, and still on the rising tenor. Thirteen were received last Tuesday evening, and many are come to hand since. We meet every day or two, as usual, and proceed with great harmony. Warren now wrote to Samuel Adams that the county meeting, already appointed, would have important consequences. Joseph Warren to Samuel Adams. Boston, 21 August, 1774. My dear sir, I received yours from Hartford and enclose you the vote of the House passed on the 17th of June. I shall take care to follow your advice respecting the county meeting, which, depend upon it, will have very important consequences. The spirits of our friends rise every day, and we seem animated by the proofs which every hour appear of the villainous designs of our enemies, which justify us in all we have done to oppose them hitherto, and in all that we can do in future. A non-importation and non-exportation to Britain, Ireland, and the West Indies is now the most moderate measure talked. It is my opinion that nothing less will prevent bloodshed two months longer. The non-importation and non-exportation to Britain and Ireland ought to take place immediately, to the West Indies not until December next, because should the non-exportation to the West Indies take place immediately, thousands of innocent people must inevitably perish, whereas if it takes place at some distance, they and the proprietors of the islands may use their influence to ward off the blow, and, if they fail in that, they may come to the continent, where they will be treated with humanity." By stopping the exportation of flaxseed to Ireland and giving them immediate notice, they may obtain a repeal of the act soon enough to get their supply before sowing time. This stoppage of exportation of flaxseed will not fall heavy upon anyone in this country, as scarcely any farmer raises more than four, six, or eight bushels, but it will throw a million of people in Ireland out of bread. There are about 100,000 acres of land sowed in Ireland with flaxseed every year, and it is computed that, with dressing and spinning, weaving, bleaching, etc., ten persons are employed by every acre, and the ministry will not find it easy to maintain so many persons in idleness, especially as the national revenue, if computed, as the best writers have computed, at eight million sterling, will be one-eighth part lost by the loss of their trade with America and the West Indies. In my next, I will endeavor to make some calculations of the interest which the British nation have in the West Indies and Ireland, also how many Irish peers and peers of Great Britain, and, if I can, though I hardly know how to go about it, will give some pretty near guess at the number of members in the House of Commons whose chief fortunes lie in Ireland and the West Indies. I enclose you all the papers as far as they are printed. I think nothing material is omitted. The extract of a letter from London dated June 1st is from Mr. Sheriff Lee. The Lord said to be virulent against America in the cabinet is Dartmouth in the letter. The Lord said to be brought over to the American Justice's temple. The letter was written to the Honorable Mr. Cushing. I have now a matter of private concern to mention to you by the desire of Mr. Pitts. Our friend, 
Mr. William Turner has, as you know, been persecuted for his political sentiments and ruined in his business. The dancing and fencing master, named Pike, in Charlestown, South Carolina, is about leaving the school and has invited Mr. Turner to take his place. I am myself, and I know you are, always deeply interested for the prosperity of persons of merit who have suffered for espousing the cause of their country. If you can, by giving Mr. Turner his true character, interest the gentleman with you in his favor, you will do a benevolent action and oblige Mr. Pitts, Mr. Turner, and myself. If they could be induced to write to their friends and know what encouragement he might expect, it might save him the expense of a journey which he can ill afford to take. I am, dear sir, your most obedient service, J.W. P.S. Please to make my respectful compliments to your three fellow laborers. As far as I have been able to get information, their families and friends are in health. Let them know that I consider everything I write to one of you is written to all. Great expectations are formed by the spirited resolves which the Congress will pass relative to our traitors by mandamus. There was a delay in organizing a body to receive the donations that were sent to Boston. The town at the meeting on the 17th of June authorized the overseers of the poor as they were a body politic by law in concert with the Committee of the Ways and Means of Employing the Poor to receive and distribute the donations made to the town. Accordingly, the earliest replies to the committee are signed by order of this board. On the 19th of July, this body desired to be discharged from further service in relation to this subject, and on the 26th of July, the Committee on Donations was finally organized. It was a body distinct from the Committee of Correspondence, and its duties were urgent and arduous. One of them was to reply to the letters that were sent with the contributions, and Warren wrote some of these replies. One of them was the following, addressed to Stonington, Connecticut. Joseph Warren to the Stonington Committee. Boston, August 24, 1774. Gentlemen, your elegant and benevolent favor of the first instant yielded us that support and consolation amid our distresses, which the generous sympathy of assured friends can never fail to inspire. "'Tis the part of this people to frown on danger face to face, to stand the focus of rage and malevolence of the inexorable enemies of American freedom. Permit us to glory in the dangerous distinction, and be assured that while actuated by the spirit and confident of the aid of such noble auxiliaries, we are compelled to support the conflict. When liberty is the prize, who would shun the warfare? Who would stoop to waste a coward thought on life?' We esteem no sacrifice too great, no conflict too severe, to redeem our inestimable rights and privileges. Tis for you, brethren, for ourselves, for our united posterity, we hazard all, and permit us humbly to hope that such a measure of vigilance, fortitude, and perseverance will still be afforded by us, that, by patiently suffering and nobly daring, we may eventually secure that more precious than Hesperian fruit, the golden apples of freedom. We eye the hand of heaven in the rapid and wonderful union of the colonies, and that generous and universal emulation to prevent the sufferings of the people of this place gives a prelibation of the cup of deliverance. May unerring wisdom dictate the measures to be recommended by the Congress." May a smiling God conduct this people through the thorny paths of difficulty and finally gladden our hearts with success. We are, gentlemen, your friends in the cause of liberty, Joseph Warren, Chairman, to the Committee of Correspondence at Stonington. This letter, Hollister says, that rises like a heavenly vision into the regions where such poets as Milton hymn their prophetic songs, it is still in the keeping of the town clerk of Stonington. It does indeed stir the heart like the sound of a trumpet, and is worthy to be carved for an epitaph upon a monument of granite that should forever rest upon the ashes of Warren. On the same day, Warren replied to the town of Preston, in the letter of which was the remark that their people, on the reception of the second and third unrighteous acts of Parliament, 
or anxiously looking for some important event to take place, that while it was becoming to be watchful, there was great reason to fear that nothing short of another kind of resistance would regain and secure their privileges, and that it had given them fresh alarm to hear that arms were not suffered to be carried out of town. The reply indicates the difficulty the patriots of Boston encountered in avoiding both submission and violence. Joseph Warren to the Preston Committee, Boston, October 24, 1774. Gentlemen, we received by Captain Belcher your letter of the 20th and the sum of money you were kind enough to send for the support of our poor. It gives us pleasure amidst our sufferings to find our brethren determined to assist and support us while we are struggling for American freedom. Our enemies, we know, will use every artifice that hell can suggest and human power can execute to enslave us, but we are determined not to submit. We choose to effect our salvation from bondage by policy rather than by arms, considering that the blood of freemen who fight for their country is of more value than the blood of a soldiery who fight for pay. We doubt not, but a virtuous continental adherence to the non-importation, non-exportation, and non-consumption agreement will produce such changes in Britain as will compel them to give us everything we wish. But if this should fail, and we should be obliged to seek redress in the way you have hinted, we flatter ourselves that we shall act like men and merit the approbation of all America. The conduct of our adversaries is to us astonishing. Policy is no more their guide than justice. They have shut their eyes against daylight, and if they lead the British nation into the pit they have digged for us, the blame must be laid to their own door." The motions of our governor are like those of other machines. They move as they are directed. He is clad in the garb of ministerial instructions and has declared his determination implicitly to obey them. We shall always receive with gratitude your advice and assistance, not doubting that the end of our warfare will be freedom to America. We are, with sincerity, gentlemen, your very humble servants, J. Warren per order of the Committee of Donations. P.S. The arms have been several times detained in going out of town, but never finally stopped. Even if a private gentleman carries one out of town with him for diversion, he is not permitted to bring it back again. To the gentlemen of the Committee of the Town of Preston. Warren now took the lead in an important movement designed to systemize the opposition to the execution of the Regulating Act, which was spontaneous throughout the province. Before this time, the people of the other colonies not merely counseled but enjoined on the citizens of Massachusetts to defeat this law. There was a county convention held at Worcester on the 9th of August, which, without other action than passing resolves, had adjourned to the last Tuesday of the month. It is worthy of remark that these resolves, which were ordered to be circulated by handbills, aver that the people bore true allegiance to the king while they make this declaration. We have within ourselves the exclusive right of originating each and every law respecting ourselves, and ought to be on an equal footing with His Majesty's subjects in England. The Committee of the Town of Worcester now requested a conference with the Committee of Boston to agree on a general plan in relation to resisting the Regulating Act. On the invitation of the Boston Committee, there was a convention of the delegates of the four counties of Suffolk, Essex, Middlesex, and Worcester at Faneuil Hall on the 26th of August. One of the Essex delegates was Elbridge Gerry, who, by similarity of taste, disposition, principles, and aims, was in close friendship with Warren. This was the most general political consultation held since the remarkable convention of 1768. Warren was chosen the chairman. The meeting voted that the officials under the new act were unconstitutional officers and chose a committee to report the measures that might be expedient. Their report on the next day was read repeatedly and accepted paragraph by paragraph. It provided for a thorough defeat of the Regulating Act. It recommended the important step of a provincial congress in order to mature 
an effectual plan for counteracting the systems of despotism, and that, previous to the Congress, courts held under the Act ought to be properly opposed. In a resolve, they said that all who attempted to execute this act ought to be held in the highest detestation, and that individuals who maintained the rights of the province and continent in resisting it ought to be defended by the whole province, if necessary. The convention recommended the choice, as soon as it may be, of delegates to the proposed Congress. These resolves were not intended for the public but were an agreement for perilous political action. This was not a declaration of independence, nor was even the thing intended. Whatever might have been the consequences, it was a blow leveled at the measures of the administration rather than at the sovereignty of the British Empire. On this day, Warren, in behalf of the Committee of Donations, replied to a letter of the Committee of Norwich, Connecticut, who, in sending on a contribution of sheep, say in their letter that they should be glad to know of the true state of affairs per return of the gentlemen who drive the sheep. In replying, Warren drew a lifelike sketch of affairs in the town and province and announced the plan agreed upon that day to avoid an action with the soldiery until it should be necessary. Joseph Warren to the Committee of Norwich, Boston, August 27, 1774. Gentlemen, your letter, with the 291 sheep, were received safely and met with a very hearty welcome. We have good reason to think that our oppressors see their mistake and that they will ere long be convinced that Americans are not to be fritted or wheedled out of their rights. The arm of a tyrant is never supported by justice and therefore must fall. Mr. Gage is executing the late acts of Parliament in their several branches to the best of his ability. He is furnished with a council who will be careful, as their existence depends on the will of his master, to study his inclination and to act everything in conformity to his pleasure. We don't expect justice from them and have no hopes that they will be guided by the laws of equity or the dictates of conscience. Certainly, men who will serve such an administration as the present and suffer themselves to be promoted at the expense of the charter of their country, must be destitute of every idea of right and ready instruments to introduce abject slavery. Mr. Gage may issue his precepts, and his counsel may sanctify them. His juries may give verdicts, and an unconstitutional and venal bench may pass judgments. But what will this avail, unless the people will acquiesce in them? If the people think them unconstitutional, of what importance are their determinations? Salus populi suprema lex esto is a precious old maxim. The ministry have forgotten it, but the people are determined to remember it. We consider a suspension of trade through the continent with Great Britain, Ireland, and the West Indies as the grand machine that will deliver us. If this should fail, we must then have recourse to the last resort. As yet, we have been preserved from action with the soldiery and we shall endeavor to avoid it until we see that it is necessary and settled plan is fixed on for that purpose. The late acts of Parliament are such gross infringements on us that our consciences forbid us to submit to them. We think it is better to put up with some inconvenience and pursue with patience the plan of commercial opposition, as it would be more for the honor and interest of the continent, as well as more consistent with the principles of humanity and religion. Mr. Gage finds himself very unequal to the task that is set him, and is at a loss for measures. He sees, and is astonished at, the spirit of the people. He forbids their town meetings, and they meet in counties. If he prevents county meetings, we must call provincial meetings, and if he forbids these, we trust that our worthy brethren on the continent, and especially of the town of Norwich in Connecticut, will lend us their helping arms in time of danger, and will be no less conspicuous for their fortitude than they now are for their generosity. We have nothing important to inform you of besides what you see in the public papers. Should anything worthy your notice take place, we shall gladly communicate it to you. We are, gentlemen, your grateful friends and humble servants. Joseph Warren, 
per order the Committee of Donations to the gentlemen the Committee of the Town of Norwich. The following hastily written note shows how energetically Warren was helping forward the political machines in all parts of the province. Joseph Warren to Samuel Adams, Boston, August 29th, 1774. Dear Sir, I have enclosed all the late public papers worthy your notice and shall, by the next opportunity, give you all the public intelligence in my power. Haste now prevents it, as I am constantly busied in helping forward the political machines in all parts of this province. Friend Quincy is going to London. I wish he may have such letters from you and the other gentlemen of the Congress as may make him immediately noticed by persons of distinction there. Mr. Payne of Worcester, Oliver of Salem, Winslow of Roxbury, and Pepperell of Roxbury have resigned their seats at the board. Nothing will satisfy the people here, but a resolve of the Congress never to commence any commercial intercourse with Britain whilst one person who has accepted a commission or acted under the authority of the late Acts of Parliament is in any office of power or trust in America. This, say they, and justify, is the only measure that can save us from being perpetually plagued with villains who will traduce their country to advance themselves to places of trust and gain. Mr. Webster, the bearer hereof, a merchant of Philadelphia, is a man of very extensive political knowledge, especially respecting commerce. I wish you to see him and converse with him. I shall write you particulars by the next opportunity, and am your most humble servant and constant friend. Joseph Warren The determination to avoid a collision with the British soldiery was put to a severe test by the endeavors of both parties to secure what they could of the scanty stock of arms and ammunition in the province. The powder belonging to towns and the province was kept in the powder house in Charlestown in the portion which is now Somerville. The towns had withdrawn their portion. Very early on the morning of the 1st of September, a detachment of soldiers went from Boston in boats, landed at Temple's Farm, passed over to Quarry Hill to the powder house, and carried the powder and some cannon to Castle William. This was the occasion of the famous powder alarm, which was sounded not merely through Middlesex County, but through the province and into other colonies, causing a great commotion. There was a large gathering before evening, and the next morning, the people, with arms in their hands, assembled in Cambridge. The ever-vigilant committees, early in the morning, sent several messengers into Boston asking the aid of the Committee of Correspondence. Warren, on being informed that his presence was needed to prevent an immediate outbreak, at six o'clock notified such of the committee as he could, crossed over the ferry to Charlestown, met several of its committee of correspondence, and by eight o'clock was in the midst of the excited multitude in Cambridge. Councillor Danforth was addressing about 4,000 people and resigning his commission. Warren now used his influence efficiently to prevent a collision with the troops, spent the day with this company of freemen, and was witness of their patience, temperance, and fortitude, as they compelled obnoxious officials to obey the popular will. The governor wisely remained inactive. In Warren's judgment, had the troops marched out of Boston against this body of men, not a man would have returned. On this day, he addressed a letter in reply to the committee of the town of East Haddam, which, in contributing its might for the relief of the poor, said, As you are the first that are attacked as the head of all America, and so more immediately suffering, yet all the members, in a greater or lesser degree, are suffering with you. Reply to East Haddam. Boston, September 1st, 1774. Gentlemen, the town of East Haddam, in their letter of the 24th August, discovers such a cordial sympathy for our distress, and gives such a pleasing proof of their resolution to assist us, as makes us more than ever determined to support our sufferings with a philosophic fortitude. Boston is the stage on which our tyrants choose to act at present, but how soon they will choose to figure in some spot where they have a greater probability of success, time only will discover." We hope, however, to convince them that not only Boston, but all America, 
is designed by heaven for an asylum for oppressed and injured virtue, rather than to be a theater of sport for usurping despots. The late acts of Parliament are cruel and oppressive to the last degree. For that blockading our harbor is perhaps without a parallel, but we are, nevertheless, of opinion that they have operated for our advantage. Our enemies imagined that by exhibiting to our view some signal instances of their immediate power to distress us, we should be intimidated, that we should submit to kiss the rod and beg them to accept of our obedience. They now see that we are neither to be persuaded nor frighted from that standard which we are most sacredly bound to protect. They have done their utmost, and it is ineffectual. In policy, we flatter ourselves that they have not yet exceeded us. Arms are as yet untried. There was a time when some good men among us were insensible of their danger and seemed to prefer obscurity to action, but the late maneuvers of tyranny have roused them from their lethargy and now pant for the field in which the fate of our country is to be decided. Nothing has so dampened the spirits of those who aspire to be our masters as the accounts we are daily receiving of the glorious spirit that inspires the different parts of the continent. Some have believed, or have pretended to believe, that if the faction in Boston was quelled, the provinces would acquiesce in whatever changes the administration were pleased to make in the charter and constitution of the Massachusetts Bay, but now they see that a firm bond is formed in America, which the most powerful monarch on earth will not easily break. You will be pleased to accept our most hearty wishes for a continuance of your friendship, and gratitude and justice oblige us to tell you that the colony of Connecticut have behaved to us like brothers, and signalized themselves in the cause of American liberty in such a manner as will redound to their honor so long as the sun and moon endure. The generous benefaction from the town of East Haddam, so modestly mentioned in your letter, excites those emotions which the grateful hearts of their brethren here can better conceive than express. We are, gentlemen, with sincerity, your much obliged servants. Joseph Warren, per order of the Committee of Donations. To Mr. Daniel Brainerd and others of the Committee of East Haddam. Warren now wrote to Samuel Adams that he never saw a more glorious prospect than there then was, and that the generous spirit of their ancestors seemed to have revived beyond the most sanguine expectations. Though it seemed to him that the cord which bound the province to the king was, by his act, cut asunder, yet he was aware that the subject of a change in the government should be handled very gently and cautiously, lest the Massachusetts patriots should be thought for the advantage of their colony only, to aim at more than the other colonies were willing to contend for with Britain. Thus was the idea of union ever present with the popular leaders. It will be seen that, though the first of the two following letters is without date, both were of the 4th of September. Joseph Warren to Samuel Adams. Dear Sir, our friends, Dr. Church and Young, whose letters I have seen, write so fully to you by this conveyance that it will be needless for me to take up your time in giving a minute account of what has passed since my last. I can only assure you that I never saw a more glorious prospect than the present. The generous spirit of our ancestors seemed to have revived beyond our most sanguine expectations. I promised you, in my last, some account of the mighty expedition against the arsenal at Cambridge, but, as you will have a particular detail of that campaign in the public papers, you will not wish me to take up your time. End of chapter 11, part 1. Chapter 11, part 2 of Life and Times of Joseph Warren by Richard Frothingham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Friday morning, about six o'clock, I received a message from Charlestown informing me that some boys and negroes had called at Mr. Sewell's house at Cambridge, and by the imprudent discharge of a pistol by a person in the house, they were provoked to break the windows, but very soon left the house without doing further damage. 
the informant besides assured me that the county of Middlesex were highly incensed against Mr. Brattle and some others, and advised that some person from Boston should go up to Cambridge. This message was scarcely finished when a billet was brought, requesting me to take some step in order to prevent the people from coming to the immediate acts of violence, as incredible numbers were in arms and lined the roads from Sudbury to Cambridge. I summoned the Committee of Correspondence, but as care had been taken to caution every man who passed the ferry from alarming Boston, I judged it best not to inform the person who warned the Committee of the business they were to meet upon. They, therefore, made no great haste to get together. After waiting some time, I took as many of the members as came in my way to Charlestown, fearing that something amiss might take place. I saw the gentleman at Charlestown who begged us to move forward to Cambridge. On our way, we met the Lieutenant Governor Oliver. He said he was going to the general to desire him not to march his troops out of Boston. We thought his precaution good and proceeded to Cambridge. We there saw a fine body of respectable freemen with whom we spent the day and were witnesses of their patience, temperance, and fortitude, a particular account of which you have per this conveyance. The accounts from the western counties are such as must give the most exalted idea of the resolution and intrepidity of the inhabitants. The people from Hampshire County crowded the county of Worcester with armed men, and both counties received the accounts of the quiet dispersion of the people of Middlesex with apparent regret, grudging them the glory of having done something important for their country without their assistance. Had the troops marched only five miles out of Boston, I doubt whether a man would have been saved of their whole number. But enough of this. We find it difficult here to regulate the little matters in which we are engaged. You move in a larger orbit. However, I hope your superior abilities will not fail of carrying you safely through. You will, I am sure, consider the very great difference that there is between this and the other colonies. Their commerce glides in its usual channels. Their charters have not yet been torn to pieces by the harpies of power. They retain their usual forms of trials by juries in courts duly constituted. What is left for us? If we acquiesce but for an hour, the shackles will be fixed forever. If we should allow the county courts to sit one term upon the new establishment, what confusion, what dissensions must take place? Our friends, I mean particularly you, Mr. Cushing, Mr. Adams, and Mr. Payne, are capable of representing to your brethren the impossibility of our continuing long in a state of inactivity. Our all is at stake. We must give up our rights and boast no more of freedom, or we must oppose immediately. Our enemies press so close that we cannot rest upon our arms. If this province is saved, it must be by adopting measures immediately efficacious. I have mentioned in my letters to you the most mild plan that can be adopted, viz. non-importation and non-exportation to Britain, Ireland, and the West Indies. I mentioned some of my reasons for believing that our liberties might thereby be secured, but it may not be amiss to try how far some further steps for securing our rights might, if absolutely necessary, be approved by our brethren on the continent. I firmly believe that the utmost caution and prudence is necessary to gain the consent of the province to wait a few months longer for their deliverance, as they think the cord by which they were bound to the King of Britain has been, by his act, cut in sunder. They say they have a right to determine for themselves under what government they will live hereafter, but I shall now only subscribe myself, your friend and humble servant, Joseph Warren. Dr. Adams informs me that your lady and family are in health and present their love and duty to you. Joseph Warren to Samuel Adams, Boston, September 4th, 1774. Dear Sir, since closing my letter of this day, which, I believe, was without date, I have received some little agreeable intelligence which I cannot fail to communicate. The Solemn League and Covenant was signed by the people of the towns in the neighborhood of Falmouth, Casco Bay. The traders and people of Falmouth ridiculed the scheme and refused to sign it. The 31st day of August, 
The ship carpenters who were building vessels for the Falmouth merchants demanded their dues and refused to work longer. The employers remonstrated, told them their vessels would not rot on the stocks, and said they could not dismiss them. The tradesmen of all kinds wore resolute. They who had contracted to furnish the merchants with lumber likewise declared they could have nothing to do with them. On Monday, the merchants of Falmouth had a meeting, and by Wednesday night, the whole town signed the agreement. Last Thursday evening, three fire clubs met in this town. One club voted out of their society, Mr. J. G., H. L., and C., and another voted out Mr. A., a third voted out Mr. S., all addressers. Indeed, the contention is who shall most distinguish themselves at this grand crisis. I wish much to be in England at this time, but the sacrifice of my particular interest at this time by such a step would be greater than I can afford to make. I fear Mr. Oliver, Lieutenant Governor, and Colonel Leonard are both going there immediately, and I hope they will not be suffered to tell their tale uncontradicted. The resumption of the old charter of this colony is very much talked of, but I think should be handled very gently and cautiously whenever brought upon the tapas, lest the jealousy should arise in the minds of any concerning it, and lest we should be thought of as aiming at more than the colonies are willing to contend for with Britain for the advantage of this colony only. But I know you can remind our friend of Mr. Pitt's remark that three millions of slaves would be fit engines to enslave the British Empire, and you will not have occasion to tell a judicious American that one colony of freemen will be a noble bulwark for the rights of all America. Connecticut and Rhode Island are instances that must immediately occur. May God bless you and my other friends with you. Mutatus mutandus. What I write to you, I write to all. Pray furnish me with the fullest intelligence as soon as possible. I am, dear sir, your friend and humble servant, Joseph Warren. The regulating act was now resisted with great energy. The temper of the people was manifested in various ways in the country and in the town. At Newbury Bridge, the citizens stationed an old man with a drum who, when he saw a prominent Tory about to enter, paraded with his drum and went through the streets crying as he beat the drum, A Tory has come to town. In Bridgewater, as Mandamus councillors stood up in meeting and read as usual the psalm, the congregation refused to sing. In Boston, opposite Joy's buildings, which are near the townhouse, there were shops occupied by a chase maker, a tailor, a barber, a shoemaker, and two others, in each of which there was a bell. And, when a mandamus counselor or a high Tory went by, one gave the signal by ringing his bell, and the ringing was kept up through all the shops until the obnoxious passerby was out of sight. So great was the rage against all charged with introducing arbitrary power that a fatal a la lantern policy was suggested. Some really think, Young wrote, an example or two will be made in a very short time. I cannot say I would be uneasy to hear it was done. Gage, in the conviction that the time for conciliation, moderation, and reasoning was over, ordered cannon to be carried from the common to the neck, or main entrance to the town. This commencement of a fortification added fuel to the general flame, and created great alarm. We are, Paul Revere says, in spirits, though in a garrison. The spirit of liberty was never higher than at present. Our newfangled counselors are resigning their places every day. Our justices of the courts, who now hold their commissions during the pleasure of his majesty or the governor, cannot get a jury that will act with them. In short, the Tories are giving way everywhere in our province. On the same day Dr. Young wrote to Samuel Adams, The temper of your countrymen is in the condition your every wish, your every sigh, for years past, panted to find it. Thoroughly aroused and unanimously in earnest, something very important must inevitably come of it. He promised that the action of Suffolk should not come short of that of other counties. On the next day, September 5th, when the General Congress met, James Bowdoin wrote that six regiments were in town, and that it was said that two or three more were coming from Canada and two from Ireland. 
The journal stated that the force which was encamped on Fort Hill distinguished itself in the famous Battle of Minden. There was war preparation also going on on the side of the Patriots, and the newspapers described the parades of the Volunteer Corps as they practiced the military art, so that a journal said, The spirit of the people was never known to be so great since the settlement of the colonies as it is at this time. People in the country for hundreds of miles are prepared and determined to die or be free. While the public mind was excited, the Suffolk Convention on the 6th of September reassembled at the house of Mr. Richard Woodward in Dedham, every town being represented. The delegates chose Richard Palmer president and William Thompson clerk. After choosing a large committee to mature the business, with Warren for their chairman, the convention adjourned to meet again at Milton, where on the 9th of September, Warren reported to the convention the paper known in history as the Suffolk Resolves, which he drafted. It is said that they were read several times and unanimously adopted, paragraph by paragraph. The first resolution cheerfully acknowledges George III, as justly entitled to the allegiance of the British realm. Succeeding revolutions arraign the recent acts of Parliament as violative of the laws of nature, the British Constitution, and the Charter of the Province, and provide for a forcible resistance to them as the attempts of a wicked administration to enslave America. The action recommended is the boldest and most thorough of the time. The resolves declare the intention to act merely on the defensive, so long as such conduct may be vindicated by reason and the principles of self-preservation, but no longer. They pledge submission to such measures as the wisdom and integrity of the Continental Congress might recommend for the restoration of their rights and for the renewal of the union between Great Britain and the colonies, so earnestly wished for by all good men. They fixed the day for the assembling of a provincial congress. One of the resolutions embodied that adherence to social order as the basis of political action, which, for the past six years, had characterized the course of the wise popular leaders. This resolve heartily recommends all persons to abstain from routs, riots, or licentious attacks upon the property of any persons whatsoever, as being subversive of all order and government, but urges the patriots, by a steady and manly opposition, to convince these enemies that in a contest so important, in a cause so solemn, their conduct should be such as to merit the approbation of the wise and the admiration of the brave and free of every age and of every country. The convention early in its session appointed a large and most respectable committee, with Warren for chairman, to remonstrate with Governor Gage against the new fortification and the insults which his soldiers had offered to citizens. The committee waited on him when the chairman presented to him an address representing that the works might be used to aggravate the miseries of the distressed town by interrupting the supplies of provisions, expressing an inability to determine whence could originate the governor's policy towards a loyal and orderly community, declared that, though the people were resolved, by divine assistance, never to submit to the new acts, yet they had no inclination to war on the troops, representing that the existing ferment resulted from seizing the powder in the arsenal at Charlestown, and withholding the powder in Boston from its proprietors, and, more particularly, from the fortifying the sole avenue by land into Boston. Nothing, the committee said, in conclusion, short of restoring the town to its former state, and the cessation from insult, could put the inhabitants in that tranquility in which every free subject ought to live. To this the governor verbally expressed himself as follows, Good God, gentlemen, make yourselves easy and I will be so. You have done all in your power to convince the world and me that you will not submit to the acts, and I'll make representation home accordingly, for which I will embrace the earliest opportunity." He subsequently gave a written reply to the address of the committee, in which he said that it was not possible for him to interrupt the intercourse between town and country. 
he urged the general good behavior of the army to balance the individual cases of insult. He asked for the occasion of such numbers going through the country armed and for the private removal of the guns from the Charlestown Battery, and concluded by remarking that he found the refusal to submit to the late acts of Parliament to be general and that he should lay the fact before his majesty. After considering this reply, the committee were of opinion that the answer could not be satisfactory to the country. And farther, the journals say, probably in Warren's language, that His Excellency, in his reply, had been pleased to propose several questions which, if unanswered by the committee, would leave on the minds of persons not fully acquainted with the state of the facts some very disagreeable impressions concerning the conduct and behavior of this county and province and they unanimously agreed on the same day to present to the governor another address, which was longer than the first. It says that the governor was too well acquainted with the human heart, not to be sensible that it is natural for people to be soured by oppression and jealous for their personal security when their exertions for the preservation of their personal rights were construed into treason and rebellion. It recapitulated facts relative to the new fortification, the army, and the distressed condition of the town, and pointed to the late hostile acts of the governor as a sufficient justification for their proceedings for self-defense, for which he seemed at a loss to account. It earnestly solicited the governor to desist from action that had a tendency to create alarm, and particularly from fortifying the entrance to the town of Boston. It averred and asked the governor so to represent to his majesty that no wish of independency, no adverse sentiments or designs towards his majesty or his troops now here actuate his good subjects in this colony, but that their sole intention is to preserve pure and inviolate those rights to which, as men and English Americans, they are justly entitled and which have been guaranteed to them by his majesty's royal predecessors. Warren signed this address as chairman. The sequel is related in the journals which contain both addresses over Warren's name. As he was in the habit of supplying matter to the press, it is probable that the following interesting relation is from his pen. The address was delivered to Mr. Secretary Flucker by the chairman with the desire that he would, as soon as was convenient, present it to the governor and request His Excellency to appoint a time for receiving it in form. The secretary informed the chairman the ensuing day that he had seen the governor and had given him the copy of the address, but that he declined receiving it in form. The chairman mentioned to him the importance of the business, declaring his belief that the troops were not in any danger and that no person has, so far as he has been informed, taken any steps which indicated any hostile intention until the seizing and carrying off the powder from the magazine in the county of Middlesex, and that if any ill consequences should arise that should affect the interest of Great Britain, the most candid and judicious, both in Europe and America, would consider the author of the ferment now raised in the minds of these people as accountable for whatever consequences might follow from it. He therefore desired the secretary once more to make application to his excellency and to state the affair to him in that serious manner which the case seemed to require. The secretary accordingly made a second application to the governor, but received for answer that he had given all the satisfaction in his power, and he could not see that any further argumentation upon the subject would be to any good purpose. Upon this, the committee were again convened, and it was unanimously resolved that they had executed the commission entrusted to them by the county to the utmost of their ability. And, after voting, that the reply to His Excellency's answer should be inserted in the public papers as soon as possible, they adjourned without delay. It is observable that every vote passed by the delegates of the county and by the committee appointed to wait on the governor was unanimous. The resolves of the Convention of Suffolk were adopted by men who were terribly in earnest. They said that the power but not the justice the vengeance but not the wisdom of Great Britain were acting with unrelenting severity, 
and the liberal world is agreed on this judgment. They said that it was an indispensable duty which they owed to God, their country, themselves, and posterity by all lawful ways and means in their power to maintain, defend, and preserve those civil and religious rights and liberties for which many of their fathers fought, bled, and died, and to hand them down entire to future generations. These liberties may be said to have been embodied in one word, republicanism. And when the titled world regarded this element with obloquy, the patriots as a party clung to it as the all of their political life. Warren sent these resolves with a letter dated the 11th of September to the Massachusetts delegates in Congress in Philadelphia. And Paul Revere was the messenger who carried also the addresses delivered to Governor Gage. These papers, as they were listened to in Congress on the 18th, elicited great applause. The esteem, John Adams says, the affection, the admiration for the people of Boston and the Massachusetts which were expressed, and the fixed determination that they should be supported, were enough to melt a heart of stone. I saw the tears gush into the eyes of the old, grave Pacific Quakers of Pennsylvania. The sympathy which the members expressed for their suffering countrymen was in character with the constituency who, by their flow of contributions, were making Boston the granary of America. In a resolve which was unanimously passed, the Congress denounced the late acts, most thoroughly approved the wisdom and fortitude with which opposition to these ministerial measures had hitherto been conducted, earnestly recommended to their brethren a perseverance in the same firm and temperate conduct that was indicated in the Suffolk Resolves, and expressed the hope that the effect of the united efforts of North America in behalf of Massachusetts would carry such conviction to the British nation of the unwise, unjust, and ruinous policy of the present administration as quickly to introduce better men and wiser measures." Another resolve recommended a continuation of contributions from all the colonies to alleviate the distresses of their brethren of Boston. These resolves, Samuel Adams wrote to Dr. Chauncey, give a faint idea of the spirit of Congress. I think I may assure you that America will make a point of supporting Boston to the utmost. It is always difficult to harmonize the views of earnest men. And it is not strange that when unity of action was vital, the patriots of other colonies should have feared that the Massachusetts patriots might break the line of opposition by advancing too hastily before the rest, or that the Boston popular leaders should have been anxious to hear from Congress. The great news of the endorsement by the colonies of the Suffolk Resolves was brought by Paul Revere and was printed in the journals of the 26th in the form of brief letters, addressed to Warren by Peyton Randolph, the president, Thomas Cushing, one of the Massachusetts delegates, and a copy of the resolutions passed by Congress, attested by Charles Thompson. It was, with the exception of the rule adopted in that body in voting, the first account of what had been done in their secret session. It was, a letter says, the only thing which the members of Congress were at liberty to mention to the people out of doors here. The Congress will support Boston and the Massachusetts, or perish with them. But they wish that blood may be spared if possible, and all ruptures with the troops avoided. The Patriots were now in high spirits. Governor Gage was surprised and astonished to see the union of the colonies. Like his predecessor, he watched and reported signs of its formation, and he confessed that the movements were beyond all conception. He now informed Lord Dartmouth of the approval by Congress of the Suffolk Resolves. The comments by the Tories on these resolves were voluminous and uncommonly severe. They said it was a mystery which filled their minds with surprise and astonishment that the gentlemen of Congress were disposed to enter in a league, offensive and defensive, with the New England and other Presbyterian Republicans. But the fact was notorious to the world. It could neither be denied nor palliated, for they hastily and eagerly published, and it was the first thing they did publish, their cordial approbation of the Suffolk resolves for erecting an independent government in New England. They said that a rebellion was evidently commenced in New England in the county of Suffolk without room for retreating. They pronounced the resolves nothing short of a declaration of independency. 
They said that the men who had occasioned the political troubles in Massachusetts, having become desperate themselves, had no other card to play but to involve the whole country in their rebellion. They wrote that they had persuaded themselves that Congress would open the door for a settlement by advising Boston to pay for the tea. But alas, how we have been disappointed. As soon as they, Congress, received by express an authentic copy of the Suffolk Resolves, they broke through all these rules of secrecy and at once gave such a blast from the trumpet of sedition as made one half of America shudder. In due time, there appeared in the newspapers quotations from the British press of similar tenor. It was the Union that gave joy to the heart of the Whig and supplied venom to the pen of the Tory. The Friends of America, an editorial in a Boston journal says, have the satisfaction to learn that the resolve of the late Continental Congress, respecting the votes of the County of Suffolk, published in the late English papers, have not only surprised, but quite confounded the ministry, as by it they perceive the union of the colonies to be complete, and that their present menaces only mark their despair. End of chapter 11, part 2. Chapter 12, Part 1 of Life and Times of Joseph Warren by Richard Frothingham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Massachusetts and the General Congress. The State of the Province. The Question of Local Government. Letters of Warren and Adams. A Provincial Congress. Committee of Safety. Preparation for War. September 1774 to January 1775. Warren, soon after the adoption of the Suffolk Resolves, was required by the progress of events to take a prominent part in the organization and administration of a provisional government for the colony. His agency in the process by which Massachusetts passed from allegiance to the British crown to become a part of an American nationality renders this portion of his life not only of deep interest, but of much importance. The province of Massachusetts Bay included the territory which is now the state of Maine and comprised an area of about 39,000 square miles. It was divided into 14 counties and over 200 towns. The population was not far from 350,000. There were 13 Episcopal churches and about 400 Congregational Societies. It will be, perhaps, a sufficient introduction to the letters of Warren of this period to remark that there was a traditionary love for the Old Charter, under which the colony had enjoyed popular liberty in large measure, and which was so thoroughly democratic that the men of the Tory school said there was not an ingredient of royalty in it. Under it, the people elected their governor and managed their exclusively local concerns. Since the reign of William and Mary, the new charter had been the government, or the constitution, as it was called, which, with the English constitution, was regarded as guaranteeing the fundamentals of free institutions. Representation, the right of the majority to rule, trial by jury, the habeas corpus, the town meeting, freedom of the press, the immunities embodied in Magna Carta, and the Bill of Rights, in a word, civil and religious liberty. The people needed but to recur to Blackstone's commentaries to learn a line of precedence that maintained the superiority of the laws above the king, and it was an American idea that Parliament could not go in legislation beyond the limits fixed by the Constitution. It was said by the colonists that the authority of Parliament, in its proper extent, is justly supreme, and by the same ought to be said of the General Assembly of the Colonies, and it was held as fundamental that the making of laws for internal police was essential to liberty. In the broken hints which Joseph Hawley gave to John Adams when on his way to Congress, the Regulating Act is characterized as calculated to introduce perfect despotism as evil against right, utterly intolerable to every man who has any idea or feeling of right or liberty. A wanton violation of municipal charters is pronounced the great and leading justification of the event which drove King James from the throne. Hawley, in dwelling on the Regulating Act, said, We must fight. 
When John Adams read this to Patrick Henry, the great Virginian solemnly exclaimed, I am of that man's mind. The state of affairs in Massachusetts at this time is described in the following letter. As to public affairs here, I shall only say that things seem to be running into confusion, and that all the ministerial measures that have been of late pursued here look as if they were designed to drive the people, if possible, into something which they might call rebellion. The late act for better regulating the civil government of this province has operated just as I expected it would. It has, in effect, dissolved the government. The people will never acknowledge the new councillors. Several of them refuse to take their places. The people in different parts of the country have obliged some others to resign, so that there are none now but what are in Boston. A stop is also put to holding the courts of justice upon the new plan. Thus we have neither legislative nor executive powers left in the province. There are but two possible ways to restore order and good government here. One is by repealing the acts which have been the sole occasion of these commotions, and this, I firmly believe, would quickly end them. The other, by laying the country waste by fire and sword, and extirpating the present inhabitants, leaving none to be governed, if that can be called restoring government. Any hostile measures short of this will never answer the end. They will not alter the sentiments of the people whose spirit universally is now risen to a degree not easily to be conceived. Which part of the alternative the ministry will adopt, God knows. The people expect and are determined to abide even the horrors of a civil war rather than give up their just rights. This temperately written account of the condition of the province will not agree either with the contemporary exaggerated relations of the Tories or of the Whigs. The former described the province as being in anarchy and the latter as in a state of nature, but as still and peaceable as it was when the government was in full vigor. The people were far from being in a state of nature, for a body of local law was as much respected as ever, and the police of the towns had full authority to arrest violators of the peace, and there were many disturbances and invasions of personal rights which the popular leaders deplored and endeavored to redress. In general, the affairs of society went on as before. Individuals enjoyed security, even though they differed from the public sentiment if they accommodated themselves so far to the times as to restrain their temper and observe a neutrality. In repelling the charge of being rebels and hypocrites, and claiming to be true to the king, the Whigs asked, Can it be said of any other part of all the British dominions what is known to be true of New England, that in all the four provinces so called, there never was known so much as one single native Jacobite? And could we catch the pretender or any other usurper here? We would soon give a good account of him at the court of Great Britain. The patriots did not intend to deal blows upon the royal oak, but they meant at every hazard to keep their native soil clear for the roots of the tree of liberty. There were now among the Whigs a party ripe for extreme measures, who impatiently waited for the action of the other colonies, the same element that was seen in the town meetings six years before, who were for declaring Massachusetts to be separated by the king from the empire, raising the pine tree flag, and fixing on the terms on which they would continue to be of the old nationality, offering them for the king to accept or reject, as he might think fit. In a word, they would leave the General Congress nothing to do but to prosecute the work which they might inaugurate. Another class kept steadily in view the necessity of a unity of the colonies as the requisite element for success. Our salvation, Joseph Hawley now said, depends upon an established preserving union of the colonies. All possible devices and endeavors must be used to establish, improve, brighten, and maintain such union. This class were not willing that Massachusetts should go any further than there was reason to believe she would be supported by the other colonies. Warren's letters show in a striking manner his appreciation of this consideration. His words are, Nothing can be more important than this. On the day after he sent the Suffolk resolves to the Massachusetts delegates, he wrote to them the following weighty letter, stating the public feeling and anxiously asking how far Congress would support Massachusetts. Joseph Warren to Samuel Adams, 
Boston, September 12th, 1774. Gentlemen, I wrote yesterday by Mr. Revere and requested your advice concerning our public affairs, but I wrote in so much haste that I believe I was not explicit enough. Many among us, and almost all in the western counties, are for taking up the old form of government according to the first charter. It is exceedingly disagreeable to them to think of being obliged to contend with their rulers and quarrel for their rights every year or two. They think this must always be the case in government of so heterogeneous a kind as that under which they have lived. They say, too, that no security can be given to them that they shall enjoy their estates without molestation, even if the late charter should be again restored in all its parts, since the possession of their lands may be rendered precarious by any alterations in the charter which the Parliament shall think fit to make. Other persons, more especially in the eastern counties, think that it will be trifling to resume the old charter. They say that the connection between the king and the people is dissolved by his breaking the compact made between them, and they have now a right to take what form of government they please and make such proposals of certain limited subjection to the king as they shall judge convenient, which he may accept or reject as he pleases. I know you are deeply engaged, but nothing can be more important than this subject, and I beg you would give me immediate advice, and pray do not fail to inform how far the other colonies will be likely to favor us, and what conduct is necessary to ensure at least their approbation. Our General Assembly is called to meet on the fifth day of October. The County of Essex, in their county convention, have resolved to instruct the representatives of their several towns, when met agreeably to the precept at Salem, to resolve themselves, if it can be obtained in the House, into a provincial convention. I would gladly know whether it is probable that we can have any service from you at that time, and, inter nos, let me know whether it will be agreeable to elect Mr. and Mr. Adams. I subscribe myself your known friend. The following letters in reply to this letter are so important that I print them entire. One of them seems to be incomplete. It will be seen that the one without date was written on the 24th of September. Samuel Adams to Joseph Warren, Philadelphia, September 1774. My dear sir, your letter of the 12th instant, directed to Mr. Cushing and others, came duly to hand. The subject of it is of the greatest importance. It is difficult, at this distance, to form a judgment with any degree of accuracy of what is best to be done. The eastern and western counties appear to differ in sentiment with regard to the two measures mentioned in your letter. This difference of sentiment might produce opposition in case either part should be taken. You know the vast importance of union. That union is most likely to be obtained by a consultation of deputies from the several towns, either in a House of Representatives or a Provincial Congress. But the question still remains, which measure to adopt? It is probable the people would be most united, as they would think it is safest, to abide by the present form of government, I mean, according to the Charter. The governor has been appointed by the crown, according to the charter, but he has placed himself at the head of a different constitution. If the only constitutional council chosen last May have honesty and courage enough to meet with the representatives chosen by the people by virtue of the last writ, and jointly proceed to the public business, would it not bring the governor to such an explicit conduct as either to restore the General Assembly or give the two houses a fair occasion to declare the chair vacant? In which case the council would hold it till another governor should be appointed. This would immediately reduce the government prescribed in the Charter, and the people would be united in what they would easily see to be a constitutional opposition to tyranny. You know there is a charm in the word constitutional. Samuel Adams to Joseph Warren, Philadelphia, September 25, 1774. My dear sir, I wrote you yesterday by the post. A frequent communication at this critical conjuncture is necessary. As the all-important American cause so much depends upon each colony's acting agreeably to the sentiments of the whole, it must be useful to you to know the sentiments which are entertained here of the temper and conduct of our province. 
Heretofore we have been accounted by many intemperate and rash, but now we are universally applauded as cool and judicious, as well as spirited and brave. This is the character we sustain in Congress. There is, however, a certain degree of jealousy in the minds of some that we aim at a total independency, not only of the mother country, but of the colonies too, and that, as we are a hardy and brave people, we shall in time overrun them all. However groundless this jealousy may be, it ought to be attended to, and is of weight in your deliberations on the subject of your last letter. I spent yesterday afternoon and evening with Mr. Dickinson. He is a true Bostonian. It is his opinion that, if Boston can safely remain on the defensive, the liberties of America, which that town has so nobly contended for, will be secured. The Congress have, in their resolve of the 17th instant, given their sanction to the resolutions of the County of Suffolk, one of which is to act merely upon the defensive, so long as such conduct may be justified by reason and the principles of self-preservation, but no longer. They have great dependence upon your tried patience and fortitude. They suppose you mean to defend your civil constitution. They strongly recommend perseverance in a firm and temperate conduct and give you a full pledge of their united efforts in your behalf. They have not yet come to final resolutions. It becomes them to be deliberate. I have been assured in private conversation with individuals that if you should be driven to the necessity of acting in the defense of your lives or liberty, you would be justified by their constituents and openly supported by all the means in their power. But whether they will ever be prevailed upon to think it necessary for you to set up another form of government, I very much question for the reason I have before suggested. It is of the greatest importance that the American opposition should be united, and that it should be conducted so as to concur with the opposition of our friends in England. Adieu. Samuel Adams. Before these letters could have been received by Warren, he was chosen at a meeting of the freeholders at Faneuil Hall, one of the delegates to the proposed Provincial Congress. The Boston delegation consisted of the four representatives, Cushing, Samuel Adams, Hancock, and William Phillips, with Warren, Benjamin Church, and Nathaniel Appleton. The instructions which the town gave to the delegates, not improbably prepared by Warren, are so brief and important that I copy them. It will be seen that they come fully up to, while they do not go beyond, the resolution of the General Congress passed on the 17th. Gentlemen, as we have chosen you to represent us in the great and general court, to be holden at Salem on Wednesday, the fifth day of October next ensuing, we do hereby instruct you that, in all your doings as members of the House of Representatives, you adhere firmly to the charter of this province, granted by their majesties King William and Queen Mary, and that you do no act which can possibly be construed into an acknowledgment of the validity of the Act of British Parliament for altering the government of the Massachusetts Bay. More especially, that you acknowledge the Honorable Board of Councillors elected by the General Court at their session in May last, as the only rightful and constitutional council of this province. And we have reason to believe that a conscientious discharge of your duty will produce your dissolution as a House of Representatives. We do hereby empower and instruct you to join with the members who may be sent from this and the other towns in the province, and to meet with them at a time agreed on in a general provincial congress, to act upon such matters as may come before you in such a manner as shall appear to you most conducive to the true interest of this town and province, and most likely to preserve the liberties of all America. The following card from Warren was printed in the Boston Gazette of the 26th of September. It is one of a class of facts which show the absence in the great movement of the American Revolution of the theological element, which in the old world had played so great a part in the wars and dealings of the nations. September 24, 1774. Messrs. Printers. As I have been informed that the conduct of some few persons of the Episcopal denomination in maintaining principles inconsistent with the rights and liberties of mankind has given offense to some of the jealous friends of this country, I think myself obliged to publish the following extract of a letter, dated September 9, 1774, 
which I received from my worthy and patriotic friend, Mr. Samuel Adams, a member of the Congress now sitting in Philadelphia, by which it appears that, however injudicious some individuals may have been, the gentlemen of the established Church of England are men of the most just and liberal sentiments, and are high in the esteem of the most sensible and resolute defenders of the rights of the people of this continent. And I earnestly request my countrymen to avoid everything which our enemies may make use of to prejudice our Episcopal brethren against us, by representing us as disposed to disturb them in the free exercise of their religious privileges, to which we know they have the most undoubted claim, and which, from a real regard to the honor and interest of my country and the rights of mankind, I hope they will enjoy unmolested as long as the name of America is known in the world. J. Warren. After settling the mode of voting, which is by giving each colony an equal voice, it was agreed to open the business with prayer. As many of our warmest friends are members of the Church of England, I thought it prudent, as well on that as on some other accounts, to move that the service should be performed by a clergyman of that denomination. Accordingly, the lessons of the day in prayer were read by the Reverend Mr. Duché, who afterwards made a most excellent extempore prayer, by which he discovered himself to be a gentleman of sense and piety, and a warm advocate for the religious and civil rights of America. The journals of the Committee of Correspondence attest the continuous labors of Warren in its business. We meet daily. Church, a member writes. Daily occurrences demand our attention. An armed truce is the sole tenure by which the inhabitants of Boston possess life, liberty, or property. And John Pitts, another member, wrote to Samuel Adams, In your absence, there have been, as usual, the improvement of the ready pens of a Warren and Church, the criticism of a Greenleaf, the vigilance and industry of a Molino, and the united wisdom of those who commonly compose the committee. The following letter shows the state of things at the time of the assembling of the Provincial Congress. Joseph Warren to Samuel Adams. Boston, September 29, 1774. Dear Sir, My last letter of the 26th instant you will doubtless have received by the post before this reached you. Since then, there have been arrivals from England by which we learn that the ministry are still inflexible and obstinate. The consequence then is that, if America sees better days, it must be the result of her own conduct. The fortifications on Boston Neck are carried on without intermission. The troops are availing themselves of every opportunity to make themselves more formidable and render the people less able to oppose them. They keep a constant search for everything which will be serviceable in battle, and whenever they espy any instruments which may serve or disserve them, whether they are the property of individuals or the public is immaterial, they are seized and carried into the camp or on board the ships of war. Mr. Joseph Scott of this town has sold them a number of shells, cowborns, chain shot, etc., to the amount of 500 pounds sterling, and yesterday, about noon, they were carried on board one of the ships. The people are enraged against Mr. Scott, and he keeps incognito. About 200 carpenters were employed last week in providing barracks for the troops. This week the works are entirely forsaken. A few hands indeed are raised from the regiments, but by no means enough to carry on the buildings with expedition. The employment was profitable to the tradesmen and drew cash from the king to circulate in this impoverished town, but in consequence of the proceedings of the committee, they desisted and discovered a great aversion to do anything displeasing to their brethren in the country, or that could possibly be injurious to the cause of American freedom. The treatment which the inhabitants receive from the soldiery makes us think that they regard us as enemies rather than as fellow subjects. Some of our warm advocates can hardly brook the many private insults we receive, and were it not that your august body had cautioned us against any engagement with them, I fear bloodshed would have ensued before this. When they carried the machines from Mr. Scott's, it made us tremblingly alive all over. And it is as much as our grave, serious people can affect to keep people from action at some particular times. The determination of the Congress is weighted with much impatience that, we expect, will be decisive. 
In your letter from England were enclosed two pamphlets, but as I knew you had one of them at Philadelphia some time ago, and that Dr. Winthrop had sent you the other, I did not think it worth while to burden the carrier with them. Mr. Samuel Phillips, Jr., of Andover, was this day carrying about a dozen firearms over Charleston Ferry. The sloop of war lying in the river dispatched a boat and seized them. A load of straw, said to be the property of Major Goldthwaite, was this day bringing to town for the use of soldiers, but the high sons of Roxbury gave it to the flames. Your worthy family are all well, and would have you informed that they think of you, though they are not with you. Hosiah Quincy, Esquire, sailed for London last Monday. People were so rapacious for the intelligence brought from the Congress by Mr. Revere that I thought myself bound to publish an extract from your letter, and although it was done without your permission, I know you will forgive it. Please let Mr. Cushing know that I should not have published his letter but at the earnest request of a number of our most valuable friends. These publications, I think, you would approve if you were sensible of the animation they give to our dejected friends. The inconnection and want of form in this hasty production pleads for its excuse that Mr. Revere waits for it. I am, dear sir, with the utmost sincerity, your friend and humble servant, Joseph Warren. Mr. Adams. The action of the Committee of Correspondence referred to in this letter related to work in building barracks for the Army. The committees of 13 towns met in Faneuil Hall, agreed upon a systematic plan in relation to a refusal of supplies, and declared all to be inveterate enemies to their country who furnished any materials whatever that would enable the troops to distress the inhabitants. The journals also contain a particular account of an interview which Warren now had with Governor Gage in relation to the new fortification and the purchase of stores. General Gage, in his official letters, dwelt on the difficulties he encountered in consequence of the action relative to labor and supplies. The governor now had to meet the more serious movement of a provincial congress. He issued a precept on the 1st of September for a return of representatives to the general court to be convened on the 5th of October at Salem. But, he says, when he saw the resolves passed by some of the counties and the instructions given by the town of Boston and some other towns to their representatives, he issued a proclamation on the 28th of September declaring a general court inexpedient, discharging all persons elected from giving their attendance and announcing his intention not to be present at the time and place he had named. Agreeably to the plan agreed, upon 90 of the representatives elect met on the 5th of October at Salem. After waiting a day for the appearance of the constitutional governor, they resolved themselves into a provincial Congress, elected John Hancock, their chairman, and Benjamin Lincoln, their secretary, passed a series of resolves, and adjourned to meet at Concord. The action of the governor, as it was neither a dissolution nor a prorogation of the legislature, was declared by the patriots to be without the warrant of law. The Provincial Congress assembled on the 11th of October at Concord. Many towns that did not choose representatives elected delegates to this Congress. There were 288 members, all but 20 present, who were sent by 212 towns. John Hancock was elected their president and Benjamin Lincoln their secretary. The Congress met first in the courthouse, but adjourned to the meeting house. Many of the delegates had taken part in the county conventions and subsequently were distinguished in civil or military life. There were returned from the towns in Suffolk County, besides Cushing, Samuel Adams, Hancock, and Warren, William Heath, and Benjamin Lincoln, generals throughout the Revolutionary War. From Essex were John Pickering, Azor Orne, Jonathan Greenleaf, and Elbridge Gerry, who were distinguished in political life. From Middlesex were Nathaniel Gorham, a prominent member of the convention that formed the Federal Constitution, William Prescott, and Thomas Gardner, colonels in the Bunker Hill Battle, Richard Devins, an active member of the Committee of Safety, James Barrett, the commander of the militia at Concord on the 19th of April, James Prescott, subsequently a judge, and Henry Gardner, soon to be the treasurer. Hampshire returned Seth Pomeroy, a veteran of Louisburg fame, and Joseph Hawley, a patriot of decidedly the largest influence in the western part of the province, 
Plymouth sent James Warren, a pioneer patriot who became president of the Provincial Congress, Bristol, Robert Treat Payne, the poet and jurist, and York sent James Sullivan, the scholar, statesman, and future governor. From Worcester came Artemis Ward, the first commander of the colonial army, and Moses Gill and Timothy Bigelow, distinguished in political life. The memories of many other delegates are cherished for their character and intelligent public service. The Congress was a fine representation of the great interests of the province as well as of its patriotism. The proceedings of this body show that Warren shared largely in its confidence and in its labors. His letters indicate that he felt the responsibility of the hour and meant to act with caution. He and his associates from Boston had before them a difficult role, for they found themselves by far the most moderate men of the Congress, the members in general being in favor of forming a new government, and it was a duty not to fall in with what was popular, but to do what was right. The shallow declaimers of the day were rash, but the thinkers said, These are great and profound questions. We are grieved to find ourselves reduced to the necessity of entering into the discussion of them. The last letter of Warren shows his feeling on the vital question of taking up a new local government or of proceeding without outside advice or authority as a separate, independent, sovereign state. The resolve of Congress on the 17th of September was a recommendation to defend, in a firm and temperate way, the civil constitution and, in doing this, to use so much of the law as remained. This also was the advice of Samuel Adams. And John Adams, after he had learned with certainty the views of the members, wrote, The proposal of some among you of reassuming the old charter is not approved here at all. The proposal of setting up a new form of government of our own is less approved still. He wrote of the future in the following warning tone. They, the members, will not, at this session, vote to raise men or money or arms or ammunition. Their opinions are fixed against hostilities and ruptures, except that they should become absolutely necessary, and this necessity they do not yet see. They dread the thoughts of an action because it would make a wound which would never be healed. It would fix and establish a rancor which would descend to the latest generations. It would render all hopes of reconciliation with Great Britain desperate. It would light up the flames of war, perhaps through the whole continent, which might rage for 20 years and end in the subduction of America as likely as her liberties. Such language must have increased the anxiety of the popular leaders in the Provincial Congress. A close inspection of its proceedings shows that little of a positive character was done for 10 days or until after it met at Cambridge. It was evidently awaiting the final action of the Grand American Congress, as the Philadelphia body was termed. It was now said that the whole attention and conversation were wrapped up in the Congress. An intelligent Boston patriot, John Pitts, in a letter to Samuel Adams, relative to the views of the members of the Provincial Congress on the question of a subordinate government, said, Without doubt they would be cautious to take the sense of your body, from whose wisdom we hope for relief. In fact, it had long been an understanding, reached through the organization of committees of correspondence, that the patriots of one colony should take no important step without the concurrence of the patriots of the other colonies. In this spirit, the proceedings relative to the tea had been carried on. In this spirit, the people had refused to obey the officials acting under the Regulating Act. In this spirit, the wise popular leaders meant to proceed in the formation of a new government. Man had not attained to perfection in Massachusetts. There were mobs, personal insults, and silly gasconade, and the violent talked as though they were ready, at the head of a town or a county or a colony, to brave the British Empire. This was the effervescence of the hour. It was the material which for years supplied what truth there was in the wanton misrepresentations of the patriots by the Tories, who said that this was the patriot cause. To the statesmen of that day, in all the colonies who, amidst the unavoidable confusion in upholding this cause, held on to social order and national unity, is the world indebted for the American Revolution. Warren, in the letter just printed, said that the determination of Congress was awaited with much impatience, and that would be decisive, and that people were rapacious for intelligence from it. 
It is said in the newspapers that Congress continued in private, solemn deliberation, and, as the members were under some honorary ties of secrecy, nothing had transpired of their proceedings. Ten days later, nothing had transpired from this body, but it was reported that Paul Revere, who went as an express from Boston to the delegates, was waiting in Philadelphia for the result of the determinations of Congress. A week later, on the 20th of October, the Massachusetts Gazette contained this announcement. A gentleman last evening favored us with the following resolves, just come to hand from Philadelphia. They were five in number, the first having been passed on the 8th of October. Resolved that this Congress approve of the opposition made by the inhabitants of the Massachusetts Bay to the execution of the late Acts of Parliament, and if the same shall be attempted to be carried into execution by force, in such case all America ought to support them in their opposition. The four other resolves were designed to meet the condition of the affairs in the province. One recommended that the people continue peaceably and firmly in the line they are now conducting themselves, on the defensive, Another substantially advised a suspension of action relative to instituting a new government until the effect was known of an application for a repeal of the act by which their charter rights were infringed. End of chapter 12, part 1. Chapter 12, part 2 of Life and Times of Joseph Warren by Richard Frothingham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Samuel Adams now wrote to Dr. Young, I think our countrymen discover the spirit of Rome or Sparta. I admire in them that patience, which, you have often heard me say, is characteristic of the patriot. Inter arma silent leges, I have written to our friends to provide themselves without delay with arms and ammunition, get well instructed in the military art, embody themselves, and prepare a complete set of rules that they may be ready in case they are called to defend themselves against the violent acts of despotism. Surely the laws of self-preservation will warrant it in this time of danger and doubtful expectation." On the afternoon of the day of the publication of these resolves, the Provincial Congress appointed a committee to consider what was necessary to do for the defense and safety of the province. I need not present in detail the proceedings on this report, or the doings of the Congress. The debates for several days were long and earnest, but there is no report of the speeches. The deliberations resulted in the adoption on the 26th of a series of resolves which provided for the creation of a Committee of Public Safety as a sort of directory to take care of the Commonwealth which may be summed up as an authority to organize the militia and to provide military stores when they should take the field. The resolves also provided for officers to command this force. On the next day, the Congress elected, by ballot, nine of its members to compose the committee, choosing first three from Boston and then nine from the country. They elected Hancock, Warren, and Church from the town, Richard Devins of Charlestown, Benjamin White of Brookline, Joseph Palmer of Braintree, Norton Quincy, who declined, Abraham Watson of Cambridge, Azor Orne of Marblehead. Subsequently, John Pigeon of Newton, William Heath of Roxbury, and Jabez Fisher of Rentham were added. The Congress next elected five commissaries who were called a Committee of Supplies, David Cheever, Moses Gill, Jeremiah Lee, Benjamin Lincoln, and Benjamin Hall. Three general officers were then chosen, Jedediah Preble, Artemis Ward, and Seth Pomeroy. On the 28th, Congress passed the resolve inviting the constitutional members of His Majesty's Council of this colony by the Royal Charter, chosen last May, to meet with the Congress at their adjournment, and on the 29th appointed Henry Gardner Receiver General to receive the usual revenue for the use of the province at the hands of the constables, collectors, and other persons. The Congress appointed a day of public thanksgiving in particular from a consideration of the Union, which so remarkably prevailed, not only in the province, but throughout the continent at this alarming crisis. 
The Congress on the 29th adjourned until the 23rd of November. It declined to take action on the formation of a new government and adhered strictly to the recommendations of the Continental Congress. Warren's name occurs on committees from the commencement to the close of the session. He now began a great service as a member of the Committee of Public Safety, the executive of the colony. It met on the 2nd of November at Cambridge and organized by the choice of John Hancock as chairman, but he did not attend the next session, and Warren's name stands on its journal at the head of the list of members present at this meeting. The committee voted to purchase provisions for an army, and at the second meeting on the 8th, they voted to procure all the arms and ammunition which they could of the neighboring provinces. On the evening of the next day, Cushing and the two Adamses came into the town from Congress, where the people testified their joy at their safe arrival by ringing the bells, some of them till midnight. Hancock did not attend the next meeting of the Committee of Safety on the 15th, when it was voted to have seven large pieces of cannon carried out of Boston. Warren, in behalf of the Committee of Donations, now replied to a letter from the Committee of Middletown, Connecticut, which enumerated things that roused their attention and zeal and induced them to unite with their brethren throughout the continent. They said the claim of Parliament was enforced by the grossest violation of royal faith in tearing up by the roots the ancient charter of Massachusetts and by all the evils of Pandora's box let loose in the new form of government imposed upon the people. The reply to this spirited letter is as follows. Reply to Middletown. Boston, November 17th, 1774. Gentlemen, your kind letter of the 17th of October came safe to hand. When we reflect on the great importance of the controversy in which we are engaged, when we consider that America will be free and happy or severely wretched, according as we conduct ourselves, we tremble. But that we are contending for our rights, that the continent supports us, makes us confident and determined. The plan which has been so long concerted to deprive America of her rights seems now to be executing, and that the ministry have chosen the town of Boston as their first victim. That we are sequestered from all America for a criterion by which they shall determine how far the idea of despotic government is compatible with the sentiments of free-born Americans gives us no concern, because the spirit which is discovered in Middletown has diffused itself through the continent. Many have been the devices, subtle have been the schemes, and low the artifices made use of to sow distension and division, but the virtue of our country has risen superior to them all, and we see a band now formed which will encourage our friends and confound our enemies. The ministry have hitherto kept the people of Great Britain ignorant of the true state of America. They have by bribes and falsehoods deceived the nation. Truth and justice were never so effectually enveloped in the thick clouds of calumny and detraction. The mercenary writers they have employed to misrepresent, vilify, and abuse the Bostonians afford us a striking instance of the base methods they pursue to ruin us. We have, however, the best grounds to think that the tide is turning in our favor. The eyes of the people of Britain begin to be opened. The coolness, temper, and firmness of the Americans' proceedings, the unanimity of all the colonies in the same sentiments of their rights and of the injustice offered to Boston, and the patience with which those injuries are at present borne, without the least appearance of submission, have a good deal surprised and disappointed our enemies, and the tone of public conversation, which has been so violently against us, begins evidently to turn. This is the language of as good a friend as America has in England, and whose authority we can rely on. And, if this most desirable change had taken place before the proceedings of the American Congress were known in England, what may we expect upon their being known? Had not the present ministry discovered such rancor and such malice in their proceedings in respect to America? We should expect everything to our wishes." But we have had such full demonstration of their diabolical designs against us that we can look for nothing from them but what our own virtue and spirit can extort. The regular, 
firm and spirited conduct of the continent, if they should even fail of success, will eternally redound to their honor. And should they meet that success, which their cause merits, they must be the happiest people on whom the sun shines. The propriety and zeal with which the town of Middletown have treated the indignity which is offered to their country seems to be a renewing that glorious ardor which warmed the breasts of their progenitors. It is a disposition which has heretofore been attended with prosperity. The support which they have formerly so liberally afforded the town of Boston in their sufferings demands our warmest gratitude. This recent instance of their good wishes for our success and the readiness and forwardness which they discover to do everything in their power for maintaining and preserving the rights of their country and for supporting and feeding any who are immediate sufferers by the vengeance of their enemies cannot fail to excite gratitude from every friend to the rights of mankind and from the town of Boston in particular. We are not insensible although there is a probability that our grievances will be redressed, that everything yet depends on our own virtue and resolution. Great patience, vigilance, and public spirit are still necessary. The point has been so long and so strenuously contended for that our enemies will never give it up till they are compelled by the last and most unavoidable necessity. Our cause is so just, and we are so sensible how necessary it is to defend it, that we have no doubt, but with the blessing of heaven upon us and upon the many good friends engaged for us, we shall be able to hold on and hold out until oppression, injustice, and tyranny shall be superseded by freedom, justice, and good government. And we cannot but flatter ourselves that while we are contending for justice for ourselves, we shall be instrumental in calling back that virtue which of late years has fled from the counsels of our parent country. We are, gentlemen, your friends and obliged humble servants, Joseph Warren, per order of the Committee of Donations. P.S. We have just now, by Captain Shepherd from London, received His Majesty's proclamation for dissolving the late Parliament of Great Britain, whose conduct respecting America will be remembered with horror through all succeeding generations. To the Committee of Correspondence for the Town of Middletown. Warren, four days after penning this magnetic utterance, sent a remarkable letter to Hosiah Quincy, Jr., who was in London. He was a kindred spirit and closed his observations on the port bill in the following strain. America hath in store her Bruti and Cassi, her Hamptons and Sydneys, patriots and heroes who will form a band of brothers, men who will have memories and feelings, courage and swords, Courage that shall inflame their ardent bosoms till their hands cleave to their swords and their swords to their enemies' hearts. His biographer, in printing Warren's letter, remarks that it is peculiarly interesting because few similar records of his mind remain, and as it evidences that the life he sacrificed on Bunker Hill was offered, not under the excitement of the moment, but with a fixed and deliberate purpose. No language can be more decisive of the spirit which predominated in his bosom. It is the united voice of America to preserve their freedom, or lose their lives in defense of it. The passages I have put in italics are placed by Bancroft at the beginning of one of the chapters of his history. To Hosiah Quincy, Jr. Boston, November 21st, 1774 Dear Sir, as nothing interesting which I am at liberty to communicate has taken place since your departure from home, except such matters as you could not fail of being informed of by the public papers, I have deferred writing to you, knowing that, upon your first arrival in London, you would be greatly engaged in forming your connections with the friends of this country to whom you have been recommended. Our friends who have been at the Continental Congress are in high spirits on account of the union which prevails throughout the colonies. It is the united voice of America to preserve their freedom or lose their lives in defense of it. Their resolutions are not the effect of inconsiderate rashness, but the sound result of sober inquiry and deliberation. 
I am convinced that the true spirit of liberty was never so universally diffused through all ranks and orders of people in any country on the face of the earth as it now is through all North America. The Provincial Congress met at Concord at the time appointed. About 260 members were present. You would have thought yourself in an assembly of Spartans or ancient Romans had you been a witness to the ardor which inspired those who spoke upon the important business they were transacting. An injunction of secrecy prevents my giving any particulars of their transactions, except such as by their express order were published in the papers. But, in general, you may be assured that they approved themselves the true representatives of a wise and brave people, determined at all events to be free. I know I might be indulged in giving you an account of our transactions, were I sure this would get safe to you, but I dare not, as the times are, risk so important intelligence. Next Wednesday, the 23rd instant, we shall meet again according to adjournment. All that I can safely communicate to you shall be speedily transmitted. I am of opinion that the dissolution of the British Parliament, which we were acquainted with last week, together with some favorable letters received from England, will induce us to bear the inconvenience of living without government until we have some farther intelligence of what may be expected from England. It will require, however, a very masterly policy to keep the province for any considerable time longer in its present state. The town of Boston is by far the most moderate part of the province. They are silent and inflexible. They hope for relief, but they have found from experience that they can bear to suffer more than their oppressors or themselves thought possible. They feel the injuries they receive. They are the frequent subject of conversation, but they take an honest pride in being singled out by a tyrannical administration as the most determined enemies to an arbitrary power. They know that their merits, not their crimes, have made them the objects of ministerial vengeance. We endeavor to live as peaceably as possible with the soldiery, but disputes and quarrels often arise between the troops and the inhabitants. General Gage has made very few new maneuvers since you left us. He has indeed rendered the entrenchments at the entrance of the town as formidable as he possibly could. I have frequently been sent to him on committees and have several times had private conversations with him. I have thought him a man of honest, upright principles and one desirous of accommodating the difference between Great Britain and her colonies in a just and honorable way. He did not appear to be desirous of continuing the quarrel in order to make himself necessary, which is too often the case with persons employed in public affairs but a copy of a letter via Philadelphia said to be written from him to Lord North gives a very different cast to his character. His answer to the Provincial Congress, which was certainly ill-judged, I suppose was the work of some of that malicious group of harpies, whose disappointments make them desirous to urge the governor to drive everything to extremes. But, in this letter, if it be genuine, he seems to court the office of a destroyer of the liberties and murderer of the people of this province. But you have doubtless read the paper and thought with indignation on its contents. I wish to know of you how affairs stand in Great Britain and what was the principal motive of the dissolution of Parliament. If the late acts of Parliament are not to be repealed, the wisest step for both countries is fairly to separate and not spend their blood and treasure in destroying each other. It is barely possible that Britain may depopulate North America, but I trust in God she can never conquer the inhabitants. And if the cruel experiment is made, I am sure whatever fortunes may attend America, that Britain will curse the wretch who, to stop the mouths of his ravenous pack of dependents, bartered away the wealth and glory of her empire. I have not time to say more at present than to assure you that from this time you may expect to hear from me, news or no news, by every vessel, and that my earnest wish is that your abilities and integrity may be of eminent service to your country. I am, dear sir, your most obedient servant, Joseph Warren. General Gage's letters now show that he realized the import of the political unity which had been reached by the Patriots. On informing Lord Dartmouth on the 15th 
that he had issued a proclamation declaring the Provincial Congress an unlawful body, intending to riot and rebellion, he said that it had been encouraged to go to the lengths it had gone by the General Union, and the readiness of the New England provinces to appear in arms, and that the proceedings of the Continental Congress astonished and terrified all considerate men. A few days after Gage had issued his proclamation, and when, according to his representation, all considerate men were in terror the Provincial Congress on the 23rd of November reviewed its session. It invited John Adams and Robert Treat Payne to attend the meetings, the other delegates to the General Congress, Cushing and Samuel Adams, being members. It is not necessary to relate here in detail the proceedings of this body. The political center was now the Grand American Congress, and the chief committee of the session was the one appointed to consider its doings. Joseph Hawley was the chairman, and the other members were Samuel Dexter, Joseph Warren, Jeremiah Lee, James Warren, Elbridge Jerry, and Benjamin Church. Their report was a grateful endorsement of the proceedings of the General Congress and an adoption of the Association and recommending the people to observe it. This body continued the preparatory work of defense but went no farther. On the last day of the session, December 10th, a report which had been made on the question of assuming civil government was taken up, considered, and ordered to lie on the table. This Congress issued an address to the inhabitants, briefly explaining and urging the measures that had been adopted. It presented the general intelligence from England, together with the increase of the army and navy, as exciting the strongest jealousy that the system of colony administration, destructive to American liberty, was to be pursued and to be attempted with force to be carried into execution. In a tone alike solemn and elevated, it said, You are placed by providence in the post of honor because it is the post of danger, and while struggling for the noblest objects, the liberties of your country, the happiness of posterity, and the rights of human nature, the eyes, not only of North America and the whole British Empire, but of all Europe are upon you. It is added, let us therefore altogether solicitous that no disorderly behavior, nothing unbecoming our characters as Americans, as citizens, as Christians, be justly chargeable to us. Warren was now serving in the Committee of Correspondence, which continued its vigilant watch of passing events. The following note is copied from the original in his handwriting, dated two days after the adjournment of Congress. Boston, December 12, 1774. Gentlemen, we think it our duty to inform you that one of the transports sailed from this port yesterday in the afternoon with several hundred soldiers on board. There are various conjectures concerning her destination, but it is generally believed she is designed for Newport, and that the troops are to take possession of the fortress there. The vigilance of our enemies is well known. They doubt not the bravery of our countrymen, but if they can get our fortresses, our arms, and ammunition into their custody, they will despise all our attempts to shake off their fetters. We are convinced that you will do what prudence directs upon this important occasion and are, with great esteem, your friends and humble servants. Several town meetings were held in December in Boston on political affairs. Warren was placed on the inspection committee, created to carry into effect the Association of the Continental Congress on a committee to prepare a vote of thanks to the colonies for the contributions made for the poor of the town, and on another to frame an answer to General Gage. On the 30th of December, he was chosen delegate to the Second Provincial Congress. In the records of the Committee of Safety, he is named on a committee to inspect the commissary stores in Boston. Warren was now engaged in the various duties, town, provincial, and national, by which the Patriots, as a party, were carrying on their work. Though there was, strictly speaking, neither local nor general government, yet the majority of people in most of the colonies was so decisively arrayed in support of the measures of the Patriots that the recommendations, both local and general, were obeyed as rigidly as though they had the authority of law. The Tory party was now uncommonly active in Boston and elsewhere. Its organs denounced the patriots as hypocrites, independents, republicans, sowers of sedition, and rebels. 
It had long been said in Boston by adherents of this party that the local charter, or constitution, was based on principles much too democratic and subversive of all peace, good order, and government, and ought to be annihilated. It was said in the British House of Commons by Lord George Germain that there could not be a better thing than to do away with town meetings, and he would bring the Constitution of America as similar to the Constitution of England as possible. He said that the Massachusetts was governed by a tumultuous and riotous rabble, and he would not have men of a mercantile caste every day collecting themselves together and debating about political matters, for they ought to follow their mercantile employment and not trouble themselves with politics and government, which they do not understand. A divine said from his pulpit in Charleston, South Carolina, that mechanics and country clowns had no right to dispute about politics or what kings, lords, and commons had done or might do. These citations show the spirit of the party which now ruled England, which had sympathizers in the colonies and claimed the right of legislating in all cases whatsoever for America, and the regulating act was the assertion of this right. But the United Colonies demanded a repeal of this act, as well as of other acts conceived in a similar spirit. Warren wrote that, if this were not done, the wisest step for both countries was to separate and not spend their blood and treasure in destroying each other. And Franklin said to the ministry that the colonies must risk life and everything rather than submit to the claim of altering the local laws and charters at will. The United Voice of America urged, and even commanded, the people of Massachusetts to resist to the bitter end the new law. It was the vote of Congress on the 8th of October, pledging the fate of the colonies to Massachusetts that hardened George III to listen to no terms. The tone of the Whigs on the adjournment of the Continental Congress was exultant in the extreme. The Union step of instituting committees of correspondence had grown into the national measure of the Association for Non-Importation, Non-Exportation, and Non-Consumption. It is not necessary to discuss the question whether these were sound or wise measures to carry out on the eve of a war. It was great statementship to attain the result of United Councils. It was soon related in the journals that committees were appointed in almost every seaport from Georgia to New Hampshire to observe that the Continental Association be complied with in every article therein recommended. At this time, the Congress aimed neither at independence nor at civil war, but for redress of grievances and a restoration of harmony with the mother country. The point fairly reached was that of a party supporting a real American Union. The feeling of the hour was nowhere more earnestly expressed than in the utterances from South Carolina. Be comforted, ye oppressed Bostonians, and exult, ye northern votaries of liberty, that the sacred rays of freedom, which used to beam from you on us, are now reverberated with double efficacy back upon yourselves from your weaker sister Carolina, who stands foremost in her resolution to sacrifice her all in your defense. Again, Many thanks to the worthy Congress re-echoes from the generous breasts of grateful thousands. O oh, glorious day! O oh, happy union! From Nova Scotia to Georgia, one mighty mind inspires the whole. When I consider the unanimity, the firmness, the wisdom of our late representatives, I feel a joy unutterable and an exultation never felt before. It would be easy to fill pages with similar citations from the newspapers of other colonies. The following is extracted from a glowing communication in the Pennsylvania packet. The American Congress derives all its power, wisdom, and action, not from scrawled parchments signed by kings, but from the people. A freeman, in honoring and obeying the Congress, honors and obeys himself. I almost wish to hear the triumphs of the Jubilee of the year 1874, to see the medals, pictures, fragments of writings, etc., that shall be displayed to revive the memory of the proceedings of Congress in the year 1774. If any adventitious circumstances shall give precedency on that day, it shall be to inherit the blood, or even to possess the name, of a member of that glorious assembly." 
This language marks the hour of an outburst of genuine Americanism, when a great party were inspired with the purpose of freeing their country by a change of administration from the control of a party who claimed the right not merely to mold their forms of government, but to monopolize the fruits of their labor. For what purpose, Lord Carmarthen asked, in the debate on the Regulating Act, were they, the colonists, suffered to go to that country, unless the profits of their labor should return to their masters here. Union meant resistance to this arrogance and mastership. It meant more. It meant action in behalf of rights common to humanity. The great utterances of Congress are pervaded by the spirit of universal liberty. The words of the representative patriots of that time, whether they came from a Christopher Gadsden of South Carolina, an Alexander Hamilton of New York, a John Dickinson of Pennsylvania, or a Samuel Adams of Massachusetts, were broad and decisive. All are summed up in the words of Washington, who was soon to be the representative of his country. He pronounced the issue to involve the most essential and valuable rights of mankind. The hour had its symbol. On the first American flag was inscribed the motto, Liberty and Union. In this spirit, Warren and other popular leaders were conducting affairs in Massachusetts. Neither this province, Washington now said, nor any other province desired separately or collectively to set up for independence. But, he added, none of them will ever submit to the loss of those rights and privileges without which life liberty, and property were insecure. In this spirit of self-preservation, and by the advice of a body whose voice was as the voice of American law, the local popular leaders went on during the winter with the work of military preparation. Meantime, the donations flowed into Boston, and the letters which accompanied them continued to be on the rising tenor. One of them, from Durham, New Hampshire, addressed to the Boston Committee was printed, what you receive, the Durham Committee say, comes not from the opulent, but mostly from the industrious yeomanry in this parish. We have but few persons of affluence, but they cheerfully contributed. This is considered by us not as a gift or an act of charity, but of justice to those who are bravely standing in the gap between us and slavery, defending the common interest of the whole continent. We can with truth assure you, gentlemen, that in this quarter we are engaged to a man in your defense and in defense of the common cause. We are ready to communicate of our substance largely as your necessities require and with our estates to give our lives and mingle our blood with yours in the common sacrifice to liberty. Throughout the province, Ordinary minds gave way to the duty which engrossed all minds and stirred all hearts, for the great business of the hour was organization, in compliance with the recommendations of the Continental and the Provincial Congresses. The inhabitants in their several towns now signed agreements to meet for military drill, elected officers, and entered into pledges to obey, at a minute's warning, a summons to take the field. These bands of citizen soldiers, on parade days, repaired to the churches, where the village pastor prayed for strength from on high, and the village Hamdens uttered the exhortation to fight to the last, if need be, for the ancient liberties. The national spirit of the time is embodied in the following song, which is ascribed to Warren, and was printed this year in the newspapers. A Song on Liberty to the tune of the British Grenadier. That seat of science, Athens, and earth's proud mistress, Rome, where now are all their glories, we scarce can find their tomb. Then guard your rights, Americans, nor stoop to lawless sway. Oppose, 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 oppose for North America. Proud Albion bowed to Caesar and numerous hosts before, to Picts, to Danes, to Normans, and many masters more. But we can boast Americans have never fallen a prey. Huzzah, 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 for free America. We led fair freedom hither, and lo, the desert smiled. A paradise of pleasure now opened in the wild. 
Your harvest pulled American snow power shall snatch away. Preserve, preserve, preserve your rights in a free America. Torn from a world of tyrants beneath this western sky, we formed a new dominion, a land of liberty. The world shown we're free men here, and such will ever be. Huzzah, 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 huzzah for love and liberty. God bless this maiden climate, and through her vast domain, may hosts of heroes cluster that scorn to wear a chain, and blast the venal sink events who dare our rights betray. Assert yourselves, yourselves, yourself for a brave America. Lift up your hearts, my heroes, and swear with proud disdain. The wretch that would ensnare you shall spread his net in vain. Should Europe empty all her force, we'd meet them in array. And shout huzzah, huzzah, huzzah for a brave America. The land where freedom reigns shall still be masters of the main. In giving laws and freedom to subject France and Spain, and all the isles or ocean spread shall tremble and obey the prince who rules by freedom's law in North America. End of chapter 12, part 2. Chapter 13 of Life and Times of Joseph Warren by Richard Frothingham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Warren and the Committees. The Struggle in Europe. The Position of Massachusetts. Franklin and the Ministry. Military Preparations. The Second Provincial Congress. The Committee of Safety. Public Opinion. Warren's Second Oration. 1775. January to March. I am convinced that our existence as a free people absolutely depends on acting with spirit and vigor. The ministry are even yet doubtful whether we are in earnest when we declare our intention to preserve our liberty. These words were written by Warren, and he was interpreting them by efficient action. The journals of the Committee of Public Safety show clearly enough the nature of some of his service. One of the January votes was that Dr. Warren be desired to wait on Colonel Robinson in relation to securing certain brass cannon and seven-inch mortars, and they ordered supplies of arms and ammunition to be deposited at Concord and Worcester. The inspection committee, on which Warren was placed by the town, grew directly out of the action of the Continental Congress. It is stated in the Boston Journals of the 5th of January that all the southern provinces have heartily adopted the resolutions of the late respectable Continental Congress and are taking proper steps to carry them into full execution. And a few days later, January 9th, it is reported that the assemblies of Rhode Island, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and Maryland had met and taken steps to carry the whole of these measures into execution. It is added, in the other colonies where the assemblies have not yet met, they are all with vigor and unanimity exerting themselves in the same important and glorious cause, so that, it is thought, there never was framed a set of human laws that were more strictly and religiously observed than these will be. When petitioners of Marshfield applied to General Gage for leave to hold a meeting, according to the Act of Parliament, Samuel Adams wrote in a letter, They will be dealt with according to the law of the Continental Congress, the laws of which are more observed throughout this continent than any man's laws whatever. It was one of the duties of the inspection committees and the committees of correspondence to see that the non-importation agreement was strictly observed, and the newspapers contain many advertisements of cargoes of vessels to be sold by auction under the direction of these committees and agreeably to the American Congress Association. In some instances, freight and vessels that had violated this agreement was thrown overboard, which was the case with an invoice of salt, coal, and tiles that arrived at Charleston, South Carolina, the committee being present. The progress of events in America, made known through the press, was attracting more and more the attention of the political world. The British minister at the Court of Vienna, Sir John Murray Keith, wrote, 
There is not a man of sense in Europe who does not think that the question now in agitation between Great Britain and her colonies is one of the most important, as well as most singular, that has been canvassed for many centuries. The Americans, who had to meet this question, uttered the same sentiment in private letters, in official papers, and through the press. Well might a looker-on, far away from the din of the struggle, pronounce the question most singular, for the authoritative voices of the two American centers of action, the Continental Congress and the Provincial Congress of Massachusetts, were not only disclaiming a desire of independence, but were professing affectionate fealty to the king. The men who spoke for Massachusetts were solemnly pronouncing the controversy to be a calamity and were ordering that prayers be offered to Almighty God, that his blessing might rest upon all the British Empire, upon George III, their rightful king, and upon all the royal family, that they might all be great and lasting blessings to the world. It ought ever to be borne in mind that, from the beginning of the controversy, the people of Massachusetts made no demands on the sovereignty for an extension of popular power. The following candid, temperate, and just summary of their past action and position was printed in the Philadelphia Journal of the 1st of January, 1775. The people of Massachusetts have hitherto acted purely on the defensive. They have only opposed those new regulations which were instantly to have been executed and would have annihilated all our rights. For this absolutely necessary and manly step, they have received the approbation of the Continental Congress, one of the most respectable assemblies in the world. They aim at no independency nor anything new, but barely the preservation of their old rights. Since the passage of the Act authorizing the East India Company to export tea to America, the issue had been on the original question of taxation, but the Ministry, alarmed at the union of the colonies, declared now to Franklin, through friendly agents, that they would concede the point of taxation, would repeal the Tea Act and the Boston Port Act, but that the two acts relating to Massachusetts, the Regulating Act and the Act Concerning the Administration of Justice, must remain as permanent amendments to the local Constitution, and as a standing example of the power of Parliament. When the momentous issue was narrowed down to the preservation of old customs and rights, the reply of the great American was prompt and decided, and spoke the united voice of the party who constituted the majority of his countrymen. While Parliament claims the right of altering American constitutions at pleasure, there can be no agreement, for we are rendered unsafe in every privilege. Subsequently, Franklin sent, through Lord Howe to Lord North, the following as his last words. The Massachusetts must suffer all the hazards and mischiefs of war rather than admit the alteration of their charter and laws by Parliament. They that can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. The journals reported from time to time the concentration of military and naval force at Boston, and said that when the whole of the army should arrive, it would consist of about 6,400 men. On the 18th of January, General Gage wrote to Lord Dartmouth, The eyes of all are turned upon Great Britain, and it is the opinion of most people that, if a respectable force is seen in the field, the most obnoxious of the leaders seized, and a pardon proclaimed for all others, government will come off victorious and with less opposition than was expected a few months ago. A letter was now on the way from Lord Dartmouth to the general, containing directions as, the first essential step to be taken towards re-establishing government, to arrest and imprison the principal actors and abettors in the Provincial Congress. On the 21st of January, a gentleman in Boston, in writing to his friend in London, said that the Continental Congress had drawn a line by the banks of the ocean, had claimed their own exclusive jurisdiction in all interior concerns and in all cases of taxation, had left to Great Britain the exclusive sovereignty of the ocean and over their trade, and had placed both upon constitutional principles, and that it was vain, it was delirium, it was frenzy, to think of dragooning three millions of English people out of their liberties. He added, There is a spirit prevailing here such as I never saw before. I remember the conquest of Louisburg in 1745. 
I remember the spirit here when the Duke D'Anville squadron was upon this coast, when 40,000 men marched down to Boston and were mustered and numbered upon the common, complete in arms from this province only in three weeks, but I remember nothing like what I have seen these six months past. Neither the king, his ministers, nor the Tory majority in Parliament could be convinced by the blaze of genius and the burst of thought of Camden, Chatham, and Burke that there was anything more serious than the acts of a rude rabble without plan, without concert, and without conduct. The first Lord of the Admiralty declared the Americans were neither disciplined nor capable of discipline. The task of restraining the rash among the patriots was becoming harder every day. The leaders on both sides now expected the commencement of war. In the judgment of Lord Dartmouth, if the arrest of the members of the Provincial Congress should occasion hostilities, it were better that the conflict should begin on such grounds than in a riper state of the rebellion. Samuel Adams, on the 29th of January, wrote, We appear to be in a state of hostility, the general with regiments, with a very few adherents on one side, and all the rest of the inhabitants of the province, backed by all the colonies on the other, they, the people, are resolved not to be the aggressors in an open quarrel with the troops, but, animated with an unquenchable love of liberty, they will support their righteous claim to it to the utmost extremity. On the 1st of February, the Second Provincial Congress assembled at Cambridge, of which Warren was a member and a prominent actor. It was composed largely of the members of the preceding Congress. Warren's name appears in connection with most of the proceedings. On the 9th, the Congress reappointed a Committee of Safety in a resolve which reads that the Honorable John Hancock, Esquire, Dr. Joseph Warren, Dr. Benjamin Church, Jr., Mr. Richard Devins, Captain Benjamin White, Colonel Joseph Palmer, Mr. Abraham Watson, Colonel Azor Orne, Mr. John Pigeon, Colonel William Heath, and Mr. Jabez Fisher, B and hereby R appointed a committee of safety to continue until the farther order of this or some other Congress or House of Representatives of this province. It was made their duty to observe the movements of all who should attempt to carry into execution the Regulating Act, or the Act relating to the administration of justice, and five of them, one to be an inhabitant of Boston, were authorized, in case they should judge such an attempt was to be made, to alarm, muster, and cause to be assembled with the utmost expedition so much of the militia of the province as they should judge to be necessary to oppose such attempts. Another resolve authorized Honorable Jedediah Preble, Esquire, Honorable Artemis Ward, Esquire, Colonel Seth Pomeroy, Colonel John Thomas, and Colonel William Heath to be general officers who, as such, for the purpose of resisting all attempts to execute the two acts, should command the said militia so long as it should be retained by the Committee of Safety and no longer. One of the Committee of Supplies, Mr. Hall, had declined and Eldridge Jerry was chosen in his place. Warren, on the day these resolves were passed, was in Boston. On the next day, while a committee of the Congress were observing the motion of the troops said to be on their way to Cambridge, Warren sent the following letter to Samuel Adams, in which he evinced the spirit which impelled him to share with his countrymen the fortune of the day of Bunker Hill. Joseph Warren to Samuel Adams, Boston, February 10th, 1775. Dear Sir, we were this morning alarmed with a report that a party of soldiers was sent to Cambridge with design to disperse the Congress. Many here believed it was in consequence of what was yesterday published by their order. I confess I paid so much regard to it as to be sorry I was not with my friends, and although my affairs would not allow of it, I went down to the ferry in a chase with Dr. Church, both determined to share with our brethren in any dangers that they might be engaged in. But we there heard that the party had quietly passed the bridge on their way to Roxbury, up on which we returned home. I have spent an hour this morning with Deacon Phillips, and I am convinced that our existence as a free people absolutely depends in acting with spirit and vigor. 
The ministry are even yet doubtful whether we are in earnest when we declare our resolution to preserve our liberty, and the common people there are made to believe we are a nation of noisy cowards. The ministry are supported in their plan of enslaving us by assurances that we have not courage enough to fight for our freedom. Even they who wish us well dare not openly declare for us, lest we should meanly desert ourselves and leave them alone to contend with administration, who they know will be, politically speaking, omnipotent if America should submit to them. Deacon Phillips, Dr. Church, and myself are all fully of opinion that it would be a very proper step should the Congress order a schooner to be sent home with an accurate state of facts, as it is certain that letters to and from our friends in England are intercepted and every method taken to prevent the people of Great Britain from gaining a knowledge of the true state of this country. I intended to have consulted you, had I been at Cambridge today, on the propriety of a motion for that purpose, but must defer it until tomorrow. One thing, however, I have upon my mind, which I think ought to be immediately attended to. The resolution of the Congress, published yesterday, greatly affects one Weston, who has hitherto been thought firm in our cause, but is now making carriages for the army. He assisted in getting the four field pieces to Colonel Robinson's at Dorchester, where they are now. He says the discovery of this will make him, and he threatens to make the discovery. Perhaps resentment and the hope of gain may together prevail with him to act the traitor. Dr. Church and I are clear that it ought not to be one minute in his power to point out the general the place in which they are kept, but that they ought to be removed without delay. Pray do not omit to obtain proper orders concerning them. I am, sir, in great haste, your very humble servant, Joseph Warren. Please to present my affectionate regards to Colonel Hancock and other worthy friends. Warren sat in Congress on the next day, for he is named with Hawley, Hancock, and others on a committee to report a resolve expressing the determination of this people coolly and resolutely to support their rights at all hazards. At the next meeting, he was placed on a committee of three to consider what it was expedient to do for the encouragement of the manufacture of saltpeter, and, on the last day of the session, was on a committee to report a resolve to create a committee to correspond with the neighboring governments, and then, with Hancock, Cushing, Jerry, Samuel Adams, and Heath, he was elected by ballot on this committee, to whom were added, by hand vote, Devins, Palmer, and Gill. A conference was held through a committee with a delegation present from Connecticut. Having appointed the 16th of March as a day of fasting and prayer, the Congress adjourned until the 23rd of March. The letter of Warren shows how deeply he was interested in the proceedings of this body, and the committees on which he was placed indicate the large confidence which the members felt in him. This Congress issued an address to the inhabitants of Massachusetts Bay. On this being reported, it was read and considered in paragraphs and then ordered to be recommitted for amendments when Dr. Church and Dr. Warren were added to the committee. The report made by the committee was accepted. It was printed in a pamphlet containing an abstract of the proceedings of the former Provincial Congress. Its tone is unusually solemn. It renewed the recommendation to carry into execution the plan projected by the wisdom of the whole continent as collected in the General Congress. It deprecated a rupture with the mother state, yet it urged every preparation for necessary defense. It recommended the people to have proper magazines duly prepared and strictly to adhere to the resolutions of the several Congresses on the principle that subjects generally pay obedience to the laws of the land, urging this weighty consideration we can conceive of no greater punishment for the breach of human laws than the misery that must inevitably follow your disregarding the plans that have, by your authority, with that of the whole continent, been projected. The closing words are, Your conduct hitherto, under the severest trials, has been worthy of you as men and Christians. The whole continent of America has this day cause to rejoice in your firmness. 
We trust you will still continue steadfast and, having regard to the dignity of your characters as freemen and those generous sentiments resulting from your natural and political connections, you will never submit your necks to the galling yoke of despotism prepared for you, but, with a proper sense of your dependence on God, nobly defend those rights which heaven gave and no man ought to take from us. It will be observed that the inhabitants of Massachusetts are appealed to as though they were in natural and political connections with a common country, and not as though they were or aspired to be a separate, independent, and sovereign nation. On the day after the adjournment of the Provincial Congress, Governor Gage informed Lord Dartmouth of its proceedings, remarking, If this Provincial Congress is not to be deemed a rebellious meeting, surely some of their resolves are rebellious, though they affect not to order, but only to recommend measures to the people. Three days later, he again wrote Lord Dartmouth of this body and evinced considerable anxiety in relation to an assumption of government and the Connecticut delegation. I have tried to get intelligence if they had presumed to usurp the government entirely and choose a governor, and am informed that the measure was talked of, but could not be carried. Some people from Connecticut termed a committee, and amongst them the governor's son, came to the Congress, which caused much speculation and, of course, many reports. Some say their business was to offer an aid of men. I can only yet discover that it was a visit of curiosity." Not unlikely the information relative to an assumption of government was communicated by church, for it was now said that there was a traitor in the Congress. Four days after Warren had acted so conspicuous a part in the Provincial Congress, he addressed the following calm and important letter to Arthur Lee. Boston, February 20th, 1775. Dear Sir, My friend, Mr. Adams, favored me with the sight of your last letter. I am sincerely glad of your return to England, as I think your assistance was never more wanted there than at present. It is truly astonishing that administration should have a doubt of the resolution of the Americans to make the last appeal rather than submit to where the yoke prepared for their necks. We have waited with a degree of patience which is seldom to be met with, but I will venture to assert that there has not been any great alloy of cowardice, though both friends and enemies seem to suspect us of want of courage. I trust the event, which I confess I think is near at hand, will confound our enemies and rejoice those who wish well to us. It is time for Britain to take some serious steps towards a reconciliation with her colonies. The people here are weary of watching the measures of those who are endeavoring to enslave them. They say they have been spending their time for ten years in counteracting the plans of their adversaries. They, many of them, begin to think that the difference between them will never be amicably settled, but that they shall always be subject to new affronts from the caprice of every British minister. They even sometimes speak of an open rupture with Great Britain as a state preferable to the present uncertain condition of affairs. And although it is true that the people have yet a very warm affection for the British nation, yet it sensibly decays. They are loyal subjects to the king, but they conceive that they do not swerve from their allegiance by opposing any measures taken by any man or set of men to deprive them of their liberties. They conceive that they are the king's enemies who would destroy the constitution, for the king is annihilated when the constitution is destroyed. It is not yet too late to accommodate the dispute amicably, but I am of the opinion that, If once General Gage should lead his troops into the country with design to enforce the late acts of Parliament, Great Britain may take her leave at least of the New England colonies, and if I mistake not, of all America. If there is any wisdom in the nation, God grant it may be speedily called forth. Every day, every hour widens the breach. A Richmond, a Chatham, a Shelburne, a Camden, with their noble associates, may yet repair it, and it is a work which none but the greatest of men can conduct. May you be successful and happy in your labors for the public safety. I am, sir, with great respect, your very humble servant, Dr. Lee Joseph Warren. This valuable letter contains an offhand analyzation of the aspect of a great movement. 
During the next four days, the Committee of Safety held meetings in Charlestown and Warren was present. The business transacted was important. The unusual record is made in the journal of the proceedings on the 21st that the votes were passed unanimously. Thus, voted unanimously by the Committee of Safety that the Committee of Supplies purchase all kinds of warlike stores sufficient for an army of 15,000 men. On the next day, the business consisted of the details of preparation, one of them being a provision for the reassembling of Congress on the arrival of the reinforcements coming to General Gage. On the 23rd, the committee met at 45 minutes after 7 in the morning, and besides other matters, it was agreed that a letter should be prepared and be ready for transmission to the commanding officers of the militia and Minutemen, directing them, on receipt of it, to assemble one-fourth part of the militia, and that this should be printed, and that certain couriers should deliver the letters. The Committee of Supplies were ordered to buy 20 hogsheads of rum and send them to Concord. On the 24th, provision was made for the road each courier should take when he carried the letters to the militia to take the field. The committee now adjourned to meet on the 7th of March at the house of Captain Stedman of Cambridge. Warren, during the proceedings of these four days, was placed on several special committees. One vote desired him to apply to the company in Boston, formerly under Major Paddock, to learn how many of them might be depended on, officers and men, to form an artillery company when the Constitutional Army of the province should take the field. The Provincial Congress had provided for certain rules and regulations for the officers and men of the Constitutional Army, which might be raised in the province, February 10th. The Committee of Safety had fixed this army at 15,000 men, but they were to be only conditionally summoned into the field. Among the manuscripts of this committee is a remarkable letter addressed on the 22nd of February by that admirable patriot Joseph Hawley to Thomas Cushing, enjoining upon him, Cushing, as he loved his country to use his utmost influence with the Committee of Safety, that the militia be not mustered, and that hostilities be not commenced until Massachusetts had the express categorical decision of the continent that the time has absolutely come that hostilities ought to begin, and that they would support us in continuing them. All the assurance or security of such effectual and continued aid, as would be absolutely necessary, Hawley said, was contained in a resolution of about six lines, and they consisting of terms and expressions not the most definite or of certain or precise meaning. The words used in the resolution to state the case wherein hostilities are to be commenced are, in my opinion, by far too loose, to wit, when the acts shall be attempted to be carried into execution by force, as well as the words made use of to secure the aid of the colonies, to wit, all America ought to support them in such opposition, not that they will actually support them, but a mere declaration that it would be reasonable and just that such support should be afforded. Is this a treaty, offensive and defensive, of sufficient precision to make us secure of the effectual aid of the other colonies in a war with Great Britain? There was no bolder spirit or more sterling character than Joseph Hawley, but he shrunk from the step of war without an assurance of the full sanction of the American Union. At this time, Hosea Quincy Jr. was about embarking at London for home, and he was commissioned by the friends of the cause abroad to enjoin on the people of Massachusetts by no means to take any steps of great consequence unless on a sudden emergency without the advice of the Continental Congress. Military events of an irritating nature rendered the preservation of the peace difficult and the occurrence of a sudden emergency imminent. Such were the dismissal of Hancock from the command of the cadets, the seizure of arms and ammunition, and the employment of the military to sustain civil action. To counteract the American Association, which had been adopted by the Continental Congress, the Tory party inaugurated a loyal association, the signers of which pledged themselves to oppose the proceedings of committees and congresses as the acts of unconstitutional assemblies. 
on the application of a portion of the people of Marshfield who had signed this Tory pledge, General Gage stationed a small force in this town, which, being under good discipline, did not disturb the inhabitants, were not molested, and remained until the 19th of April. This forbearance was ascribed by the Tories to the cowardice of the Minutemen. In continuance of the policy of disarming the Patriots, Colonel Leslie, on Sunday the 26th of February, was sent from Boston with a body of troops to seize certain military stores deposited at Salem. But the spirited conduct of the inhabitants defeated the object of this expedition, and the detachment thought itself fortunate in view of the Minutemen who spontaneously gathered in getting safely back to Boston. Even this show of hostility did not provoke the Committee of Safety to give the order for a general muster of the troops into the field. The militia and Minutemen continued to meet for drill in the towns all over the province, and, in many cases, the expenses were met by appropriations from the town treasury. This was the state of things when the king, not harboring a thought of concession, left the choice of war or peace to depend on the submission of Massachusetts to the Regulating Act. As the sword was hanging by a thread, the words sent to its patriots, along with the donations which had now continued in an uninterrupted flow for nine months, grew more and more tender. The Committee of Falmouth, now Portland, which, like Charlestown, was soon to become a holocaust for American liberty, said of its contribution, It is for suffering brethren who are standing in the gap between us and slavery. We are but few in number, and of small ability, and as we earn our bread by the sweat of our brow, shall ever hold in utter detestation both men and measures that would rob us of the fruits of our toil, and are ready with our labor, with our lives, and with our estates, to stand or fall in the common cause of liberty. And, if we fall, we shall die like men and like Christians, and enjoy the glorious privileges of the sons of God." The reply of the committee on donations was scarcely less touching. Your letter, though short, is very refreshing. Though the lines are few, the matter is very comprehensive. What could you have said more? The committee are greatly obliged and have not a little strengthened. You will please accept their sincere thanks for that cordial affection expressed in your letter and manifested in a way the most convincing. May the Lord bless you and reward you a thousandfold. This interchange of sentiment shows the silken cords that were intertwining communities into the sacred relations of country by cementing a union not defined on parchment but fragrant with the blossoming of fraternal sympathy. The press mirrored each fresh detail in the march of events towards American nationality. It now contained installments of foreign intelligence showing England's fierce temper, reports of the regiments sent to Boston, the parades of alarm lists through the colony, the choice of military officers in every county of Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, the resolves of Fairfax County, adopted at a meeting when Colonel George Washington was in the chair, taxing every tithable person for the purchase of arms, the expedition of Leslie at Salem, the alarm that flew like lightning, the last number of Novangulus proving the destruction of the tea just, proper, and right, avowing that committees of correspondence were intended by Providence for great events and declaring that Britain could restore harmony by desisting from taxing the colonies and interfering with their internal concerns. These details indicate the sentiment which, suggested by the common sense and heart, passed from mouth to mouth, in the home, in the street, in the club, in the caucus, in the public meeting, formed public opinion, and was a type of political momentum of modern times. The American mind at this time interpreted rightly the importance of the movement. Two utterances showing this are recorded side by side in the journals, the memorable charge of Judge William Henry Drayton enjoining a maintenance of the laws and the rights of the Constitution at the hazard of life and fortune, and the Novangulus of John Adams claiming for the basis of the Patriots the principles that all men were by nature equal, that kings are but the ministers of the people holding delegated power, and that the people whenever power was used to oppress them, had a right to resume it and place it in other hands. 
rising above the provincial and the theological, the narrow and the transient, the patriot urged that these were the principles of Aristotle and Plato, of Livy and Cicero, of Sidney, Harrington, and Locke, the principles of nature and eternal reason. As the actors in these scenes mused on the development of these principles, they reproduced as applicable an old prophecy of the future glory of America. But if I fail not in my augury, and who can better judge events than I, long rolling years shall late bring on the times when with your gold debauched and ripened crimes, Europe, the world's most noble part, shall fall upon her banished gods and virtue call. In vain, while foreign and domestic war, at once shall her distracted bosom tear. Forlorn and to be pitied even by you, meanwhile your rising glory you shall view. Wit, learning, virtue, discipline of war, shall for protection to your world repair. And fix a long illustrious empire there. Your native gold, I would not have it so, but fear the event, in time it will follow too. Late destiny shall high exalt your reign, whose pomp no crowds of slaves a needless train, nor gold the rabble's idol shall support, like Montezum's or Guanapache's court. But such true grandeur as old Rome maintained, where fortune was a slave and virtue reigned. The Patriots now designed to commemorate the Boston Massacre. This was usually done in the town meeting, but it was one of the objects of the Regulating Act to suppress meetings for such a purpose. The main theme of the discourse on the occasion was the danger, to a free people, of standing armies in time of peace, but this theme would have to be treated in the presence of the British Army. Then the Tory party of the town was numerous and exultant. We have, Samuel Adams wrote on the 4th, almost all the Tories of note in the province in this town to which they have fled for the general's protection. They affect the style of Rabshake, but the language of the people is, in the name of the Lord we will tread down our enemies. It was given out that it would be at the price of the life to any man to speak of the massacre, and that the military were determined that reflection on the king or the royal family should not be allowed to pass with impunity. The duty which, when parties were irritated and exasperated to the verge of civil war, most men would not at least seek, it was characteristic of Warren's heroic nature to covet. At his own suggestion, he was appointed the orator. He sought the duty in no selfish spirit, but to enable him, as the organ of the community, to bear open testimony that the Americans would make the last appeal rather than submit to the yoke that was prepared for their necks, that their unexampled patience had no alloy of cowardice. The popular leaders, in so critical a conjecture, were naturally desirous to be sure of their man. Tomorrow, Samuel Adams wrote, an oration is to be delivered by Dr. Warren. It was thought best to have an experienced officer in the political field on this occasion, as we may possibly be attacked in our trenches. The Patriots looked forward to the day with deep interest and not without apprehension. The anniversary coming on Sunday, the commemoration took place on Monday. It is said that many people came into the town from the country to take part in it, and there was a prodigious concourse. This indicates that the streets were thronged as they are on a modern 4th of July. In the morning, the citizens, legally warned by an adjournment of the Port Bill meeting, assembled in Faneuil Hall with Samuel Adams for the moderator and transacted the usual business relative to the selection of the orator. It was reported that the committee of the Old South Meeting House were willing it should be used on the occasion, and the town adjourned to meet at half past eleven o'clock in the church. The Old South was crowded. In the pulpit, which was draped in black, were the popular leaders who, from year to year, had been selected by the people to be the exponents of their cause. Those named as being present, besides Samuel Adams and William Cooper, the town clerk, were Church, Hancock, and the selectmen. 
The moderator, observing several British officers standing in the aisles, requested the occupants of the front pews to vacate them and courteously invited the strangers to occupy these seats. When about 40 officers dressed in their uniforms filled these pews or sat upon the pulpit stairs. The audience consisted mainly of the actors in the public meetings of preceding years. The men who had opposed the Revenue Acts, had protested against military rule, had summoned the Convention of 1768, had demanded the removal of troops, had organized committees of correspondence, had destroyed the tea, and had resisted the Regulating Act. They now felt that they were parts of an organization known as the Grand American Union. As yet, this party did not desire independence, but one of their number, probably Warren, said on this morning in the press that if the ministry would not hearken to the wise and just proposals of the Continental Congress, it could be demonstrated by a million of reasons that the people must look forward to the last grand step for defense, that the Americans would be compelled by the great law of nature to strike a decisive blow and, following the example of the once oppressed United Provinces, publish a manifesto to the world showing the necessity of dissolving their connection with a nation whose ministers were aiming at their ruin. Warren's personal friends were determined to protect him from insult. The audience manifested some impatience at a little delay in the appearance of the orator. He was prepared to meet violence and rode in a chase to the building opposite the Old South, there put on a robe and, to avoid pressing through the crowd, went to the rear of the building and, by a ladder, entered it through the window back of the pulpit. Classic and loving pens have drawn the traits of this type of American manhood. Amiable, accomplished, prudent, energetic, eloquent, brave, he united the graces of a manly beauty to a lion's heart, a sound mind, a safe judgment, and a firmness of purpose which nothing could shake. He possessed a clear understanding, a strong mind, a disposition humane and generous, with manners easy, affable, and engaging, but zealous, active, and sanguine in the cause of his oppressed country. He was a powerful orator because he was a true man and struggled for man's highest rights, a patriot in whom the flush of youth and the grace and dignity of manhood were combined, stood armed in the sanctuary of God to animate and encourage the sons of liberty and to hurl defiance at their oppressors. The tender words of eulogy uttered on the next commemoration of this day, after his spirit had passed from earth, and as his loved idea and numberless virtues were recalled, indicate the sympathy that existed between the speaker and the audience. We mourn thine exit, illustrious shade, with undissembled grief. We venerate thine exalted character. We will erect a monument to thy memory in each of our grateful hearts, and to the latest ages will teach our tender infants to lisp the name of Warren with veneration and applause. The silence was oppressive as the orator advanced to the pulpit and began in a firm tone of voice. My ever-honored fellow citizens, it is not without the most humiliating conviction of my want of ability that I now appear before you, but the sense I have of the obligation I am under to obey the calls of my country at all times, together with an animated recollection of your indulgence exhibited upon so many occasions, has induced me once more, undeserving as I am, to throw myself upon that candor which looks with kindness on the feeblest efforts of an honest mind." After an exordium imbued with the sterling virtue of sincerity, the order proceeded to the conclusion with great energy and pathos, receiving the warm applause of friends and occasional tokens of dissent from portions of his audience. The orator at the beginning stated the following proposition, that personal freedom is the natural right of every man, and that property, or an exclusive right to dispose of what he has honestly acquired by his own labor, necessarily arises therefrom, are truths which common sense has placed beyond the reach of contradiction, and no man or body of men can, without being guilty of flagrant injustice, claim a right to dispose of the persons or acquisitions of any other man or body of men, unless it can be proved that such a right had arisen from some compact 
between the parties in which it has been explicitly and freely granted. The orator, in a retrospective survey of the settlement of the country by the illustrious emigrants, delineated their labors and perils in these western regions in rescuing them from their rudest state and defending them from the savage, regarding man in this state and even anarchy itself as infinitely less dangerous than arbitrary power. Then this widely extended continent was let alone and grew. Britain saw her commerce extend and her wealth increase. The colonists found himself free and thought himself secure. Both countries flourishing, happy, and united in affection, thought not of distinct or separate interests. The colonists gloried in the British fame. He dwelt under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and had none to make him afraid. He knew, indeed, that by purchasing the manufactures of Great Britain, he contributed to its greatness. He knew that all the wealth that his labor produced centered in Great Britain, but that far from exciting his envy filled him with the highest pleasure. That thought supported him in all his toils. When the business of the day was past, he solaced himself with the contemplation, or perhaps entertained his listening family with the recital, of some great, some glorious transaction, which shines conspicuous in the history of Britain, or perhaps his elevated fancy led him to foretell, with a kind of enthusiastic confidence, the glory, power, and duration of an empire which should extend from one end of the earth to the other. He saw, or thought he saw, the British nation risen to a pitch of grandeur which cast a veil over the Roman glory, and ravished with the preview, boasted a race of British kings whose name should echo through those realms where Cyrus, Alexander, and the Caesars were unknown, princes for whom millions of grateful subjects, redeemed from slavery and pagan ignorance, should, with thankful tongues, offer up their prayers and praises to that transcendently great and beneficent being by whom kings reign and princes decree justice. The order then traced the rise and progress of the aggressions on the natural right of the colonists to enjoy personal freedom and representative government until this wicked policy had shaken the empire to its center. Yet it was still persisted in, regardless of the voice of reason, deaf to the prayers and supplications and unaffected by the flowing tears of suffering millions, and, as a consequence, the hearts of Britons and Americans, which had lately felt the generous glow of mutual confidence and love, now burn with jealousy and rage. The Briton looked on the American with an envious eye, and the American beheld the Briton as the ruffian, ready first to take his property, and next, what is dearer to every virtuous man, the liberty of his country. The order then passed to the scenes arising out of the resolution of the British administration to sustain this aggressive policy by force, which reason scorned to countenance, and placemen were unable to execute. He dwelt on the features of that night of unequaled horror when the troops fired on the people, the sad remembrance of which took full possession of his soul. One of the victims was so mangled by the bayonet that his brains fell upon the pavement, and to this the orator referred when he said, Come, widowed mourner, here satiate thy grief. Behold thy murdered husband gasping on the ground, and to contemplate the pompous show of wretchedness, bring in each hand thy infant children to bewail their father's fate. Take heed, ye orphan babes, lest while your streaming eyes are fixed upon the ghastly corpse, your feet slide on the stones bespattered with your father's brains. Enough. This tragedy need not be heightened by an infant weltering in the blood of him that gave it birth. Nature, reluctant, shrinks away already from the view, and the chilled blood rolls slowly backward to its fountain. We wildly stare about, and with amazement ask, Who spread this ruin round us? What wretch has dared to face the image of his god? Has haughty France or cruel Spain sent forth her myrmidons? Has the grim savage rushed again from the far distant wilderness? Or does some fiend, fierce from the depth of hell, with all the rancorous malice which the apostate damned can feel, twang her destructive bow and hurl her deadly arrows at our breast? No, none of these. 
But how astonishing, it is the hand of Britain that inflicts the wound. The arms of George, our rightful king, have been employed to shed that blood which freely would have flown at his command when justice or the honor of his crown had called his subjects to the field. The cry that arose for revenge was referred to, and the departure of the troops as the close of this drama. The orator then spoke of the existing exigency when a gracious prince had been persuaded to erect the hostile banner against a people ever affectionate and loyal to him and his illustrious predecessors of the House of Hanover, and to enforce obedience to acts of parliament destructive to liberty. Though armed men again filled the streets, the people were not intimidated, but resolved that liberty must be preserved. It was a Roman maxim, never to despair of the commonwealth. It may prove salutary now. Short-sighted mortals see not the numerous links of small and great events which form the chain on which the fate of kings and nations is suspended. Ease has often made a people effeminate. Hardship and danger have called forth virtues that commanded the applause of an admiring world. Our country loudly calls you to be circumspect, vigilant, active, and brave. Perhaps, all gracious heaven avert it, perhaps the power of Britain, a nation great in war, by some malignant influence may be employed to enslave you. But let not even this discourage you. Her arms, tis true, have filled the world with terror. Her troops have reaped the laurels of the field. Her fleets have rode triumphant on the sea. And when or where did you, my countrymen, depart inglorious from the field of fight? You, too, can show the trophies of your forefathers' victories and your own, can name the fortresses and battles you have won, and many of you count the honorable scars of wounds received whilst fighting for your king and country. Where justice is the standard, heaven is the warrior's shield, but conscious guilt unnerves the arm that lifts the sword against the innocent. The orator, in conclusion, said that the attempt of Parliament to raise a revenue from America, and the denial of the right to do it, had excited an almost universal inquiry into the rights of mankind in general, and created such a liberality of sentiment and jealousy of power as would, better than an adamantine wall, secure the people against the approach of despotism. The Boston Port Act had created those sympathetic ties that must forever endear the people to each other and form those indissoluble bonds of friendship and affection on which the preservation of our rights so evidently depend. The mutilation of the Charter has made every other colony jealous for its own, for this, if once submitted to by us, would set afloat the property and government of every British settlement on the continent. The following are the closing paragraphs. Our country is in danger, but not to be despaired of. Our enemies are numerous and powerful, but we have many friends, determined to be free, and heaven and earth will aid the resolution. On you depend the fortunes of America. You are to decide the important question on which rests the happiness and liberty of millions yet unborn. Act worthy of yourselves. The faltering tongue of hoary age calls on you to support your country. The lisping infant raises its suppliant hands, imploring defense against the monster, slavery. Your fathers look from their celestial seats with smiling approbation on their sons, who boldly stand forth in the cause of virtue, but sternly frown upon the inhuman miscreant, who, to secure the loaves and fishes to himself, would breed a serpent to destroy his children. Pardon me, my fellow citizens, I know you want not zeal or fortitude. You will maintain your rights or perish in the generous struggle. However difficult the combat, you will never decline it when freedom is the prize. An independence on Great Britain is not our aim. No, our wish is that Britain and the colonies may, like the oak and ivy, grow and increase in strength together. But, 
Whilst the infatuated plan of making one part of the empire slaves to the other is persisted in, the interest and safety of Britain as well as the colonies require that the wise measures recommended by the Honorable, the Continental Congress, be steadily pursued, whereby the unnatural contest between a parent honored and a child beloved may probably be brought to such an issue as that the peace and happiness of both may be established upon a lasting basis. But if these specific measures are ineffectual, and it appears that the only way to safety is through the fields of blood, I know you will not turn your faces from our foes, but will undauntedly press forward until tyranny is trodden underfoot and you have fixed your adored goddess Liberty fast by a Brunswick's side on the American throne. You then, who nobly have espoused your country's cause, who generously have sacrificed wealth and ease, who have despised the pomp and show of tinsel greatness, refused the summons to the festive board, been deaf to the alluring calls of luxury and mirth, who have forsaken the downy pillow to keep your vigils by the midnight lamp for the salvation of your invaded country, that you may break the foulish snare and disappoint the vulture of his prey, you then will reach this harvest of renown which you so justly have deserved. Your country shall pay her grateful tribute of applause. Even the children of your most inveterate enemies, ashamed to tell from whom they sprang, while they in secret curse their stupid, cruel parents, shall join the general voice of gratitude to those who broke the fetters which their fathers forged. Having redeemed your country and secured the blessing to future generations, who, fired by your example, shall emulate your virtues and learn from you the heavenly art of making millions happy, with heartfelt joy, with transports all your own, you cry, the glorious work is done, then drop the mantle to some young Alicia and take your seats with the kindred spirits in your native skies. The speeches in which prominent actors in Grecian and Roman story develop their policy or promote their objects, not words actually spoken, but what the relator thought were fitting to have been spoken, are regarded as valuable delineations of the temper of those times. But here are the words of an earnest and representative man uttered on the eve of a great war and in the presence of the military power whom he was soon to meet in the field. For the sake of the cause, he dared to speak what some scarce dared to think. His speech, imbued with the spirit of high chivalry and faith, resounds with the clash of arms. Though it is said that some of the officers groaned as the enthusiastic audience applauded, yet they were generally quiet to the close of the oration. One of them, seated on the pulpit stairs in the course of the delivery, held up one of his hands with several pistol bullets on the open palm when the orator, observing the action, gracefully dropped a white handkerchief on them. After the delivery, when it was moved that the thanks of the town be presented to the orator for the oration on the commemoration of the horrid massacre, some of the officers struck their canes on the floor, others hissed, others exclaimed, Oh, fie, fie, which was understood as a cry of fire, and there was a scene of panic. The patriots were prepared for any exigency. The North Enders, who idolized Warren, did not mean to be trifled with. The assembly, Samuel Adams says, was irritated to the greatest degree, and confusion ensued. They, the officers, however, did not gain their end, which was apparently to break up the meeting, for order was soon restored, and we proceeded regularly and finished the business. I am persuaded that, were it not for the danger of precipitating a crisis, not a man of them would have been spared. It was provoking enough to the whole corps that, while there were so many troops stationed here with the design of suppressing town meetings, that there should yet be one for the purpose of delivering an oration to commemorate a massacre perpetrated by soldiers and to show the danger of standing armies. The scene was sublime, Samuel L. Knapp says. There was, in this appeal to Britain, in this description of suffering, dying, and horror, a calm and high-souled defiance which must have chilled the blood of every sensible foe. Such another hour has seldom happened in the history of man, and is not surpassed in the records of nations. 
the thunders of Demosthenes rolled at a distance from Philip and his host, and Tully poured the fiercest torrent of invective when Catiline was at a distance, and his dagger no longer to be feared. But Warren's speech was made to proud oppressors resting on their arms, whose errand it was to overawe, and whose business it was to fight. If the deed of Brutus deserved to be commemorated by history, poetry, painting, and sculpture, should not this instance of patriotism and bravery be held in lasting remembrance? If he, that struck the foremost man of all this world, was hailed as the first of freemen, what honors are not due to him, who, undismayed, bearded the British lion, to show the world what his country dared to do in the cause of liberty? If the statue of Brutus was placed among those of the gods who were the preservers of Roman freedom, should not that of Warren fill a lofty niche in the temple reared to perpetuate the remembrance of our birth as a nation? End of chapter 13「Chapter fourteen of Life and Times of Joseph Warren by Richard Frothingham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the nineteenth of April, the Committee of Safety, Warren's Letters, the Second Provincial Congress, Military Preparations, Warren's Vigilance, Colonel Smith's Expedition, Warren Leaves Boston, his service on the 19th of April, 1775, the 5th of March to the 19th of April. Warren, on the day after the delivery of his oration, March 7th, met with the Committee of Safety in Cambridge, where the deliberations were uncommonly important, Cushing and Adams being named, for the first time, as having been present. The proceedings related to the proposed army. They were of a similar character at the next meeting of the committee, on the 14th, when a watch was arranged to be kept in Charlestown, Cambridge, and Roxbury, in order that the committees of these towns might be ready to send couriers forward to the towns where the magazines were placed when sallies were made from the army by night. According to Paul Revere, about 30 persons, chiefly mechanics, had agreed to watch the movements of British soldiers and the Tories. These patriots met at the Green Dragon Tavern in Union Street. We were so careful, he says, that our meetings should be kept secret, that every time we met, every person swore upon the Bible that they would not discover any of our transactions but to Mr. Hancock, Adams, Dr. Warren, Church, and one or two more. They took turns to watch the soldiers, two by two, by patrolling the streets all night. It was now a common remark that there was a traitor in the Provincial Congress. At this time, the Ministry were assuring George III that the union of the colonies could not last, and he said, on the day on which Warren delivered his oration, I am convinced the line adopted in American affairs will be crowned with success. At this time, Warren, as the organ of the Committee of Donations, expressed the faith with which the Patriots clung to unity as the anchor of their safety, and the interest with which they looked to the decision of Canada. Joseph Warren to the Committee of Montreal, Boston, March 15, 1775. Mr. James Price and Alexander Hay at Montreal. Gentlemen, so handsome a donation as 100 pounds, 4 shillings, accompanied by such an animated letter from our brethren at Montreal, cannot fail to excite the warmest gratitude in the breast of everyone who wishes prosperity and freedom in his country. The committee to whom your letter comes directed beg leave, as well on their account as in the name and behalf of every virtuous man in the town, more especially of the many thousands who are actually feeling the miseries occasioned by the Boston Port Bill, to offer you their most unfeigned thanks for this convincing proof of your sympathy for the distresses of your fellow countrymen and for your firm, disinterested attachment to the rights of your country. It affords singular pleasure to every friend of virtue to find such enlarged and generous sentiments as dictated your letter discovering themselves in places where the utmost diligence and most wicked devices have been made use of to distinguish them. 
The religion lately established in Canada is but too well calculated to banish every idea of freedom and to familiarize the mind to slavery. But your letter is an agreeable instance how tenacious men are of their rights when they clearly understand them. We wish most heartily that sentiments like yours may be diffused throughout your widely extended province to the utter extinction of every imposition, whether civil or religious. Your numbers are great, and it is of course important to us whether you are engaged for or against us. The decision of the present controversy between Britain and the colonies will give happiness or misery to America for years, perhaps for centuries. Unanimity and firmness form the only anchor on which we depend, and we have the strongest assurances that can be given that the whole continent see with the same eyes and are actuated by one soul. To war with brethren must be shocking to every brave, every humane mind, but if brethren and fellow subjects will suffer themselves to be instruments in the hands of tyrants to stab our constitution, every tender idea must be forgot, and they must be repelled with that heroic spirit which open enemies have experienced. Our advocates are many, both in Europe and America, but the importance of our prosperity makes it a duty to solicit with earnestness for all the assistance and all the strength which the continent can give. The inhabitants of Montreal have done worthily. May heaven reward them, and while life lasts, the memory of their kindness will never be effaced from the bosoms of the Committee of Donations. Joseph Warren, per order. The temper of the public mind was never firmer than it was in the month of March. The donations for the relief of the poor continued to flow into Boston as for a common cause. The letters accompanying them were of the most resolute character, and the evidences multiplied that the colonies would be one and indivisible. The tenor of the reports from the mother country was thoroughly warlike. It was said in letters from England, printed in the newspapers, that the ministry were determined to persevere in the great system of American taxation, and their reliance was on force. It was the advice in these letters to the Americans, prepare for the worst and persevere in the plan adopted by Congress. For heaven's sake, for your own sake, and that of posterity, do not relax your vigilance. There was the natural sequence of general and vigorous preparation for the last resort. It was said in the press, in contending for liberty, the Constitution should be held in one hand and the sword in the other. Our union under providence is the rock of our salvation. Such was the lofty spirit in the bosom of the American Republic in the beginning of its grand historic life. On the 22nd of March, the Provincial Congress renewed its session. It immediately ordered a resolve to be printed, which stated the necessity of putting the colony in a complete state of defense, and urged that any relaxation would be attended with the utmost danger to the liberties of this colony and to all America. And for several days, this body was occupied with a consideration of the rules and regulations for a constitutional army. Still, there was no desire for war, but the door was kept open for reconciliation. On the 1st of April, Congress voted that if writs should be issued in the form as the law directs for calling a general assembly to be held in May, the towns ought to obey the precepts, instructing the members elect to transact no business with the council appointed by mandamus. Thus was evinced the resolution in matters of civil government to adhere to the advice of the Continental Congress. But provision was made for the election of a third provincial congress in case such writs were not issued by Governor Gage. On the 2nd of April, a fresh arrival brought the decisive intelligence that Parliament had pledged life and fortune to the King for the subjection of America, that New England was prohibited from the fisheries, and that reinforcements were on the way to General Gage. On the next day, Warren was placed on a committee to require a full representation from the towns when the following proclamation appeared in the Salem Gazette. In Provincial Congress, Concord, April 8, 1775. Whereas several members of this Congress are now absent by leave of the Congress, and as the important intelligence received by the last vessels from Great Britain renders it necessary that every member attend his duty, resolved, 
that the absent members be directed forthwith to attend in this place, so that the wisdom of the province may be collected. By order of the Provincial Congress, John Hancock, President. The soldiers now became more irritating than ever, and even the officers behaved more like a parcel of children than like men. One of the most conspicuous of the officers who disturbed the meeting at the Old South was a captain of the Royal Irish, who fared rather hard, for among those who beset him was a woman who threatened to wring his nose. Two days after occurred the well-known case of tarring and feathering a citizen of Bill Ricca by Colonel Nesbitt and party. On the 16th, the day Warren's oration was published, the officers made themselves merry in delivering a mock oration, of which a letter gives the following account. A vast number of officers assembled in King Street. When they proceeded to the choice of seven out of their number to represent the selectmen, the latter of whom, with the moderator, went into the coffee house balcony, where was provided a fellow apparelled in a black gown with a rusty gray wig and foxtail hanging to it, together with bands on, who delivered an oration from the balcony to a crowd of a few else besides gaping officers. It contained the most mischievous abuse upon the characters of principal patriots here, wholly made up of the most vile, profane, blackguard language as ever was expressed. This scurrilous speech was printed. There were acts of far more importance occurring every day in the personal collisions occasioned by the seizures of all kinds of military articles that the Patriots endeavored to carry out of the town. Occasionally large detachments of the army were marched into the country. On the 30th of March, the ever-vigilant Committee of Correspondence summoned the Little Senate, the committees of the neighboring towns, to meet in their chamber in Faneuil Hall at 10 o'clock a.m. on the next day, to determine on measures of safety, saying in the summons, The wisdom of the joint committees has been very conspicuous. The fullest exertion of the same wisdom is necessary at this excited time. While engaged in this varied service, Warren wrote the following letter which contains one of those salient sentences which has been much quoted to show the spirit of the time. Bancroft places the words italicized in his text, the march of Earl Percy, referred to in the letter, occasioned the meeting of the Committee of Correspondence. Boston, April 8, 1775. Dear Sir, Your favor of the 21st of December came opportunely to hand, as it enabled me to give the Provincial Congress, now sitting at Concord, a just view of the measures pursued by the tools of the administration and effectually to guard them against that state of security into which many have endeavored to lull them. If we ever obtain a redress of grievances from Great Britain, it must be by the influence of these illustrious personages whose virtue now keeps them out of power. The king never will bring them into power until the ignorance and frenzy of the present administration make the throne on which he sits shake under him. If America is an humble instrument of the salvation of Britain, it will give us the sincerest joy. But if Britain must lose her liberty, she must lose it alone. America must and will be free. The contest may be severe. The end will be glorious. We would not boast, but we think, united and prepared as we are, we have no reason to doubt of success, if we should be compelled to the last appeal. But we mean not to make that appeal until we can be justified in doing it in the sight of God and man. Happy shall we be if the mother country will allow us the free enjoyment of our rights and indulge us in the pleasing employment of aggrandizing her. The members for the Continental Congress are almost all chosen by the several colonies. Indeed, if any colony should neglect to choose members, it would be ruinous to it, as all intercourse would immediately cease between that colony and the whole continent. The first brigade of the army marched about four miles out of town three days ago under the command of a brigadier general, Earl Percy, but, as they marched without baggage or artillery, they did not occasion so great an alarm as they otherwise would. Nevertheless, great numbers, completely armed, collected in the neighboring towns, and it is the opinion of many that, had they marched eight or ten miles and attempted to destroy any magazines or abuse the people, not a man of them would have returned to Boston." 
the Congress immediately took proper measures for restraining any unnecessary effusion of blood, and also passed proper resolves respecting the army if they should attempt to come out of town with baggage and artillery. I beg leave to recommend to your notice, Mr. Dana, the bearer hereof, a gentleman of the law, a man of sense and probity, a true friend to his country, of a respectable family and fortune. May heaven bless you and reward your labors with success. I am, sir, with great respect, your most obedient humble servant, Joseph Warren. To Arthur Lee, Esquire, London. At this time, Francis Dana, a lawyer and a patriot, sailed for London and carried letters addressed to Franklin, describing the colony, since the resignation of the mandamus counselors, to have been as quiet and peaceable as any colony on the continent, but in a state of most anxious suspense, preparing for the worst. Much art and pains, Dr. Cooper wrote, have been employed to dismay us or provoke us to some rash action, but hitherto the people have behaved with astonishing calmness and resolution. The union and firmness of this and the other colonies have rather grown than diminished, and they seem prepared for all events. Warren sent by Mr. Dana a copy of his oration to Franklin with the following letter. Joseph Warren to Benjamin Franklin. Boston, April 8, 1775. Sir, although I have not the pleasure either of a personal or epistolary acquaintance with you, I have taken the liberty of sending you by Mr. Dana a pamphlet which I wish was more deserving of your notice. The ability and firmness with which you have defended the rights of mankind and the liberties of this country in particular have rendered you dear to all America. May you soon see your enemies deprived of the power injuring you and your friends in a situation to discover the grateful sense they have of your exertions in the cause of freedom. I am, sir, with the greatest esteem and respect, your most obedient, humble servant, Joseph Warren. Dr. Franklin. The Provincial Congress remained twelve days in session after the peremptory summons of the absent members, and Warren, a part of the time at least, attended the meetings. On the 7th, he was placed on the Committee on the State of the Province. On the recommendation of this committee, a resolve was passed, providing for delegations to repair forthwith to Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire, asking their cooperation and quotas in raising an army for the effectual security of New England and the continent. The same committee prepared for their delegates, instructions which dealt on the importance of cementing and continuing that union which had so happily taken place on this continent. Congress sent a circular to the committees of the towns round Boston, earnestly recommending that the militia and Minutemen be put in the best posture for defense, but said that the plans laid for the general good obliged them to request that, whatever patience and forbearance it might require for the present, the committee should act on the defensive only until the further discretion of the Congress. They could not advise any measures that the enemies of the cause might plausibly interpret as a commencement of hostilities. Having fixed on the 11th of May for a day of fasting and prayer, and provided for reassembling on any pressing exigency, Congress on the 15th of April adjourned. It was said in the British papers that by the 10th of April an army of 13,000 would rendezvous in Boston and that three major generals were to be sent over to command it. This report was copied into the Boston journals. According to a statement drawn up by Colonel William Heath and dated the 20th of March, there were at this time about 2,850 troops at Boston who were distributed in the following localities. 80 in King Street, 340 on the Neck, 400 at Fort Hill, 1,700 on the Common, and 330 at Castle William. The fortifications on the Neck are said to have been skillfully designed and thoroughly executed. Reinforcements from England and other places were expected soon. There was the feeling among the officers that the mere presence of the king's troops in the field would produce submission to the regulating act and that there would be no fighting. In connection with this feeling was the allegation of cowardice. Warren met this charge in the following clear and temperately worded note, printed in his oration. It is written in the repose of a heroic spirit who was deeply moved at the insults that were heaped on his countrymen. 
The patience with which this people have borne the injuries which have been heaped upon them, and their unwillingness to take any sanguinary measures, has, very injudiciously, been ascribed to cowardice by persons both here and in Great Britain. I most heartily wish that an opinion so erroneous in itself and so fatal in its consequences might be utterly removed before it is too late, and I think nothing further necessary to convince every intelligent man that the conduct of this people is owing to the tender regard which they have for their fellow men and an utter abhorrence to the shedding of human blood than a little attention to their general temper and disposition, discovered when they cannot be supposed to be under any apprehension of danger to themselves. I will only mention the universal detestation which they show to every act of cruelty, by whom and upon whomsoever committed, the mild spirit of their laws, the very few crimes to which capital penalties are annexed, and the very great backwardness which both courts and juries discover in condemning persons charged with capital crimes. But, if any should think this observation not to the purpose, I readily appeal to those gentlemen in the army who have been in the camp or in the field with the Americans. It was now expected that General Gage would order arrests of the popular leaders. It was said that Parliament would pass bills of attainder against the Bostonians, and the aspect of affairs became so serious that a number of families moved into the country and carried with them their valuable effects. Samuel Adams and John Hancock were persuaded to retire to the residence of Rev. Jonas Clark, a patriotic clergyman in Lexington. It is one of the doubtful stories of the time that the officers formed a scheme to seize Adams, Hancock, and Warren, which an accident frustrated. Warren's friends felt apprehensions for his safety. As one of his students, Dr. Eustace, returned home one evening, he passed a party of officers who appeared to be on the watch, and he advised Warren not to visit his patients that evening. But Warren, putting his pistols in his pocket, replied, I have a visit to make to Mrs. in Cornhill this evening, and I will go at once. Come with me. It was about this time when he was moved by the taunts which the officers were uttering that he said to Eustace, These fellows say we won't fight. By heavens, I hope I shall die up to my knees in blood. One day he was passing the place at the neck where the gallows stood and met three officers, one of whom insultingly said, Go on, Warren. You will soon come to the gallows. Warren turned, walked up to the officers, and calmly asked who it was that uttered those words, but received no reply. Warren did not attend the meetings of the Committee of Safety in April. They held their sessions at Concord. The absence, doubtless, was for weighty reasons. He had resolved to abandon his profession and enter the army, and, as the crisis approached, he devoted some time each day to a regular practice of the manual exercise. His letters show that he watched narrowly the motions of the army. As he knew their numbers, knew also the preparations for self-defense that had been matured by the patriots, he was confident that, in the case offensive operations were attempted, the militia would appear in the field in sufficient numbers to defeat them. The organization of a watch and of couriers to alarm the country by the Committee of Safety have been already stated. General Gage sent two officers, disguised as farmers, into the interior to ascertain the places where the provincials had gathered stores, sites for encampments, and the state of the country. They, though narrowly watched by the patriots, succeeded in their object and, Besides an interesting narrative showing the spirit of the people, they presented to General Gage a rudely sketched map of the roads as far as Concord and Worcester. It was now, April 4th, said in the journals that a considerable number of army wagons were ready for use, that blacksmiths were employed in making crow's feet, and the army seemed to be preparing for a march. A week later, it was suggested that Worcester would be the point to which the army would march with the view to protect the courts under the Regulating Act. A New York letter, in remarking on the probability that the troops would take the field, said to the Massachusetts patriots, For heaven's sake, be watchful and firm, as all, under God, depends on your conduct at this time. The policy of disarming the people had been acted on, though it had not been followed up very energetically. The indications now were that this policy would be carried out in earnest. 
On Friday, the 14th of April, the Somerset frigate was moored in Charles River between Boston and Charlestown, and on the next day, the grenadiers and light infantry were taken off duty on the pretext of learning a new exercise, and the transports were hauled near the sterns of the men of war. These movements appeared so suspicious that, on the following day, Sunday, Warren sent Paul Revere to Lexington with intelligence of these changes for the guidance of Hancock and Adams. On the next day, preparations were made for a removal of the portion of the stores at Concord. Little to attract the special attention of the vigilant patriots occurred on Monday, though they were expecting something serious to be transacted. It happened that, on the day, 15th, on which the movements in Boston attracted attention, Lord Dartmouth wrote to General Gage that all the cannon, small arms, and military stores that might be either in any magazine or secreted by the Patriots ought to be seized, and all who, in the opinion of His Majesty's Attorney and Solicitor General, had committed acts of treason ought to be arrested. On Tuesday evening, the 18th, it was observed that troops were marching towards the bottom of the common, and a vigilant patriot informed Warren of the fact, who immediately sent William Dawes by way of Roxbury to Lexington to inform Hancock and Adams. About 10 o'clock, Warren sent an earnest message for Paul Revere, who went to the patriot's house. Revere says, Warren begged that I would immediately set off for Lexington to Messrs. Hancock and Adams and acquaint them of the movement, and that it was thought that they were the objects. At half past ten o'clock that night, Lieutenant Colonel Smith, with about eight hundred grenadiers and light infantry, embarked in longboats at the foot of the commons and moved over Charles River in the direction of Phipps Farm or Leachmere's Point on a secret expedition to destroy the stores collected at Concord and it was reported to seize Hancock and Adams. General Gage, this evening, Stedman says, told Lord Percy that he intended to send a detachment to seize the stores at Concord and to give the command to Colonel Smith, who knew he was to go, but not where. He meant it to be a secret expedition and begged of Lord Percy to keep it a profound secret. As this nobleman was passing from the general's quarters home to his own, perceiving eight or ten men conversing together on the common, he made up to them when one of the men said, The British troops have marched, but will miss their aim. What aim? said Lord Percy. Why? the man replied. The cannon at Concord. Lord Percy immediately returned on his steps and acquainted General Gage, not without marks of surprise and disapprobation, with what he had just heard. The general said that his confidence had been betrayed, for that he had communicated his design to one person only besides his lordship. Gordon says, When the corps was nearly ready to proceed upon the expedition, Dr. Warren, by a mere accident, had notice of it just in time to send messengers over the neck and across the ferry on to Lexington before the orders for preventing every person's quitting the town were executed. The lights of the watchfires, the sounds of the bells, and the signal guns proclaimed the faithfulness with which Warren's messengers did their work. I need not follow Colonel Smith's progress into the country on this memorable night until, at half-past four on the morning of the 19th of April, his advance fired on the company of provincials who paraded at Lexington under Captain Parker, and then passed on to Concord, which the detachment reached about seven nor need I relate the remarkable rapidity with which the agencies which the Committee of Safety had organized did the work of alarming the militia, or the prompt response to the summons which occasioned the roads leading to Concord and Lexington to swarm with the Minutemen. It is only necessary to relate Warren's connection with the events of this extraordinary day. A special messenger, early in the morning, brought to Warren the intelligence of the events that occurred in the morning at Lexington. His soul beat to arms, Dr. Elliot says, as soon as he learned the intention of the British troops, and he now called in Mr. Eustace, his student, directed him to take care of his patients, mounted his horse, and departed for the scene of action. He rode to the Charlestown Ferry. The last person to whom he spoke as he entered the boat was the grandfather of the late John R. Aden of Boston, and Warren said, as they parted, Keep up a brave heart. They have begun it, 
That either party can do, and will end it. That only one can do. On the way through Charlestown, he met Dr. Welch, a resident, who says, Eight o'clock in the morning, saw Dr. Joseph Warren just come out of Boston, horseback. I said, Well, they are gone out. Yes, he said, and we will be up with them before night. Jacob Rogers, another resident of Charlestown, says, We were alarmed with various reports concerning the king's troops, which put everybody in confusion. About ten in the morning, I met Dr. Warren, riding hastily out of town, and asked him if the news was true of the men being killed at Lexington. He assured me it was. He rode on. Between nine and ten o'clock, Lord Percy began his march, by the way of Roxbury, to reinforce Colonel Smith. His column passed through Cambridge, and, according to Dr. Welch, who appears to have accompanied Warren a short time, they were near this force. Two soldiers, Dr. Welch says, going to Lexington, tried to steal Watson's horse at Watson's Corner, the old man with his cat and hat pulling one way and the soldiers the other. Dr. Warren rode up and helped drive them off, tried to pass Percy's column, stopped by bayonets. Two British officers rode up to Dr. Warren in the rear of the British, inquiring, Where are the troops? The doctor did not know. They were greatly alarmed, went home. And Dr. Welch, who returned to Charlestown, relates nothing further that transpired that day until the afternoon. A meeting of the Committee of Safety was notified to be held at Mr. Weatherby's At the Black Horse in Monotony or West Cambridge, and Watson's Corner was on the route to this place. There is no record of the proceedings of the committee on this day, but the fact is stated that the committee met. General Heath, a member who was present at this meeting, and on leaving it in the morning, went by a crossroad over to Watertown, and the British being in possession of the Lexington Road. Warren undoubtedly was present at this meeting of the committee, I am unable to locate him for several hours or until in the afternoon about the time Lord Percy's column rescued Colonel Smith's party from entire destruction, which was at two o'clock. The Provincial Congress had clothed the members of the Committee of Safety with the power, in case of offensive operations, to summon the militia into the field, and they, therefore, were the center of authority. Warren, in the relations of the day, is spoken of as the chairman of the committee in Boston. Hancock was the chairman of the whole committee, and Samuel Adams met twice with them. Now the Provincial Congress, anxious to conform to the recommendations of the Continental Congress, had cautioned the committees of the towns to exercise the utmost forbearance in the great matter of commencing hostilities, and this had been impressed on the towns by the Committee of Safety. This fact has a bearing on what took place at half-past four on the morning of this day at Lexington, and, again, at between 9 and 10 at Concord Bridge. It was considered of great consequence to be able to establish the fact that the British fired first, thus to make it clear to the tribunal of the world that they were the immediate aggressors and to save the colony of Massachusetts from the judgment of having acted inconsiderately. Nothing could have been easier than for the militia, who had assembled in large numbers in Concord after the firing at Concord Bridge, to have destroyed a British party of about a hundred men, who were at a great distance from the main body, but they were allowed to return over the bridge where the firing took place. From four o'clock in the morning, couriers were flying in every direction from Lexington, and it is not improbable that the military officers, before twelve o'clock, had the advice of the Committee of Safety. Adams and Hancock were on the ground and could have given immediate directions. They were persuaded to retire to what was then known as the second precinct of Woburn, now Burlington, about two miles from Reverend Jonas Clark's house. I am not able to say whether Adams and Warren met on this memorable day, but they surely were not far apart. It is a fine day, Adams remarked, as he was walking in the field after the day had dawned. Very pleasant, answered one of his companions, supposing him to be contemplating the beauties of the sky. I mean, he replied, this day is a glorious day for America. So fearless was he of consequences, Dr. Elliot says, so intrepid in the midst of danger, so eager to look forward to the luster of events that would succeed the gloom which then involved the minds of the people. Warren about the time Lord Percy met Colonel Smith, 
rejoined General Heath as the latter was taking a crossroad leading from Watertown to Lexington on his way to assume the command of the militia, and the two kept together during the afternoon. There had been no hesitation on the part of the Minutemen after the British troops, about twelve o'clock, set out on their return from Concord. Before they had left the town, the battle of the day began in earnest. An incessant, though irregular fire, a British officer writes of the British troops, which was kept up during the whole of their march back to Lexington, in which they were driven before the Americans like sheep. At that place, they were met by the detachment under Lord Percy, with two pieces of cannon. The two detachments rested on their arms and received some refreshment. Lord Percy now formed his detachment into a square in which he enclosed Colonel Smith's party, who were so much exhausted with fatigue that they were obliged to lie down for rest on the ground, their tongues hanging out of their mouths like those of dogs after a chase. Lord Percy had now about 1,800 troops under him. On renewing his retreat, he was closely pursued. As he went through West Cambridge, the firing was very sharp. In this battle, Heath says, I was several times greatly exposed, in particular at the high grounds, at the upper end of Monotomy, West Cambridge, and also on the plain below the meeting house. On the latter, Dr. Joseph Warren, afterwards Major General Warren, who kept constantly near me, and then but a few feet distant, a musket ball from the enemy came so near his head as to strike the pin out of the hair of his earlock. On this plane, Dr. Eliphalet Downer, in single combat with a British soldier, killed him on the spot by thrusting him nearly through the body with his bayonet. Authorities agree in stating that the firing was severe on that portion of West Cambridge known as the Plain. The reference to Warren's service here in Boyle's Eulogy, printed in 1781, shows the impression which his bearing made on his countrymen. Again the conflict glows with rage severe, and fearless ranks in combat mixed appear. Victory uncertain, fierce contention reigns, and purple rivers drench the slippery plains. Column to column, host to host oppose, and rush impetuous on their adverse foes. When lo, the hero Warren from afar, sought for the battle and the field of war. From rank to rank the daring warrior flies, and bids the thunder of the battle rise. Sudden arrangements of his troops are made, and sudden movements round the plain displayed. Columbia's genius in her polished shield gleams bright and dreadful o'er the hostile field. Her ardent troops, enraptured with the sight, with shock resistless force the dubious fight. Britons, astonished, tremble at the sight, and, all confused, precipitate their flight. The Minutemen continued to harass the retreating troops as they left the plain. After they entered the portion of Charlestown, which is now Somerville, and were moving from Prospect Hill along the road by the bay that makes up from Charles River, their position was again critical, for a force of several hundred militia from Essex County were on or near Winter Hill and threatened to cut them off. The militia, Heath says, continued to hang on the rear of the British until they reached Bunker Hill in Charlestown, and it had become so dusk as to render the flashes of the muskets very visible. Bunker Hill is the nearest hill to the mainland within the peninsula of Charlestown, and here the British commander formed a line and, covered by his ships, prepared to make a stand. General Heath was now on a plot of ground known as the Common, just outside of the peninsula and he says Warren kept near him. Here the order was given for the militia to discontinue the pursuit and return to Cambridge. General Heath now held the first council of war of the revolution at the foot of Prospect Hill. It is said of Warren by Elliot that he was perhaps the most active man in the field. By Knapp that the people were delighted with his cool, collected bravery and already considered him as a leader whose gallantry they were to admire and in whose talents they were to confide. By Morton, that he appeared in the field under the united characters of the general, the soldier, and the physician. Here he was seen animating his countrymen to battle and fighting by their side, and there he was found administering healing comforts to the wounded, 
and by Tudor that he would be regarded as the personal representative of those brave citizens who, with arms hastily collected, sprang from their peaceable homes to resist aggression and, on the plains of Lexington and heights of Charlestown, cemented with their blood the foundation of American liberty. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen, Part One of Life and Times of Joseph Warren by Richard Frothingham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sixty Days of Service, The Committee of Safety, The Provincial Congress, Organization of the Army, Letters of Warren, The Third Provincial Congress, Warren Elected President, Elected Major General. 1775, from the 19th of April to the 17th of June. Warren had reason to be proud of the bearing of his countrymen on the 19th of April. They made good every confident word which he had uttered on their bravery. The allegation of cowardice would no longer answer, even in England, as an explanation of the forbearance that had been so persistently exercised. All the organizations of the popular party, the local committees, the provincial and continental congresses, had urged the necessity of keeping purely on the defensive. It had been adhered to under the most trying circumstances, even up to the moment of the appearance of the British troops on Lexington Green, but after the fire of their musketry, forbearance was no longer a virtue. The question, who fired the first gun, was considered to be of great importance. The simple statement which flew through the land that a British brigade had fired on a provincial company seemed the vindication of the severe handling which the Minutemen gave to the regulars. It was like the sounding of a tocsin. No patriots made the plea that a portion of the party had madly rushed upon war, but the judgment was as spontaneous as it was righteous, that the firing was the crowning act of a series of aggressions on a loyal and unoffending people, and that the hour had come in which to redeem their pledges of union by moving to the support of their brethren. The army of citizen soldiers who hastened to the point of danger and shut up the British army in Boston was a magic demonstration of the life and power of American nationality. Warren was called upon for service when the great event of the day of Lexington and Concord, like the destruction of the tea, wrested affairs from the control of men and cast them upon the current of ideas. But I do not feel called upon to trace the effect of the event on the nationality of England, or only incidentally on that of America, but propose, as an act of justice to Warren's memory, to give an idea of his varied labors as he moved on towards the Mount of Sacrifice. There is no recording of the proceedings of the Committee of Safety on the 19th of April. They were in session the whole day of the 20th and the night, but only the circulars they issued are recorded. I copy the following letter, addressed to the towns, from the original in Warren's handwriting, which contains much interlineation. It seems to glow with the fire of battle. Gentlemen, the barbarous murders committed on our innocent brethren on Wednesday, the 19th instant, have made it absolutely necessary that we immediately raise an army to defend our wives and our children from the butchering hands of an inhuman soldiery, who incensed at the obstacles they met with in their bloody progress, and enraged at being repulsed from the field of slaughter, will, without the least doubt, take the first opportunity in their power to ravage this devoted country with fire and sword. We conjure you, therefore, by all that is dear, by all that is sacred, that you give all assistance possible in forming an army. Our all is at stake. Death and devastation are the instant consequences of delay. Every moment is infinitely precious. An hour lost may deluge your country in blood and entail perpetual slavery upon the few of your posterity who may survive the carnage. We beg and entreat, as you will answer to your country, to your own consciences, and, above all, as you will answer to God himself, that you will hasten and encourage by all possible means the enlistment of men to form the army and send them forward to headquarters at Cambridge with that expedition which the vast importance and instant urgency of the affair demands. On this day of keen anguish, 
Warren addressed the following letter to General Gage. Cambridge, April 20th, 1775. Sir, the unhappy situation into which this colony is thrown gives the greatest uneasiness to every man who regards the welfare of the empire or feels for the distresses of his fellow men, but even now much may be done to alleviate those misfortunes which cannot be entirely remedied. And I think it of the utmost importance to us that our conduct be such as that the contending parties may entirely rely upon the honor and integrity of each other for the punctual performance of any agreement that shall be made between them. Your Excellency, I believe, knows very well the part I have taken in public affairs. I have ever scorned disguise. I think I have done my duty. Some may think otherwise, but be assured, sir, as far as my influence goes, Everything which can be reasonably be required of us to do shall be done, and everything promised shall be religiously performed. I should now be very glad to know from you, sir, how many days you desire may be allowed for such as desire to remove to Boston with their effects, and what time you will allow the people in Boston for their removal. When I have received that information, I will repair to Congress and hasten, as far as I am able, the issuing a proclamation. I beg leave to suggest that the condition of admitting only 30 wagons at a time into the town appears to me to be very inconvenient and will prevent the good effects of a proclamation intended to be issued for encouraging all wagoners to assist in removing the effects from Boston with all possible speed. If your excellency will be pleased to take the matter into consideration and favor me, as soon as may be, with an answer, it will lay me under a great obligation, as it so nearly concerns the welfare of my friends in Boston. I have many things which I wish to say to your Excellency, and most sincerely wish I had broken through the formalities which I thought due your rank, and freely have told you all I knew or thought of public affairs, and I must ever confess, whatever may be the event, that you generously gave me such opening, as I now think I ought to have embraced. But the true cause of my not doing it was the knowledge I had of the vileness and treachery of many persons around you, who I supposed had gained your entire confidence. I am, etc., Joseph Warren, His Excellency General Gage. On the 21st, the Committee of Safety resolved to enlist out of the Massachusetts forces 8,000 effective men, adopted the forms of the enlisting papers to meet the emergency, and resolved to propose an establishment at an early day after the meeting of Congress. The labors of the Committee of Safety were uncommonly arduous. Dr. Elliott says, Nothing could be in a more confused state than the army, which first assembled at Cambridge. This undisciplined body of men were kept together by a few who deserved well of their country. Dr. Warren was perhaps the man who had the most influence and in whom the people in the environs of Boston and Cambridge placed their highest confidence. He did wonders in preserving order among the troops. On the 22nd, the Provincial Congress, which had been summoned on the 18th, assembled at Concord, when a letter addressed by Josiah Quincy, Jr. to Samuel Adams was presented, opened, read, and ordered to be sent to Warren, to be used at his discretion, when, in order to be nearer the army, the Congress adjourned to meet in the afternoon at Watertown. On reassembling here, the Congress, after notifying officially the Committee of Safety of its meeting, adjourned until the next day. On the 23rd, Sunday, Congress held an important session. Instead of the usual stillness of the Sabbath, there was now the hurry of war. The militia of the neighboring colonies were approaching the scene of action by hasty marches. Families in great distress were hurrying from the seaport towns into the country, while a large number of the Minutemen, so suddenly summoned to the field, were returning to their homes. On this day, Warren read in Congress a letter from a Connecticut committee of correspondence well calculated to nerve the desponding and to cheer on the brave. Every preparation, the letter said, is making to support your province. The ardor of our people is such that they cannot be kept back. The colonels are to forward a part of the best men and most ready as fast as possible, the remainder to be ready at a moment's warning. 
On this day, it was voted to raise an army of 13,600 men as the quota of Massachusetts in the army of 30,000, which it was resolved ought to be raised. In the afternoon, Hancock, the regular president, being absent, it was voted to choose a president pro tempore when a committee reported that the vote was full for Dr. Warren. Papers bearing his signature while acting in this capacity occur henceforward to the day of his death. He said today to Dr. Belknap, the town must be cleared and would be soon. On the 24th, the following commission, which has Warren's autograph, was given to Captain Ebenezer Winship and dated, In Committee of Safety, Sir, you are to enlist the company of rangers, whereof Jonathan Brewer is colonel. You are hereby empowered immediately to enlist the company to consist of 59 able-bodied and effective men, including sergeants, as soldiers in the Massachusetts service for the preservation of American liberty, and cause them to muster as soon as possible. Joseph Warren, Chairman. The signature is in his large handwriting. On the 25th, the following resolve was passed, which is in Warren's handwriting. In Committee of Safety, Resolve that, be ordered with the troops of horse under his command to proceed forward as an escort to the honorable members of the Continental Congress on their way to Philadelphia until they are met by an escort from the colony of Connecticut. Joseph Warren, Chairman. One of the delegates was Samuel Adams, and the friends parted for the last time. On the 26th, Warren's intimate friend, Hosiah Quincy Jr., died as he reached his native land. His biographer says, He repeatedly said to the seamen on whose attentions he was chiefly dependent that he had but one desire and prayer, which was that he might live long enough to have an interview with Samuel Adams or Joseph Warren, that, granted, he should die content. This wish of the patriot's heart, heaven, in its inscrutable wisdom, did not grant. On this day, Warren penned the following letter in relation to the New Hampshire forces, copied from the original in his handwriting. 1775, Cambridge, April 26th. Sir, our friends from New Hampshire have shown their readiness to assist us on this day of distress. Therefore thought it best to give orders for enlisting such as were present in the service of this colony, as many desired something might be done to hold them together until the resolve of your Congress is known. When we are ready and desirous, they should be discharged from us and put under such command as you shall direct. Colonel Sargent has been so kind as to afford his utmost assistance in conducting this matter. On the 27th, Warren addressed the following letter to Arthur Lee, which shows the views with which he was now acting as the head of the popular cause. Cambridge, April 27, 1775. My dear sir, our friend Quincy just lived to come on shore to die in his own country. He expired yesterday morning. His virtues rendered him dear, and his abilities useful to his country. The wicked measures of administration have at length brought matters to a crisis. I think it probable that the rage of the people, excited by the most clear view of the cursed designs of administration and the barbarous effusion of the blood of their countrymen, will lead them to attack General Gage and burn the ships in the harbor. Lord Chatham and our friends must make up the breach immediately or never. If anything terrible takes place, it will not now do to talk of calling the colonies to account for it, but must be attributed to the true cause, the unheard-of provocations given to this people. They never will talk of accommodation until the present ministry are entirely removed. You may depend, the colonies will sooner suffer depopulation than come into any measures with them. The next news from England must be conciliatory or the connection between us ends, however fatal the consequences may be. Prudence may yet alleviate the misfortunes and calm the convulsions into which the empire is thrown by the madness of the present administration. May Almighty God direct you. If anything is proposed that may be for the honor and safety of Great Britain and these colonies, my utmost efforts shall not be wanting." I am, in the utmost haste, surrounded by fifteen or twenty thousand men. 
your most obedient servant, Joseph Warren. P.S. The narrative sent to Dr. Franklin contains a true state of facts, but it was difficult to make the people willing that any notice should be taken of the matter by way of narrative until the Army and Navy were taken or driven away. J.W. On the 28th, Warren was appointed by the Committee of Safety to express its sentiments relative to Lord Dartmouth's circular letter to the governors of the colonies. This circular, with other declarations, says that His Majesty was determined to resist every attempt to encourage, in the colonies, ideas of independence. Warren's letter shows that he was of opinion that the next news from England must be conciliatory or the connection between the two countries would end. On this day, he was placed on a committee to consider the condition of the inhabitants of Boston, and he was the chairman of a committee appointed by the Provincial Congress to confer with a delegation from New Hampshire. In a letter addressed to the patriots of that colony, Congress said that the conviction was general in Massachusetts and the other colonies that, by their immediate and most vigorous exertions, there was the greatest prospect of establishing these liberties and saving the country. On the 29th, the Provincial Congress and the Committee of Safety were in session. I select from the varied business of that day the following report which has Warren's autograph. In Committee of Safety, Cambridge, April 29, 1775. Agreeably to the order of the Provincial Congress, this committee have inquired into the state and situation of the cannon and ordnance stores with the provision made for the companies of artillery and beg leave to report as follows, viz. In Cambridge, six three-pounders complete with ammunition and one six-pounder. In Watertown, 16 pieces of artillery of different sizes. The said six-pounder and 16 pieces will be taken out of the way, and the first mentioned six pieces will be used in the proper way of defense. Captain Forster is appointed to command one of the companies of artillery and ordered to enlist said company. Captain William Lee of Marblehead is sent for to take the command of another and several other persons are sent for to take command for other companies. Joseph Warren, Chairman On the 30th, Sunday, Warren kept mostly with the Committee of Safety, which met in Cambridge, and he passed an uncommonly anxious and busy day. The Tories in Boston were alarmed at the exodus of the inhabitants and were desirous to retain them as hostages for the safety of the town. On their remonstrance against the departure of so many, General Gage, on various pretexts, forbade their going out. Warren received a letter on this subject from the selectmen, and the committee on this day were occupied in considering it. Meantime, the Provincial Congress, which was also in session at Watertown, directed a letter to be sent in the afternoon to Warren, in which, after expressing the anxiety of the members on account of the distress of the people of Boston, it said this body sat in almost impatient expectation by several adjournments since seven o'clock this morning. The Committee of Safety reported to Congress, probably through Warren, a resolve providing for a system of permits to facilitate ingress and egress from the town, which was printed with his name attached to it. This subject occasioned the following letter to the selectman, which I copy from the original in his handwriting, which expresses his feeling for his ever-dear town of Boston. Joseph Warren to the Selectman of Boston. Cambridge, April 30th, 1775. Gentlemen, enclosed you have a resolve of Congress, which we hope will remove every obstacle to the removal of our friends from Boston. The necessity of going from this town to Watertown in order to lay the proposals of this committee before the Provincial Congress, we hope will suggest to you an apology for any supposed delay. But be assured that no person now in Boston is more deeply sensible of the distress, nor more desirous of relieving our brethren there, than the members of this committee. Encouragement will be given tomorrow to the wagoners in the country to repair to Boston to give all possible assistance to our friends in the removal of their effects. 
I wrote yesterday to General Gage upon the subject and requested him to take into consideration the expediency of restraining the country from sending in more than 30 wagons at one time, but I have received no answer. If I should receive any, the contents, so far as they respect my ever-dear town of Boston, shall be communicated to you. I am, gentlemen, with the sincerest respect and warmest affection, your most obedient servant. Colonel Benedict Arnold had just arrived in the camp from Connecticut, and he proposed to lead an expedition to capture Ticonderoga. Warren was appointed on a committee on this subject and took great interest in it. I have space, however, for only the following letter in which he expresses consideration of the rights of a sister colony. Cambridge, April 30, 1775. It has been proposed to us to take possession of the fortress of Ticonderoga. We have a just sense of the importance of that fortification and the usefulness of those fine cannons, mortars, and field pieces which are there, but we would not, even upon this emergency, infringe upon the rights of our sister colony, New York. But we have desired the gentleman who carries this letter to represent the matter to you, that you may give such orders as are agreeable to you. We are, with the greatest respect, your most obedient servants, Joseph Warren, Chairman. To Alexander McDougall. On the 1st of May, Warren received a reply to his letter of the preceding day, signed by five of the selectmen, who said that General Gage thought he could not officially correspond with Warren, but desired them to reply to his letter. The plan of granting permits was substantially satisfactory, but on various pretexts, the people continued to be retained in the town. On the 2nd, the Provincial Congress appointed a committee to wait on Warren to know whether he could serve them as their president when he replied by the following note, written on the blank leaf of the Letter of Selectmen of Boston. Dr. Warren presents his respects to the Honorable Provincial Congress, informs them that he will obey their order and attend his duty in Congress in the afternoon. He was a good deal disturbed at the action of Connecticut, which had sent an embassy to General Gage, and he addressed the following remarkable letter to the government of that colony, which I copy from the original in Warren's handwriting. Cambridge, May 2, 1775. We yesterday had a conference with Dr. Johnson and Colonel Wolcott, who were appointed by your assembly to deliver a letter to and hold a conference with General Gage. We feel the warmest gratitude to you for those generous and affectionate sentiments which you entertain towards us, but you will allow us to express our uneasiness on the account of one paragraph in your letter in which a cessation of hostilities is proposed. We fear that our brethren in Connecticut are not even yet convinced of the cruel designs of administration against America, nor thoroughly sensible of the miseries to which General Gage's army have reduced this wretched colony. We have lost the town, and we greatly fear the inhabitants of Boston, as we find the general is perpetually making new conditions and forming the most unreasonable pretenses for retarding their removal from that garrison. Our seaports on the eastern coasts are mostly deserted. Our people have been barbarously murdered by an insidious enemy who, under cover of the night, have marched into the heart of the country, spreading destruction with fire and sword. No business but that of war is either done or thought of in this colony. No agreement or compact with General Gage will in the least alleviate our distress, as no confidence can possibly be placed in any assurances he can give to a people whom he has first deceived in the matter, taking possession of and fortifying the town of Boston, and whom he has suffered his army to attack in the most inhuman and treacherous manner. Our relief now must arise from driving General Gage, with his troops, out of the country, which, by the blessing of God, we are determined to accomplish or perish in the attempt, as we think an honorable death, far better to meet in the field, whilst fighting for the liberties of all America, far to be preferable to being butchered in our own houses, or to being reduced to an ignominious slavery. We must entreat that our sister colony, Connecticut, will afford immediately all possible aid, as at this time delay will be attended 
with all that fatal train of events which would follow from an absolute desertion of the cause of American liberty. Excuse our earnestness upon this subject, as we know that upon the success of our present depend the lives and liberties of our country and of succeeding generations. We are, etc. Warren attended the session of Congress in the afternoon, for his name occurs on two committees, one relating to the inhabitants of Boston and the other on the subject of making a communication to the Continental Congress. On the 3rd, Warren was appointed by the Provincial Congress, one of three persons to procure a copper plate on which to print the colony notes which had been authorized and to countersign them. On this day, the Congress sent to the Continental Congress a brief summary of what the colony had done, and, with the most respectful submission, whilst acting in support of the cause of America, requested its direction and assistance. It terms the British troops the ministerial army. Having stated the steps taken to raise an army, and the application that had been made to Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New Hampshire, Congress said that the sudden exigency precluded the possibility of waiting for the direction of the Continental Congress. It expressed the greatest confidence in the wisdom and ability of the continent and their determination to sustain Massachusetts so far as it should appear to be necessary for supporting the common cause of the American colonies. On the 4th, Governor Trumbull wrote a reply to the letter of Warren, which is superscribed, Honorable Joseph Warren Esquire, Chairman of the Committee of Safety, that dispelled all uneasiness relative to the course of Connecticut. On this day, the Committee of Safety, in view of the extreme exigency of public affairs, resolved, as the opinion of this committee, that the public good of this colony requires that government in full form ought to be taken up immediately, and that a copy of this resolution be transmitted to the Congress now sitting at Watertown. On this day, Warren was appointed chairman of a committee to hold a conference with the embassy from Connecticut, who had come out of Boston after an interview with General Gage, and he was appointed the chairman of a committee, the other members being Jerry and Colonel James Warren, to prepare a letter to the Assembly of Connecticut on the subject of its application. On the 5th, on the complaint that one of General Ward's officers, by insolent behavior, had obstructed the removal of the Bostonians, the Provincial Congress ordered a sharp letter to be sent by one of its members to the General. The first draft of this letter, as reported in Congress, contained the name of the individual and related to the single case. This was stricken out and the following inserted, which appear in Warren's handwriting. Therefore, sir, you are directed to examine into the matter and give such orders as shall be effectual for the future, strictly to execute, etc., and also that you give directions to your officers carefully to execute the resolves of Congress in all matters in which they are to act, without any levity or indecency of expression or behavior. On this day, Congress resolved that General Gage had utterly disqualified himself to serve this colony as governor and in every other capacity, and it issued a precept for a new provincial congress. On the 6th, Warren was appointed by the provincial congress the chairman of a committee to consider a letter which had been received from the speaker of the Connecticut Assembly. Reports were current in the camp now that the regulars were about to make an attack somewhere. About 6 o'clock p.m., the army paraded and portions were ordered to lie on their arms all night. On Sunday, the 7th, the Provincial Congress held three sessions, meeting first at 8 o'clock, then at 12, and at 4, and the urgency of the hour is indicated in the resolve it passed, directing the Committee on Supplies to procure arms and bayonets of any colony on the continent. On the 8th, Warren, as President of the Provincial Congress in Watertown, signed a letter addressed to the Honorable Artemis Ward Esquire, General of the Massachusetts Forces, Cambridge, directing him to apprehend certain persons, giving their names, who on the pretext of searching for firearms were charged with committing robbery, and to hand them over to the Committee of Safety in order that, if guilty, they might meet with condign punishment. Warren was this day appointed the chairman of a committee to examine such persons as were recommended for surgeons in the army. On the 9th, 
Warren was appointed on a committee to prepare a spirited application to General Gage respecting his treatment of the inhabitants of Boston, also on a committee to see what provision could be made to supply enlisted soldiers with effective firearms. On the 10th, the session of the Congress was long, and the business that was transacted was important. So direct was the intelligence from Boston that the regulars would soon take the field that a committee considering the expediency of removing the cannon and stores at Cambridge further back into the country. On this day, the Committee on Remonstrating with Gage, of which Warren was a member, reported a letter which averred that Congress had endeavored to carry into effect the treaty which he made with the selectmen on the removal of the people and closed with expressing the hope that His Excellency would no longer permit a treaty with the distressed people to be violated. On the 11th, the Congress held three sessions. At this time, the official papers addressed to Warren, or having his autograph, are numerous. The Committee of Safety passed the following vote, that Mr. William Cooper, Jr., be, and he hereby is, appointed a clerk to Dr. Warren, President of the Congress. On the 12th, Congress was occupied with the vital subject of assuming a civil government for Massachusetts, Warren being in the chair, and this question being the order of the day. After the absent members had been called in, it was moved that the sense of the Congress be taken on this question, viz., whether there is now existing in this colony a necessity of taking up and exercising civil government in all its parts. Congress resolved itself into a committee of the whole for the consideration of this question, which placed the president on the floor. It is only said in the journals that the committee considered the question. It is not said that Warren spoke, so provokingly barren are the official details, but there is the following record. The president, on a motion made, resumed the chair. The committee then by the Honorable Joseph Warren Esquire, their chairman, reported that a committee be raised for the purpose of reporting to the Congress an application to the Continental Congress for obtaining their recommendation for this colony to take up and exercise civil government as soon as may be, and that the committee be directed to ground the application on the necessity of the case. The report was accepted by a large majority, and Warren was appointed to the chairman of this committee. Thus, great as the emergency was, the Patriots were not prepared to take so important a step as creating a new government without the sanction of the Continental Congress or of the American Union. On this day, Warren wrote the following note, here copied from the original in his handwriting. Watertown, May 12, 1775 to the Honorable the Safety of Committee. Gentlemen, Mr. Pigeon is now sick. His business must be attended to. He requests that Mr. Charles Miller, the bearer hereof, may be appointed his assistant and immediately directed to go upon business. Pray desire the young gentleman you were pleased to appoint to be my clerk to attend here, as I have much writing to do and want a number of papers copied for the use of Congress. I am, gentlemen, your most obedient servant, J. Warren. On the 14th, Sunday, Warren signed his name as chairman of the Committee of Safety. The meeting of this body on this day was uncommonly important. It resolved that all the livestock be taken from Noddles Island, Hog Island, Snake Island, and that part of Chelsea near the seacoast. Warren sent the following note to Mr. Gill of the Committee of Supplies. Cambridge, 14th May, 1775. Mr. Moses Gill. Sir, the Committee of Safety are informed that the iron pots provided for the Army are immediately under your care and by your letter are advised that 1,500 were prepared and 500 making. By the account from the commissary, there has been but 800 received, we would inform you the operations of the Army are, on this account, obstructed and this occasions considerable uneasiness. You'll critically examine into this matter and forthwith order said pots into the camp at Cambridge in such quantities as to complete the above number. Joseph Warren, Chairman. P.S. Should be glad to be informed if the pots are disposed of agreeable to the enclosed vote of 18th of April. 
On this day, Warren was communing with Samuel Adams on the great subject of taking up government in the following letter. Cambridge, May 14, 1775. Dear Sir, we are here waiting for advice from the Continental Congress respecting our taking up government. We cannot think, after what we have suffered for a number of years, that you will advise us to take up that form established by the last charter, as it contains in it the seeds of despotism, and would, in a few years, bring us again into the same unhappy situation in which we now are. For my part, after the termination of the present struggle, I hope never more to be obliged to enter into a political war. I would, therefore, wish that the government here might be so happily molded that the only road to promotion may be through the affection of the people. This being the case, the interest of the governor and the governed will be the same, and we shall no longer be plagued by a group of unprincipled villains who have acted as though they thought they had a right to plunder and destroy their countrymen as soon as they could obtain permission from Great Britain for doing it. We have some very striking instances of the perfidy of one man who has been raised by the people to power and trust in the letters of Hutchinson, many of which I have now in my possession. When he had obtained all the people could bestow, it is probable he would have remained firm in their interest, because it would have been for his advantage to have remained so, had there not been a higher station to which his ambitious mind aspired, which was not in the gift of the people. In order to obtain this, he judged it necessary to sacrifice the people, which he has endeavored to do in the most vile and treacherous manner. I send some extracts from his letters, and intend speedily to have many of them published. General Gage, I fear, has trepanned the inhabitants of Boston. He has persuaded them to lay down their arms, promising to let them remove with their effects, but he suffers them to come out but very slowly, contriving every day new excuses for delay. It appears to me that a spirited remonstrance from your Congress and a recommendation forthwith to seize all Crown officers on the continent would be the most effectual method of liberating our friends in Boston. I pray you would first consult our delegates upon this subject, and then, if you think proper, mention it to others. Not a moment of time is to be lost. The distress of that town is not to be expressed by words. I have hitherto kept a surgeon's place in the army for your son, but I fear it cannot be kept any longer, as the regiment has a number sick and must have one appointed, and I have here no reason to expect your son out at present, as he has tried every way to obtain a pass, but to no purpose, and is, as I am informed, entered upon the list with those whom they are determined to detain. He has attempted to come out under a factitious name, but hitherto without success. However, I hear the people are all treated with much more decency than they used to be, and I doubt not but the spirited measure I have proposed to you, together with what we are doing here, will procure the enlargement of our distressed brethren. We have an army of about 7,000 strong already. If the proposed army of 30,000 men can be quickly got together, I believe this summer will bring our disputes with Great Britain to a happy issue. It has been suggested to me that an application from your Congress to the Six Nations, accompanied with some presence, might have a very good effect. It appears to me to be worthy of your attention, as they may be of very great use to us in case of any disturbances in the back settlements. We must now prepare for everything, as we are certain that nothing but success in our warlike enterprises can possibly save us from destruction. If a number of large battery cannon with proper ammunition could be procured, I believe we should soon settle the business with Mr. Gage, but it was too long before we could be convinced that the madness of our invaders would compel us to make use of such things. If powder could be sent from the other colonies to us, it might be of eminent service now, if it be possible to subdue the army here. I believe we may make our own terms, for we shall have much to offer for the benefit of Great Britain, even after she has lost the power of providing for a set of pimps and traders amongst us, which is the most she could reasonably have expected, and the ministers succeeded in their plan of enslaving the colonies. 
I send you a number of printed papers which contain our public proceedings. I keep this letter open until an opportunity of sending it presents. May 17th. Yesterday, Dr. Church was appointed to wait on the Continental Congress with the address from this Congress, which renders it unnecessary for me to write so particularly to you as I intended, as you will have from him an exact state of affairs vis a voce. I would just observe that the application made to you respecting the taking the regulation of this army into your hands by appointing a committee of war, or taking the command of it by appointing a generalissimo, is a matter, I think, must be managed with much delicacy. I am a little suspicious. Unless great care is taken, some dissensions may arise in the army, as our soldiers, I find, will not yet be brought to obey any person of whom they do not themselves entertain a high opinion. Subordination is absolutely necessary in an army, but the strings must not be drawn too tight at first. The bands of love and esteem must be principally relied on amongst men who know not of any distinction but what arises from some superior merit. I know your prudence and thorough knowledge of our countrymen, their many virtues and their few faults. The matter of taking up government, I think, cannot occasion much debate. If the southern colonies have any apprehensions from the northern colonies, they surely must now be for an establishment of civil government here, for, as an army is now necessary, or is taking the field, it is obvious to everyone, if they are without control, a military government must certainly take place, and I think I cannot see a question with them to determine which is most to be feared, a military or a civil government. I am, dear sir, with great esteem, your most obedient servant, Joseph Warren. On the 15th, the Congress instructed the committee who were preparing the application to the Continental Congress on the subject of the formation of a local government to insert in it a clause desiring that body to take some measures for directing and regulating the American forces. On this day, Warren, in the name of the Committee of Donations, addressed the following letter to Joseph Reed of Philadelphia. Joseph Warren to Joseph Reed. Cambridge, May 15, 1775. Dear Sir, I received your very kind letter enclosing a bill of exchange of $420 in favor of the distressed poor of Boston upon Mr. Roch, which I shall take the first opportunity of sending to him, not doubting, but it will be duly honored. The sympathy which you discover to have, both in our sufferings and successes in opposing the enemies of the country, is a fresh proof of that benevolence and public spirit which I ever found in you. I rejoice that our friends in Philadelphia are united, and that all are at last brought to see the barbarous scheme of oppression which administration has formed. We are all embarked in one bottom. If one colony is enslaved, she will be immediately improved as an engine to subdue the others. This our enemies know and for this cause they have used every art to divide us one from the other, to encourage every groundless prejudice which they could hope to separate us. Our arch-traitor, Hutchinson, has labored hard in this service. He seems to have fully adopted old Juno's maxim, Flectere se nequeo superos, acaronto movebo. I send you a few extracts from some of his letters, which have fortunately fallen in my hands. I likewise send you a pamphlet containing the regulations for the army. You are kind enough to say that our friends in Philadelphia will assist with whatever they can when they know our wants, which fills us with a lively sense of the generosity of your colony. To say the truth, we are in want of almost everything, but nothing so much as arms and ammunition, for although much time has been spent in procuring these articles, yet the people never seemed in earnest about the matter until after the engagement of the 19th. Alt, and I verily believe that the night preceding the barbarous outrages committed by the soldiery at Lexington, Concord, etc., there were not fifty people in the whole colony that ever expected any blood would be shed in the contest between us and Great Britain. The repeated intelligence I received from the best authority of the sanguinary, malicious temper of the present administration 
together with a perfect knowledge of the inhumanity and wickedness of the villains at Boston, who had the ear of General Gage, compelled me to believe that matters would be urged to the last extremity. Any assistance, of what kind soever, that can be afforded us by our sister colony in this all-important struggle for the freedom of America will be received with the warmest gratitude. I am, dear sir, with much regard and esteem, your most humble servant, Joseph Warren. On the 16th, Warren, as president of the Provincial Congress, was directed to send by one of the members, Dr. Church, an application to the Continental Congress on the questions of a civil government and the disposition of the army. The original of this document is in a fair, round handwriting, but its main thought is the same that Warren urged in his private letters. On the question of local government, it said that the colony, though urged by the most pressing necessity, had declined to assume the reins of civil government without the advice and consent of the Continental Congress, and it now asks the favor of the most explicit advice respecting the taking up and exercising the power of civil government which was thought to be absolutely necessary for the salvation of the country. It pledged Massachusetts to a ready submission to such a general plan as it, the Continental Congress, might direct for the colonies, and promised to make it a duty to establish such a form of local government as should not only most promote the advantage of the colony, but the union and interest of all America. This admirable and statesmanlike paper closed by suggesting that the Continental Congress should take the regulation and general direction of the army. It is simple justice to say that this paper dealt with the vast question of local and general government in the national spirit that characterized the whole course of the Massachusetts Patriots. On this day, Warren addressed the following letter to Arthur Lee. Cambridge, May 16, 1775. My dear sir, everything here continues as at the period of my writing to you a short time ago. Our military operations go on in a very spirited manner. General Gage had a reinforcement of about 600 Marines the day before yesterday, but this gives very little concern here. It is not expected that he will sally out of Boston at present, and if he does, He will but gratify thousands who impatiently wait to avenge the blood of their murdered countrymen. The attempt he has made to throw the odium of the first commencement of hostilities on the people here has operated very much to his disadvantage, as so many credible people were eyewitnesses of the whole affair, whose testimonies are justly supposed of infinitely greater weight than anything he has or can bring in support of his assertion. My private opinion is that he is really deceived in this matter and is led by his officers and some other of the most abandoned villains on earth who are natives of this country and who are now shut up with him in Boston to believe that our people actually began the firing. But my opinion is only for myself. Most people are satisfied not only that he knows that the regulars began the fire, but also that he gave his orders to the commanding officer to do it. Thus, by attempting to clear the troops from what everyone is sure they were guilty of, he has brought on strong suspicion that he himself is guilty of having preconcerted the mischief done by them. Indeed, his very unmanly conduct relative to the people of Boston in detaining many of them and contriving new excuses for delaying their removal after they had given up their firearms upon a promise of being suffered to leave town and carry with them their effects has much lessened his character and confirmed former suspicions. The Continental Congress is now sitting. I suppose, before I hear from you again, a new form of government will be established in this colony. Great Britain must now make the best she can of America. The folly of her ministers have brought her into this situation. If she has sufficient strength even to depopulate the colonies, she has not strength sufficient to subjugate them. However, we can yet, without injuring ourselves, offer much to her. The great national advantages derived from the colonies may, I hope, yet be reaped by her from us. 
The plan for enslaving us, if it had succeeded, would only have put it in the power of administration to have provided for a number of their worthless dependents, whilst the nation was deprived of the most essential benefits which might have arisen from us by commerce, and the taxes raised in America would, instead of easing the mother country of her burdens, only would have been employed to bring her into bondage. I cannot precisely tell you what will become of General Gage. I imagine he will at least be kept closely shut up in Boston. Perhaps you will very soon hear something further. One thing I can assure you, he has very great weight with us. We fear, if we push this matter as far as we think we are able, to the destruction of the troops and ships of war, we shall expose Great Britain to those invasions from foreign powers which we suppose will be difficult for her to repel. In fact, you must have a change of men and measures or be ruined. The truly noble Richmond, Rockingham, Chatham, Shelburne, with other lords and the virtuous and sensible majority in the House of Commons, must take the lead. The confidence we have in them will go a great way, but I must tell you that those terms which would readily have been accepted before our countrymen were murdered, and we in consequence thereof compelled to take arms, will not now do. Everything in my power to serve the united interest of Great Britain and her colonies shall be done, and I pray that you, your brother and Mr. Sayre, to whom I beg you would make my most respectful compliments, would write fully, freely, and speedily to me, and let me know, likewise, what our great and good friends in the House of Lords and Commons think expedient and practicable to be done. God forbid that the nation should be so infatuated as to do anything further to irritate the colonies. If they should, the colonies will sooner throw themselves into the arms of any other power on earth than ever consent to an accommodation with Great Britain. That patience which I have frequently told you would be at last exhausted is no longer to be expected from us. Danger and war are become pleasing, and injured virtue is now armed to avenge herself. I am, my dear sir, your most obedient, humble servant, Joseph Warren. P.S. Please to let Mr. Sayre and Sheriff Lee know that I shall write to them by the first opportunity. This will be handed to you by my good friend, Mr. Burrell, who will give you a more particular account of the situation of our public affairs. End of chapter 15, part 1. Chapter 15, Part 2 of Life and Times of Joseph Warren by Richard Frothingham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the 17th, Warren drafted a congratulatory letter in behalf of the Provincial Congress to the Connecticut Colony on the capture of Ticonderoga, which I copy from the original in his handwriting. Watertown, May 17th, 1775. Gentlemen, we have the happiness of presenting our congratulations to you on the reduction of that important fortress, Ticonderoga. We applaud the conduct of both the officers and soldiers, and are of opinion that the advantageous situation of that fortress makes it highly expedient that it should be repaired and properly garrisoned. In the meantime, as we suppose that there is no scruple for keeping all the cannon there, we should be extremely glad if all the battering cannon, especially brass cannon, which can be spared from that place or procured from Crown Point, which we hope is by this time in the hands of our friends, may be forwarded this way with all possible expedition, as we have here to contend with an army furnished with as fine a train of artillery as ever was seen in America, and we are in extreme want of a sufficient number of cannon to fortify those important passes without which we can neither annoy General Gage, if as it should become necessary, nor defend ourselves against him. We, therefore, must most earnestly recommend this very important matter to your immediate consideration. And we would suggest it as our opinion that the appointing Colonel Arnold to take charge of them and bring them down in all possible haste may be a means of settling any dispute which may have arisen between him and some other officers, which we are always desirous to avoid, and more especially at a time when our common danger ought to unite us in the strongest bonds of amity and affection. We are, gentlemen, etc. On the 18th, 
Warren was again chosen a member of the Committee of Safety, his name standing next to Hancock's. He had this day an unusual duty put upon him, occasioned by the arrest and detention by an armed party of Lady Franklin, who had received a permit to go into Boston as authorized by Congress, and one of the party was called to account before this body. On retiring, it was resolved that the President should gently admonish him and assure him that the Congress were determined to preserve their dignity and power over the military, when the offender was called in and the President politely admonished him. On the 19th, Congress renewed the powers of the Committee of Safety in a series of resolves that would occupy several of these pages, confirmed its acts thus far, and put the substantial executive power of the colony into their hands. It gave this body full power to call out the militia, to station the army, and directed the general and other officers to render strict obedience to its orders. On the 20th, Warren, in the morning, was appointed by Congress the head of an important committee to consider how the Massachusetts Army could be organized in the most ready and effectual manner, and in the afternoon, as president, he delivered to General Ward his commission as general and commander-in-chief of the Massachusetts forces. The oath was administered to him by Honorable Samuel Dexter, it is not mentioned that Warren made an address on this occasion, but he was in the habit of doing it on the delivery of military commissions, as I have already stated. In 1782, John Adams related this incident at a dinner party at The Hague. He says, Dr. Warren made a harangue in the form of a charge in the presence of the assembly to every officer upon the delivery of his commission, and he never failed to make the officer, as well as all the assembly, shudder upon these occasions. Count Sarsfield appeared struck and affected by this anecdote. On the 21st, Sunday, the following is the whole of the record of the doings of Congress. Met at 4 o'clock p.m. and adjourned to tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. Warren communicated to Hall's paper, the Essex Gazette, the following account of what occurred this day. Last Sabbath, about 10 o'clock a.m., an express arrived at General Thomas's quarters at Roxbury, informing him that four sloops, two of them armed, were sailed from Boston to the south shore of the bay, and that a number of soldiers were landing at Weymouth. General Thomas ordered three companies to march to the support of the inhabitants. When arrived, they found the soldiers had not attempted to land at Weymouth, but had landed on Grape Island, from whence they were carrying off hay on board the sloops. The people of Weymouth assembled on a point of land next to Grape Island. The distance from Weymouth shore to the said island was too great for small arms to do execution. Nevertheless, our people frequently fired. The fire was returned from one of the vessels with swivel guns, but the shot passed over our heads and did no mischief. Matters continued in this state for several hours, the soldiers pulling the hay down to the waterside, our people firing at the vessel, and they now and then discharging swivel guns. The tide had now come in, and several lighters, which were aground, were got afloat, upon which our people, who were ardent for battle, got on board, hoisted sail, and bore directly down upon the nearest point of the island. The soldiers and sailors immediately left the barn and made for their boats, and to put off from one end of the island whilst our people landed on the other. The sloops hoisted sail with all possible expedition whilst our people set fire to the barn and burnt seventy or eighty tons of hay, then fired several tons which had been pulled down to the waterside and brought off the cattle. As the vessels passed Horseneck, a sort of promontory which extends from Germantown, they fired their swivels and small arms at our people pretty briskly, but without effect, though one of the bullets from their small arms, which passed over our people, struck against the stone with such force as to take off a large part of the bullet. Whether any of the enemy were wounded is uncertain, though it is reported three of them were. It is thought they did not carry off more than one or two tons of hay. There is an omission in this relation. Bancroft remarks that Warren, ever bravest among the brave, ever present where there was danger, was in this affair. On the 22nd, the Provincial Congress sent to Colonel Arnold a letter on the capture of Ticonderoga 
similar in sentiment to Warren's letter written to Connecticut on the 17th, and enclosing a copy of it, saying that, as the expedition began in that colony, it ought to take the whole matter under its care and direction until the advice of the Continental Congress could be received. On the 23rd, the Committee on the Organization of the Army, appointed on the 20th, of which Warren was the chairman, reported through Joseph Hawley per order, and among other recommendations, that a lieutenant general should be appointed by the Congress before it should rise. On the 24th, the Provincial Congress issued an address to their friends and fellow countrymen, urging that they should continue to furnish supplies to support the army and ought to crown all their exertions by subscribing to a loan of 100000 lawful money. On the 25th, Warren had the pleasure of sending to the Committee of Safety the following note, which I copy from the original in his handwriting. Watertown, May 25th, 1775. To the Honorable Committee of Safety. Gentlemen, upon my arrival here, just this minute, I had the pleasure of being informed that our worthy friend Colonel Arnold, not having had the sole honor of reducing Ticonderoga and Crown Point, determined upon an expedition against St. John's, in which he happily succeeded. The letters were directed to the Committee of Safety, but were supposed to be necessary to be laid before Congress. I have not yet seen them, but you will have the particulars from the bearer. I have also received a letter from the Congress of New Hampshire informing me of a resolve to raise forthwith 2,000 men and more if it should be necessary. The troops, at least one company, with a train of artillery from Providence, are in the upper end of Roxbury. To say the truth, I find my health much mended since the morning. I am, gentlemen, your most obedient servant, J. Warren. P.S. You will be kind enough to communicate the contents of this letter to the General's room, as I love to give pleasure to good men. On the 26th, Warren addressed the following clear, well-considered, and statesmanlike letter to his friend Samuel Adams on the all-important question of a civil government and the control of the army. Joseph Warren to Samuel Adams. Dear Sir, I see more and more the necessity of establishing a civil government here, and such a government as shall be sufficient to control the military forces, not only of this colony, but also such as shall be sent to us from the other colonies. The continent must strengthen and support with all its weight the civil authority here, otherwise our soldiery will lose the ideas of right and wrong and will plunder instead of protecting the inhabitants." This is but too evident already, and I assure you, internos, that unless some authority sufficient to restrain the irregularities of this army is established, we shall very soon find ourselves involved in greater difficulties than you can well imagine. The least hint from the most unprincipled fellow, who has perhaps been reproved for some criminal behavior, is quite sufficient to expose the fairest character to insult and abuse among many. And it is with our countrymen, as with all other men, when they are in arms, they think the military should be uppermost. I know very well that in the course of time people will see the error of such proceedings, but I am not sure it will be before many disagreeable consequences may take place. The evil may now be easily remedied. I know the temper of our people. They are sensible, brave, and virtuous, and I wish they might ever continue so. Mild and gentle regulations will be sufficient for them, but the penalties annexed to the breach of those rules should be vigorously inflicted. I would have such a government as should give every man the greatest liberty to do what he pleases consistent with restraining him from doing any injury to another, or such a government as would most contribute to the good of the whole, with the least inconvenience to individuals. However, it is difficult to frame a government de novo, which will stand in need of no amendment. Experience must point out defects. And, if the people should not lose their morals, it will be easy for them to correct the errors in the first formation of government. If they should lose them, what was not good at first will be soon insupportable. My great wish, therefore, is that we may restrain everything which tends to weaken the principles of right and wrong, more especially with regard to property. 
You may th possibly think I am a little angry with my countrymen, or have not so good an opinion of them as I formerly had, but that is not the case. I love, I admire them. The errors they have fallen into are natural and easily accounted for. The sudden alarm brought them together, animated with the noblest spirit. They left their houses, their families, with nothing but the clothes on their backs, without a day's provision, and many without a farthing in their pockets. Their country was in danger, their brethren were slaughtered, their arms alone engrossed their attention. As they passed through the country, the inhabitants gladly opened their hospitable doors, and all things were in common. The enemies of their country alone refused to aid and comfort the hungry soldier. Prudence seemed to dictate that the force made use of to obtain what ought voluntarily to have been given should be winked at. And it is not easy for men, especially when interest and the gratification of appetite are considered, to know how far they may continue to tread in the path where there are no landmarks to direct them. I hope care will be taken by the Continental Congress to apply an immediate remedy as the infection is caught by every new corps that arrives. With regard to the skirmish which happened at Grape Island, you will find a particular account thereof in Hall's paper, which was given him by myself, who was in the action. Yesterday arrived the three famous generals, Howe, Burgoyne, and Clinton, with twenty of the light horse. Two were lost on the voyage. Pray present my best respects to all friends, particularly our colony members, and, without letting the matter be public, take their opinions upon the former part of this letter. For the honor of my country, I wish the disease may be cured before it is known to exist. I am, dear sir, your most obedient servant and sincere friend, Joseph Warren. Mr. Samuel Adams, Cambridge, May 26, 1775. On the 27th, Warren, as the President of Congress, sent to the Continental Congress a letter relative to the action of Massachusetts in relation to the capture of Ticonderoga, which contains more elaborately the views he had expressed in his letters to Mr. McDougall of New York and to Connecticut. We beg leave, this letter says, on this occasion most solemnly to assure your honors that nothing can be more abhorrent to the temper and spirit of this Congress and the people of this colony than any attempt to usurp on the jurisdiction of any of our sister colonies, which, upon the superficial consideration of this step, there may seem to be some appearance of. But we assure ourselves that such are the candor and generous sentiments of our brethren of the colony of New York that they will readily overlook this mistake, if it is one, committed in the haste of war. If any of these cannons should arrive within the limits of this colony, we shall hold ourselves accountable for them to your honors or any succeeding representatives of the continent." So careful were the patriots not to infringe on the local jurisdiction of their brethren, and so true were they to the Union. On this day, Warren served under General Putnam in the spirited skirmish on Noddles Island, when the provincials drove off the livestock. In the London Chronicle of this date, appended to an address by the Provincial Congress to the inhabitants of Great Britain, Warren's name occurs, for the first time, appended to an official document printed in England. On the 28th, Warren received a letter from J. Henshaw, who was selected for a mission to Hartford and Crown Point, asking for certain papers and a horse and sulky, which Mr. Gill promised to supply. Henshaw asked Warren's direction in the matter. Many letters of this nature were addressed to Warren, which shows the detail that fell to his lot. On the 29th, Warren, as president, addressed a letter to the New Hampshire Congress, urging the importance of maintaining the forts of Ticonderoga and Crown Point. On this day, the Second Provincial Congress dissolved. On the 30th, there was a meeting of the Committee of Safety, when directions were given to carry to Cambridge the cannon and stores saved from a schooner that had been burned in Chelsea. The 31st was the day named in the colony charter for the annual election of councillors, and the Third Provincial Congress convened in the meeting house at Watertown. The first entry on its journal states that Honorable Joseph Warren Esquire was unanimously chosen the president. The Committee of Safety met in this town, and there was held here a convention of congregational ministers. 
the president of Harvard College, Rev. Samuel Langdon, D.D., preached the election sermon from the text. And I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterwards thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. The discourse began with the following words. Shall we rejoice, my fathers and brethren, or shall we weep together on the return of this anniversary? In Dr. Langdon's view, the controversy threatened a final separation of the colonies from Great Britain. He announced the vital principle that every nation, when able and agreed, has a right to set up over themselves any form of government which to them might appear most conducive to their common welfare. He uttered the following timely Republican injunction, let those who cry up the divine right of kings consider that the only form of government which had a proper claim to a divine establishment was so far from including the idea of a king that it was a high crime in Israel to be in this respect like other nations. And he regarded the general agreement through so many provinces of so large a country in the adoption of one mode of self-preservation, of corresponding committees and congresses as caused by some supernatural influence on the minds of the main body of the people. There has been a disposition to take a semi-Tory view of the conduct of the people by giving undue importance to the instances of mob action and to overlook the remarkable adherence to social order that is seen through ten years of exciting controversy. The words of Dr. Langdon on this point are valuable. He said, Universal tumults and all the irregularities and violence of mobbish factions naturally arise when legal authority ceases. But how little of this has appeared in the midst of the late obstructions of civil government. Nothing more than what has often happened in Great Britain and Ireland in the face of the civil powers in all their strength. Nothing more than what is frequently seen in the midst of the perfect regulations of the great city of London. And he bore the following testimony to the general obedience paid, at that time, to the local authorities and the inchoate nationality. The judgment and advice of the Continental Assembly of Delegates have been as readily obeyed as if they were the authentic acts of a long-established Parliament. And in every colony, the votes of a Congress have had equal effect with the laws of great and general courts. This fact is a part of American history, a history not made by the few, but by the many, a history which illustrates at every step the power of an enlightened public opinion. On the 1st of June, the Provincial Congress ordered letters to be sent to Colonel Arnold, to the Assembly of Connecticut, and the Provincial Congress of New Hampshire on the subject of retaining Ticonderoga and Crown Point. On the 2nd, Congress was occupied with the details connected with the organization of the army. Among the papers addressed to Warren as president were memorials relative to the exposed portion of the seaport towns, and a large committee was appointed to consider the subject of their protection. On the 3rd, a committee with Jerry as the chairman was appointed to hold a conference at Cambridge with the Committee of Safety on the subject of reinforcing the Army and the general officers were invited to join it. On the 4th, Sunday, there were three sessions of the Provincial Congress. Elbridge Jerry addressed a letter on this day to the Massachusetts delegates in which he strongly urged the necessity of a local government and of a regular general. In relation to the letter, Jerry says, I should hardly rejoice to see this way the beloved Colonel Washington, and do not doubt the New England generals would acquiesce in showing to our sister colony, Virginia, the respect she has before experienced from the continent in making him generalissimo. This is a matter in which Dr. Warren agrees with me, and we had intended to write you jointly on the affair. Warren, on this day, as chairman of the Committee of Safety, united with General Ward, general of the Massachusetts forces, and Moses Gill, chairman of the Committee of Supplies, in a strong representation to the Continental Congress of the distresses of the colony, 
in the assurance, they said, that Congress, as the wise guardians of the lives, liberties, and properties of the whole of this extensive continent, would attend to the circumstances of all who, under God, looked up to them for protection and deliverance. On the 5th, a committee was appointed to examine certain mineral earth that had been submitted to Congress and, in such inquiry, to consult the Honorable Joseph Warren Esquire and Professor Sewell. On the 6th, Warren accompanied General Putnam to Charlestown in order to effect an exchange of prisoners. Captain Chester and the Weathersfield Company formed the escort. Warren and Putnam rode in a phaeton. Two of the prisoners, who were officers, were on horseback. A lieutenant was in a chase, and four wounded Marines were in two carts. Warren and Putnam met Major Moncrief and other British officers at the house of Dr. Foster in Charlestown, where an entertainment was provided. The affair was conducted with the utmost decency and good humor. On this day, Warren was appointed on a committee to consider the expediency of authorizing armed vessels to cruise on the American coasts, protect its trade, and annoy its enemies. The members were enjoined to observe secrecy. On the 7th, the business transacted by the Provincial Congress was uncommonly important. Elbridge Jerry, from a committee, reported that it was unnecessary for the colony to augment its forces. A time was assigned for the choice of two major generals. The President was directed to admonish Mr. Edwards on account of his speech on the Committee of Safety. On the 8th, there was an important debate in the Provincial Congress on a report signed by Jerry as chairman to the effect that it was unnecessary to increase the force raised for this and other American colonies when the committees of safety and supplies and the several committees of the Congress were desired to be present. After debating the subject in the morning and the afternoon in Committee of the Whole, the report was accepted. On the 9th, the Provincial Congress adopted a stringent order directing the Committee of Safety to certify the claims or pretensions that any gentleman might have to a commission in the service with a view to reducing the army to order. On the 10th, the Committee of Safety presented an elaborate and valuable report showing the confused state of the army from the date of the 19th of April, in consequence of more enlisting orders having been delivered than were sufficient to enlist the numbers of men required. At that time, the committee say, but few men enlisted, and there was an apprehension that the province was in the utmost danger from the want of men. Hutchinson predicted to Gibbon that, unless fanaticism got the better of self-preservation, they, the people, must soon disperse, as it was the season for sowing their Indian corn, the chief subsistence of New England. This was the time when Warren did wonders in keeping the army together. On the 11th, the Provincial Congress authorized Joseph Hawley to sign an address to the Continental Congress, which strongly reiterated the necessity of a settled civil polity or government, making reference to the former application of the 16th of May. This address says, The pressing weight of our distresses has necessitated the sending of a special post to obtain your immediate advice upon this subject, and we do most earnestly entreat that you would, as soon as possible, dispatch the messenger with such advice. This address repeats the considerations which Warren had urged in official and private letters. On the 12th, there was a session of the Provincial Congress, but the absorbing topic of the day was the celebrated proclamation of General Gage, declaring the infatuated multitudes who were in arms and their abettors to be rebels and offering pardon to all excepting Samuel Adams and John Hancock. On the 13th, there was a long session of Congress. Warren was appointed the chairman of a committee to consider the subject matter of a late extraordinary proclamation of General Gage, and this committee prepared a counter-proclamation, which, though not issued at the time, was printed subsequently in the journals of the Provincial Congress. On the 14th, the Provincial Congress chose Warren, by ballot, a major general. 
the records say a committee was directed to wait on the Honorable Joseph Warren Esquire and inform him that this Congress had made choice of him for second major general of the Massachusetts Army and desire his answer to this Congress of his acceptance of this trust. It is stated that he was proposed as a physician general, but preferring a more active and hazardous employment, he accepted a major general's commission. On the 15th, the Committee of Safety recommended to the Council of War that, as the possession of Bunker Hill appeared to be of importance to the safety of the colony, it be maintained by a sufficient force being posted there, and, as the situation of Dorchester Hill was unknown to the committee, it recommended to the Council of War to take such steps relative to it as to them should appear to be for the security of the colony. It had been reported for several weeks that General Gage, when his reinforcements arrived, designed to commence offensive operations, and it was expected in England that his finely appointed army, commanded by generals of experience, would easily disperse the provincials. So scanty was the supply of powder and of arms, and so great the confusion of the army, that there were apprehensions that General Gage might succeed, at least so far as to capture Cambridge and Congress took steps to secure the records and stores. On the 12th of May, this body was formally advised that, in order to render the country safe from all sallies of the enemy in this quarter, it would be necessary to fortify Prospect Hill, the first hill in Charlestown, now in Somerville, nearest to headquarters, Winter Hill, which is nearest to the peninsula of Charlestown, and Bunker Hill, just within the peninsula. It is said that Warren was not in favor of occupying so exposed a post as Bunker Hill, which would be in accordance with his usual good judgment. The following incidents are related. On the evening after the affair at Noddles Island, after General Putnam had warmly urged this measure, but General Ward had enjoined caution, Warren remarked to Putnam, I admire your spirit and respect General Ward's prudence. We shall need them both, and one must temper the other. After the march of the army into Charlestown, Ward and Warren, against an occupancy of the heights of this town, said that, as they had no powder to spare and no battering cannon, it would be idle to make approaches on to the town. One day after conversing with Putnam on this subject, Warren rose and walked two or three times across the room, leaned a few minutes over the back of a chair in thoughtful attitude and said, Almost thou persuadest me, General Putnam, but I must still think the project a rash one. Nevertheless, if the project be adopted and the strife becomes hard, you must not be surprised to find me near you in the midst of it. There is nothing unreasonable in these relations so far as they relate to Warren. In fact, they harmonize with much under his own hand bearing on military operations. His letters show how earnest he was to drive Gage out of Boston, but his pleading for power, artillery, discipline, and adequate government shows a wise appreciation of the obstacles that were in the path of success. The great object, however, was self-defense. The commanders of the army received authentic intelligence that General Gage had fixed on the night of the 18th of June on which to commence offensive operations, and hence the action of the Committee of Safety. On this day, Warren, as President of Congress, signed letters addressed to Connecticut, New Hampshire, and the Continental Congress. An elaborate report showed the disorganized state of the army, the position of the colonels relative to commissions, and stated that the Massachusetts forces fell considerably short of the 13,600 men which had been ordered to be enlisted. On the 16th, Warren presided at the session of the Provincial Congress at Watertown. Several colonels and captains were sworn in and commissioned, and the Committee on Gage's Proclamation, of which Warren was the chairman, reported a spirited rejoinder. The Committee of Safety met at Cambridge, and the business on its hands must have been uncommonly urgent. It was reported this day in the camp that Warren was chosen a major general and that Heath was not chosen to any office, but it was supposed that no difficulty would arise from it. The following note, which I copy from the original in his handwriting, superscribed, General Heath, 
camp at Roxbury, to be delivered immediately, shows that Warren was in Cambridge and on the most kindly relations with Heath. It is the last word from Joseph Warren under his own hand. Cambridge, June 16th. My good friend, everything is now going agreeable to our wishes. General Ward has recommended to the Congress to take the we determined upon yesterday. Nothing is wanting but for you to make a return of your regiment, which I wish may be done without a moment's delay, as there is an absolute order of Congress that the brigadiers shall be chosen out of the colonels. I am your most obedient, humble servant, Joseph Warren. In the evening, he was applied to on public business and promised that it should be attended to. About nine o'clock, Colonel Prescott, at the head of a detachment of about 1,000 men, marched from Cambridge to Charlestown, passed over Bunker Hill, which had been recommended to be held, and threw up a redoubt on the heights near Boston, which have since obtained the name of Breed's Hill. The Committee of Safety say that this hill was chosen by mistake. It is stated that Warren passed the night in the transaction of public business. End of Chapter 15, Part 2《Chapter 16 of Life and Times of Joseph Warren by Richard Frothingham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Closing Scene Warren and the 17th of June. The Committee of Safety. The Continental Congress. Warren in the Bunker Hill Battle. His Fall. The General Grief. The Remains. Monument. Conclusion 1775, the 17th of June The 17th of June was a marked anniversary in Warren's career. Seven years before, on this day, in a town meeting, he recommended the people to vindicate their rights at the hazard of fortune and life. On the last anniversary, acting still more prominently as a popular leader, his morning hours were full of anxiety, because, for the first time, he had to meet an exigency without the guidance of Samuel Adams. But, in the evening, he was full of joy because of the success of a town meeting, the choice of delegates to a Continental Congress, and the signs that heralded American Union. Warren may be said to have lived in age during the twelve months upon which he then entered. There soon happened those exigencies that occur in the progress of great events, in meeting which mediocrity too often fails, but genuine ability rises to the mark of rendering large public service. Warren, growing steadily in self-reliance, discharged the duties which fell to his lot in such a manner that his contemporaries said, he filled each of the numerous departments of life that were assigned to him so well that he seemed born for no other, and that his name would live and fill the world with wonder. His words, as he thus acted, show how his spirit linked itself with the heroic and memorable past of the ages, and yet how simply and tersely he could urge the practical duties of the hour. Though he was an enthusiast for liberty, he appreciated the necessity of joining to it that respect which power only can command. His ideal was liberty without licentiousness. He urged for its full enjoyment the formation of a just government, based on the will and sustained by the power of the people and clothed with adequate authority to cover the rights of person and property with the aegis of law. His last utterances, private and official, plead for such a crowning to the patriot cause. He urged that the Continental Congress should authorize the formation of a local government and transform, by adoption, the raw militia around him into a national army. On this last morning of his life, he did not know that Congress had given its advice to Massachusetts and appointed a commander-in-chief. He passed the night of the 16th of June at Watertown, where the Provincial Congress held its sessions, but the journal of the proceedings of this day shows that he was not present at the meeting on the morning of the 17th, for it is recorded of the first item of business, the report was ordered to lie on the table till the President came into Congress. He had declared his intention to share the peril of the day with his countrymen. 
when an intimate friend, Elbridge Cherry, who had been his roommate, entreated him not to expose a life so valuable with something like a presentiment, he replied, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is sweet and becoming to die for the country. And hence, a patriot wrote, The ardor of dear Dr. Warren could not be restrained by the entreaty of his brethren of the Congress. It may be sufficient as to motive to say that the same ardor which, for the sake of the cause, had moved him to go where duty was to be performed, which carried him to Lexington, Grape Island, and Noddles Island, prompted his course on this memorable day. But it was also a mark of sound judgment. He had fully resolved that his future service should be in the military line. Confidence by an army and a commander is a vital element of success and this can be acquired only on the field. Acting, doubtless, with the fixedness of aim which characterized his whole life, he left Watertown early in the morning with a view of making himself useful and went to Cambridge. The Committee of Safety held its sessions in the Hastings House, on Cambridge Common, in which General Ward had his headquarters, and Warren met with them. The calls on this body for cannon, horses, powder, reinforcements, the pressing orders in its journal for the towns to act, and short and hurried notes attest the thrilling interest of the hour. The intelligence from Colonel Prescott was so decisive that the British were preparing to move out of Boston and assault his works that the committee urged General Ward to send forward additional force to Charlestown, and about 11 o'clock, before General Howe landed in this town, Ward issued orders for more troops to march to the support of Colonel Prescott. As the armies were making preparations for a battle, letters arrived from Philadelphia, brought express by Mr. Fessenden, signed by John Hancock, the President, and Charles Thompson, the Secretary of the Continental Congress. They contained the great news, which was ordered to be kept secret, that the Congress had ordered purchases of saltpeter, sulfur, powder, and 5,000 barrels of flour for the use of the Continental Army, which were to be paid for out of the Continental funds, and also that it had recommended the people of Massachusetts to form a local government. It was another advance towards nationality. Warren probably opened these letters and forwarded them to the Provincial Congress. They were read in the afternoon session. Would that Warren could also have known that a commander-in-chief had been appointed and that, as he desired, the choice had fallen on Washington. Between twelve and one o'clock, a horseman rode furiously into Cambridge with the report that the regulars had landed at Charlestown, when the bells were rung, the drums beat to arms, and there were the confusion and hurry incident to an ill-disciplined soldiery, for the camp, except where Putnam's and Warren's influence had their effects, was in a confused condition. General Putnam had come from Bunker Hill, and he promptly ordered the remainder of his regiment to Charlestown, but the course of General Ward was regarded as hesitating and inefficient, and elicited severe contemporary comment. He did not leave his house the whole day. It is not necessary, however, to relate the details of the events of the battle scene that ensued, but only to glance at a few points in order to show the circumstances under which Warren acted. It was a very hot summer's day, with a burning sun. Warren was suffering from a nervous headache and threw himself on a bed, but after the alarm was given, he rose and, saying that his headache was gone, started for the scene of action. It is said that one of his students, Dr. Townsend, accompanied him a part of the way on foot, but that, a short distance from the college, Warren was on horseback. He overtook two friends who were walking to the battlefield, and exchanging with them the usual salutations, he passed along towards Charlestown. He came within range of the British batteries at the low, flat ground which marks the entrance to that portion of the town nearest to Boston, which is a peninsula, and the firing, at the time he passed, between two and three o'clock, must have been severe. He went up Bunker Hill, where another of his students, William Eustace, served on this day as a surgeon. Here Warren had a view of the whole situation. On his left was Mystic River, where there were no floating batteries. 
the line of fire from the British began on a point a little inclined to the left where the ships of war Lively and the Falcon lay, and it continued round by Charles River from Copse Hill, the Somerset, the Cerebus, the Glasgow, the Symmetry Transport, and two floating batteries quite to his right. He could see on the side of Bunker Hill towards Boston, the protection which Captain Knowlton began to construct of the rail fences when Colonel Prescott ordered him from the redoubt to oppose the enemy's right wing, and which the New Hampshire forces, under Colonel Stark and Reed, were extending. Directly in front of the rail fence, on a small hill at Bolton's Point, he could see the same British regiment which he had beheld so long in Boston, among them, doubtless, the officers before whom he delivered his 5th of March oration, now awaiting the order for an assault. The furious cannonade about this time was directed upon Roxbury to occupy the attention of the provincials in that quarter, while the fire of three ships, three batteries, several field pieces, and a battery on Copse Hill from six different directions centered on the entrenchments. Warren went to the rail fence. Here he was on foot. He met General Putnam, who, it is said, offered to receive orders from Warren, who replied, I am only here as a volunteer. I know nothing of your dispositions, nor will I interfere with them. Tell me where I can be most useful. Putnam directed him to the redoubt with the remark, There you will be covered, when Warren said, don't think I came to seek a place of safety, but tell me where the onset will be most furious. General Putnam again named the redoubt. Warren then went forward to Breed's Hill and into the redoubt. There was a feeling at this time in the ranks at this post, so manifest was the peril, that, through the oversight, presumption, or treachery of the officers, the men would all be slain. They needed encouragement. Warren was enthusiastically received. All the men huzzahed. He said that he came to encourage a good cause and that a reinforcement of 2,000 men was on its way to their support. Colonel Prescott asked the general if he had any orders to give. Warren replied that he had none and exercised no command, saying, The command is yours. This is the relation by General Heath. Judge Prescott, who heard the fact from his father, the colonel, is more circumstantial in relating the incident. General Warren, Judge Prescott says, came to the redoubt a short time before the action commenced with a musket in his hand. Colonel Prescott went to him and proposed that he should take the command, observing that he, Prescott, understood he, Warren, had been appointed a major general a day or two before by the Provincial Congress. General Warren replied, I shall take no command here. I have not yet received my commission. I came as a volunteer with my musket to serve under you and shall be happy to learn from a soldier of your experience. Warren undoubtedly served as a volunteer in the battle that, that began soon after he arrived. It continued, including the two intermissions, about an hour and a half. The town of Charlestown was set on fire in several places by order of the British general, and it was one great blaze. The roofs of Boston and the hills round the country were covered with spectators, and these features, with the work of the battle, made the whole a picture and a complication of horror and importance. On such a field, Warren fought a good fight. He was applied to for orders and gave them. Regardless of himself, his whole soul seemed to be filled with the greatness of the cause he was engaged in, and, while his friends were dropping away all around him, he gave his orders with a surprising coolness. His character and conduct and presence greatly animated and encouraged his countrymen. His heroic soul elicited a kindred fire from the troops. His lofty spirit gave them confidence. He performed many feats of bravery and exhibited a coolness and conduct which did honor to the judgment of his country in appointing him a major general. The British general was baffled in his flanking design of forcing the rail fence and of surrounding the redoubt. His troops met gallantly the line of fire poured upon them, but they were twice compelled to fall back. On the third advance, they stormed the redoubt and the breastwork connected with it when the ammunition of their defenders had failed. 
as the regulars, showing a forest of bayonets came over one side of the redoubt, the militia fell back to the other side, and there was a brief but fierce hand-to-hand -hand struggle when the butts of the muskets were used, and Warren was now seen for the last time by Colonel Prescott, who was not among those who ran out of the redoubt, but stepped long with his sword up as he parried the thrusts that were made at his person. So great was the dust arising now from the dry, loose soil that the outlet was hardly visible. Warren was among the last to go out. Just outside of it, there was much mingling of the British and provincials and great confusion when the firing for a few moments was checked. At this time, Warren endeavored to rally the militia, a contemporary account says, sword in hand. He was recognized by a British officer who wrested a musket out of a soldier's hand and shot him. He fell about 60 yards from the redoubt, being struck by a bullet in the back part of his head on the right side. Having mechanically clapped his hand to the wound, he dropped down dead. The retreating and the pursuing throng passed on by his body. The rail fence had not been forced, and its brave defenders protected their brethren of the redoubt as they retreated from the peninsula. The victors did not continue their pursuit beyond Bunker Hill. On the following Sunday morning, Dr. John Warren, who was in Salem on the day previous, went to Cambridge and received the distressing intelligence that his brother was missing. He inquired of almost every person he saw for information of the general. Some said that he was alive and well, others that he was wounded, and others that he fell on the field. In this manner, Several days were passed, each day's information diminishing the probability of his safety. On Monday, the Provincial Congress elected a president in the room of the Honorable Joseph Warren Esquire, supposed to be killed in the late battle. Meantime, on Sunday morning, John Winslow of Boston, subsequently General Winslow, went over the battlefield and recognized the body of Warren among the dead. His hand was bloody, and it was under his head. Dr. Jeffries also is said to have recognized it. He was buried on the field. It was reported in the American camp that his body was stripped, that it was dug up several times to gratify the curiosity of those who came to see it, and that his coat was sold by a soldier in Boston. There are several other relations, American and British, of the death of Warren. I select a few of them. Amos Foster says, I saw General Warren. His clothes were bloody when he cried out to us, I am a dead man. Fight on, my brave fellows, for the salvation of your country. Samuel Lawrence says, I saw General Warren shot. I saw him when the ball struck him and from that time until he expired. The following are British accounts. The celebrated Dr. Warren who commanded in the provincial trenches at Charlestown while he was bravely defending himself against several opposing regulars, was killed in a cowardly manner by an officer's servant, but the fellow was instantly cut to pieces. Six letters were found in the doctor's pocket, written from some gentlemen in Boston, who were immediately taken into custody. At this time, Warren, there, the provincial's commander, fell, he was a physician, little more than 30 years of age. He died in his best clothes. Everybody remembered his fine, silk-fringed waistcoat. The unhappy leader in the fatal action of Charlestown, who from ambition only had raised himself from a bare-legged milk boy to a major general of the army, although the fatal ball gave him not a moment for reflection, Yet he said in his lifetime that he was determined to mount over the heads of his co-adjutors and get to the last round of the ladder or die in the attempt. Unhappy man. His fate arrested him in his career, and he can now tell whether pride and ambition are pillars strong enough to support the tottering fabric of rebellion. Warren's death cast a gloom over the land. Whether friend or foe, the generous, the elegant, and the humane, all, all mingled the sympathetic tear. The general grief attests the hold which he had on the affection of his countrymen. I select a few independent contemporary expressions. 
Here fell our worthy and much lamented friend, Dr. Warren, with as much glory as Wolf on the plains of Abraham at once admired and lamented in such a manner as to make it difficult to determine whether regret or envy predominates. The loss of Dr. Warren is irreparable. His death is generally and greatly lamented, but dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. This is a day of heroes. The fall of one will inspire the surviving glorious band to emulate his virtues and revenge his death on the foes of liberty in our country. We have yet about 60 or 70 killed or missing, but among these is, what shall I say? How shall I write the name of our worthy friend, the great and good Dr. Warren? The tears of multitudes pay tribute to his memory. Not all the havoc and devastation they, the British, have made has wounded me like the death of Warren. We want him in the Senate. We want him in his profession. We want him in the field. We mourn for the citizen, the senator, the physician, and the warrior. When he fell, liberty wept. He closed a life of glory in a glorious death, and heaven never received the spirit of a purer patriot. The death, Samuel Adams wrote to his wife, of our truly amiable and worthy friend, Dr. Warren, is greatly afflicting. The language of our friendship is, how shall we resign him? But it is our duty to submit to the dispensations of heaven, whose ways are ever gracious, ever just. He fell in the glorious struggle for public liberty. And Arthur Lee, while abroad in anticipating the meeting of friends, wrote, Would to God we could number Warren among them, and that it had been permitted him to see the beauties of that fabric which he labored with so much zeal and ability to rear. His saltum accumulum donis et furgeri ineni munere. In just nine months after the Battle of Bunker Hill, the victors were compelled to yield the possession of it to Washington. Four days later, on the 21st of March, 1776, Dr. John Warren went over the field on which his brother slept in a soldier's grave. The hill, he wrote, commands the most affecting view I ever saw. The walls of magnificent buildings, tottering to the earth below, above a great number of rude hillocks, under which were deposited the remains, in clusters, of those deathless heroes who fell in the field of battle. The scene was inexpressibly solemn, when I considered that, perhaps, whilst I was musing on the objects round me, I might be standing over the remains of a dear brother whose blood had stained these hallowed walks. Several days passed before the body of Warren was found. The Rosemary and Cassia, Governor Gore says, adorned and discovered his hallowed grave. It was identified on the 4th of April, covered with about three feet of ground, much disfigured, yet it was sufficiently known by two artificial teeth which were set for him a short time before his glorious exit. On the same day, Honorable James Sullivan, by order of a committee of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, who had been appointed to erect a monument to his memory, reported that the Lodge of Freemasons, of which he was late Grand Master, were desirous of taking up his remains and burying them with the customary solemnities of the craft, and that Warren's friends consented to the proposition. The committee recommended that the Lodge have leave to carry out their intention, in such manner as that the government of the colony might hereafter have an opportunity to erect a monument to the memory of that worthy, valiant, and patriotic American. The remains, placed in an elegant coffin, were removed from the hill to the state or townhouse at the head of State Street. On Monday, the 8th of April, they were reinterred with as great respect, honor, and solemnity as the state of the town would permit, the New England Chronicle says. The procession began from the state house and consisted of a detachment of the Continental Forces, a numerous body of the Honorable Society of Free and Accepted Masons, of which fraternity the General was Grand Master throughout North America, the mourners, a number of the members of the two houses of the Honorable General Assembly, the selectmen and inhabitants of the town. 
The pall was supported by the Honorable General Ward, Brigadier General Fry, Dr. Morgan, Colonel Gridley, the Honorable Mr. Gill, and J. Scully, Esquire. The corpse was carried into King's Chapel, where the Reverend Dr. Cooper made a very pertinent prayer on the occasion, after which Perez Morton Esquire pronounced an ingenious and spirited oration. This production contains a warm panegyric on Warren's private and public life. At its conclusion, the orator advocated independence. Shall we, his words are, still contend for a connection with those who have forfeited not only every kindred claim, but even their title to humanity? Forbid it, the spirit of the brave Montgomery. Forbid it, the spirit of the immortal Warren. Forbid it, the spirits of all our valiant countrymen, who fought, bled, and died for far different purposes. They contended for the establishment of peace, liberty, and safety to their country, and we are unworthy to be called their countrymen if we stop at any acquisition short of this. The remains were deposited in the tomb of George Richards Minot, a friend of the family. Nearly half a century afterwards, in 1825, when those who took part in these ceremonies had died and the place of deposit had become unknown, the relics were discovered in the Minot tomb in the granary burying ground. They were identified by the nephew of the general, Dr. John C. Warren, by the eye tooth and the mark of the fatal bullet behind the left ear. They were placed in a box of hardwood and removed to the Warren tomb in St. Paul's Church, Boston. The box bears a silver plate with the following inscription. In this tomb are deposited the earthly remains of Major General Joseph Warren, who was killed in the Battle of Bunker Hill on June 17, 1775. They are now in the Forest Hill Cemetery. I have aimed to trace faithfully the career of Joseph Warren. It is characterized by rare singleness of aim, he grasped, as by intuition, the ideas that are fundamental and vital, and he sought by applying them to promote the good of his country. He was a type of American nationality, as it rose to grasp liberty and union. He loved this cause more than he loved his life, and he was ever ready to peril his all in its behalf. He evinced a sound judgment, had clear conceptions of political questions, and was animated by patriotic motives. His integrity, capacity for public service, talent for writing, fervid eloquence, cool courage, promptitude of action, large love for his countrymen, and commanding genius endowed him with the magic spell of influence, and the power there is in a noble character. His utterances and his work constitute an enduring memorial of his fame. He was not permitted, like many co-patriots, to live long and, after the enjoyment of tokens of public confidence, to witness in coming days the greatness of the structure of which he did so much to lay the foundation, but he was destined to fall, ere he saw the star of his country rise, and even in his death to benefit the cause which it was his ruling passion to promote. He dwells in memory as the young, brave, blooming, generous, self-devoted martyr, awakening the purifying emotions of admiration, tenderness, and love of the country. The influence of such a character is not confined to contemporaries. As the Friends of Liberty from all countries and throughout all time contemplate it, they may feel their better feelings strengthened and gather from it a kindred virtue. End of chapter 16